In the frozen silence of the intensive care unit, our story begins with a patient lying motionless under a mask of anesthesia while doctors fight for his life, struggling with threatening bleeding and falling blood pressure. The tension in the air builds as the doctors, starting to get nervous, urgently ask the assistants to bring in a blood bag and a clamp to stop the relentless bleeding. All eyes are on the monitor, the fate monitor, where the patient's pulse is dropping ever lower than normal, every heartbeat a battle for life, as the situation is very critical indeed. One of the surgeons said that it seems that the iron object they removed earlier caused a very strong infection, which made the surgeon very surprised and nervous, as he could not understand how this is possible. In a race against time, where every second is precious, the doctors realize that any delay could cost the patient's life, so they decide that it is necessary to resuscitate the heart and lungs right away. The grim readings of the equipment cast a shadow of hope, foreshadowing that the patient is already teetering on the brink between life and death. At this critical moment, a heavy-hearted assistant informs the doctor that the patient's heart has stopped beating, adding another unsettling note to an already tense environment. He tried to contain his emotions, but he failed, saying that the patient was no longer alive. The doctor's heart sinks at the memory of the words of the patient's mother who, on the eve of the operation, anxiously asked him if her son would be okay, leaving him wondering how she could announce such sad news. He recalls how she, choking back tears, begged him to save her son, telling him how much he had endured because of her mistakes, words that are deeply seared into his soul. His thoughts return to the mother's words that her son is the only thing she lives for on this earth, her only joy and meaning in life, giving it a special significance. The doctor's gaze once again slides over the face of the patient lying in helpless sleep under anesthesia, who is no longer breathing, causing the doctor to feel a deep sense of loss. He revisits the mother's words over and over in his thoughts, as if trying to find an answer, and with a heavy heart he closes his eyes, sighing deeply at the helplessness and bitterness of what is happening. There is a sudden silence in the surgical ward as everyone puts their hands down, gazing mournfully at the patient, paying their respects with a moment of silence, while the medical records record the time of his passing and the tragic cause, an infection that led to brain death due to profuse bleeding. The unconscious patient lay in the intensive care unit, where his life hung in the balance and the anesthesia tube seemed unnecessary because his condition was critical. In the waiting room, his mother sat with her fingers crossed, praying hopefully for a successful outcome to the surgery, her every breath reflecting hope and fear. She continued to cry, feeling powerless in the face of the unknown, and the only thing left to her was to hope for a positive outcome that could change everything. Tension reached a climax when the doors of the operating room opened and one of the doctors stepped out, causing a wave of anxiety among those waiting. This surprised everyone else very much, because the operation is not over yet, so it was arrogance. Therefore, the chief surgeon ordered everyone to quickly return to their seats, as well as prepare a log book and the patient's vital signs. The doctor immediately ordered the blood transfusion to be speeded up as well, and also said to check the metal object removed from the patient's body, and also, since there were enough necessary instruments on the table, the doctor decided to suggest another test for tetanus. The doctor also took off his mask, which is strictly forbidden to do in operating rooms, but the thought began to visit him that they really still have an excellent chance to save the patient. At that moment, all surgeons were surprised, because is there any point in operating on an already dead patient? But the doctor was resolute, and said that now everything is really different, probably the rumors about this doctor have not yet reached him. He was special, because he always took on the most difficult tasks, and saved the lives of those people who could not be returned, although he went all the time without a mask. No one even guessed until recently about his abilities. But when he arrived, the operation resumed again, because he is the one who can even pull out the dead from the next world, and all this in the literal sense of the word. His name was Shin Yu-sun, he is also better known by the nickname, God Hands, so he also decided not to waste time, and wearing his mask, he proceeded to the operation. Really, some magical processes began on the cardiogram and the heartbeat gradually began to recover, which was really hard to believe. After a few hours of work, after all, the operation was a success, and in the operating room everyone began to scream and rejoice together, because it was really an excellent job, after which the patient was saved. And after a hard day, you really need to relax somehow, so the doctor took a can of drink and opened it. He decided to relax a little and have a drink, as he was really tired after the operation, and he also realized that he would spend his entire vacation in the hospital again. When he came out of it and looked at the excellent view of the city, he realized that he really had not had a normal rest for a very long time, again today he spent the whole day in the operating room, despite the fact that he had a day off. He looked at the sky and did not understand why life is so cruel. At that moment, a big announcement also appeared, which tells us that these are indeed the hands of a god. It was already dark, but his nickname was given for a reason, but all because he can save even dead people. As he himself reports, at first he even liked it, and his main motivation was the joy that formed after saving the dying, 
as this is really a talent, to pull people out of the other world. However, he lay in his bed and was really in pain, all due to the fact that he did not have time to rest at all, after various rumors that spread throughout the city. Now every time he is entrusted with the treatment of really very important and wealthy patients whose lives must be saved. It is mistaken for portable medical devices that can be used at any time. But he understood that he would not last so long, so something was needed in life, he looked with his tired eyes at his hands and he was really interested in understanding what the title of the hand of God, which he was presented with, means. It's really not easy, because because of this, all the doctors began to be afraid of him and avoid him, so now it has become more like a mockery. He took a deep breath and really decided to think about when was the last time he rested and did not work under supervision and pressure. Choosing the next can of soda, he understood that at least he would earn a lot of money, but he didn't have time to even spend it. He smiled and looked at the bottom, realizing that perhaps you are some moment of your life, he still turned the wrong way, so as soon as he returns home, he will drink another can of beer and relax a bit. Suddenly, a bus drove sharply at him at great speed, which the guy obviously did not see while he was moving straight in his direction. The headlights began to dazzle his glasses and, as he himself liked to say, when a person dies, his whole life flashes before his eyes. This is exactly what happened to our hero, he really began to remember all his most interesting and intimate moments. But basically, everything that he had in his thoughts, as well as his whole practical life, was spent in the operating room, he even himself really became very interested, why does he see only memories from the operating room? But there was already critically little time for reflection, and his bag flew into the air right from his hands. And almost immediately a white bright flash appeared, which informed the whole world that the brilliant surgeon was no longer alive. Meanwhile, the weather was really very good outside, everything was happening in the ancient city, the building of which was very similar to a castle. Out of the leaves, someone started screaming and calling out to a guy named Ray. It was the name of our surgeon, who still could not understand whose voice it was. The girl noticed that he seemed to be trying to open his eyes now. But didn't he die? The surgeon looked at his hands, which really rejuvenated a lot and was very surprised by this, because he did not understand what was wrong with them. At that moment, his new family approached him, who noticed that the guy had already woken up, they were very happy about this. Ray was really very surprised, and it seems he began to understand what had just happened. The family continued to rejoice and hug their child, rejoicing in every moment, because how can a child be so sweet when awake? In addition, his new father reported that the guy really looks very much like his mother, which is why he is so cute. She continued to hug her son and was really very happy, but the guy himself really didn't like it, because he absolutely could not understand what was happening to him now. But the only question that tormented him, at that moment, while the new environment looked at him, was why is he still alive? And while he was trying to figure out who all these people who were starting to squeeze him were, the girl made a remark to the guy, saying that he should do everything much more gently, as it could hurt the child. The surgeon did not understand what kind of small body he had, why everyone wants to squeeze it very hard. Was he really reborn as the child of these two? And after analyzing the situation, he realized that then these people look like his parents, but what kind of clothes are they wearing? Are they cosplayers? The girl took her child in her arms and began to apologize to him for the fact that dad hurt him a little with his beard, from which the child had a small cut. They looked at his hand and were very frightened, just like the child who noticed that his hand was injured. Panic very much after he learned that Ray had hurt himself. He offered to call a priest to heal him, it was really obvious that he was panicking and had never had any experience with a child. But the girl reassured him and said that it was just a scratch, and there was nothing wrong with that. She put it on the surface and said that she herself could cure him without problems, which surprised the child very much, I wonder how she is trying to cure him, most importantly from what. He looked at her eyes and at the surface and said that she herself could cure him without any problems, which surprised the child very much, I wonder how she is trying to cure him, most importantly from what. He looked into her eyes and began to study even more superficially, is she really a doctor too? And then he realized that in fact the ointment can leave a scar, but he did not know how I could tell about it. But the girl used her magic and, without touching the child at all, created a magical power that began to heal his hand. He was very surprised, because she immediately healed, which he had never seen before, for all the time of his work as a surgeon. At this moment, he once again analyzed his hand and looked at it, and realized that this is not medicine, so it means magic. And his mother began to laugh and said that the operation was over, and the wound really didn't seem to exist. The guy looked at his hand and was very happy, just like his parents, because not a single trace of the wound was visible at all. The girl began to laugh, and said that she had said that she could handle it herself, thanks to this, her father exhaled heavily with relief and said that she had not yet lost her magical abilities. And the surgeon, having heard that the word magic had just sounded, 
concluded that it looks like now he is a completely different person and has he really been reborn in another world. Well, in the meantime, it was already getting dark outside and the whole family began their preparation for bed. Parents decided to put a small child to bed, but he could not sleep for a very long time, as he thought about his new business and the meaning of life. He woke up a few hours later and was very alert, and also noticed the fact that he hadn't slept in such a long time. Three months have passed since he was reborn in this world, and during this time he understood a lot from their conversations. This world is really completely different from the world in which the surgeon lived before, as if it were a fantasy world. This is where the lives of monsters and people begin at the same time, as well as other creatures that fight with each other. Because of this, people can be attacked at any time by monsters and various orcs. The villagers also say that they have to develop their strength and dedicate themselves to their chosen profession from a young age. Meanwhile, my mother approached Ray and decided to cure him. Another feature of this world, magic, which is developed here instead of science. Whenever Sane heals a child's wounds, he always resorts to magic, not medicine, as was the case before in his world. It really was a very amazing life that the surgeon really deserved. He managed to realize that everything where he is now is not a dream, but really a new reality, but for some reason, the memories and knowledge of his past life are also well preserved. He continued to sit in bed and look at the moon, because never before had he even thought that he was so lazy and likes to sleep. Come to think of it, in his past life he didn't even have a normal time for simple sleep. If he hadn't died in an accident then, he probably would have died from overwork, because the work of a surgeon is really a very difficult thing. And now, having been reborn, he can absolutely not think about it and rest exactly as much as he needs. When else will he have the chance to sit back and do nothing so much? Well, in the meantime, the night was coming to an end and there was a very beautiful pot with an unusual plant on the windowsill. It seems that he was also covered with magic, because he constantly attracted something to himself and it was very strange. But in the meantime, white pimples scattered throughout the room, and while the guy was sleeping, everyone also continued to fly in the direction of that same magical plant. And he absolutely could not understand what it was, it was like a thin thread that pierced his body. There was such a light feeling that this is something incredible, because after 10 minutes of such a dream, the guy already felt very cheerful. Maybe this is the same mana that his parents were talking about. Having tried to manage it, the surgeon realized that it was really very difficult. And every time he tried to make her move, she just flew around. At this point, the guy still tried to focus on where the flow of mana begins and ends, since it really is no different from blood. If you imagine that it flows through his veins, then you can immediately feel how it will begin to fully fill his body. It was truly an infinite energy that was truly an art to master, but you really need to do this very, very slowly, slowly, trying to feel every breath and every movement of the body, like a leaf that floats on water. Or as if you are in a winter region, watching snowflakes fly in the wind. And it's really very difficult, but only through this diligent process, the first magical flame can appear from the hand. And finally, he succeeded, after such long years of training, he was able to prove to himself and for the first time created fire from his hand. He was very proud of himself, because he really could do it. He even began to cry, because at last he was able to use fire magic and he managed to direct mana in the right direction. It took him three whole years of hard work to do this, somehow he managed to direct the flow of mana and remember the whole process. Remember absolutely everything that he read in books late at night. Only, the only thing he didn't understand was the mana management manual, so far it was really very difficult for him. The method that was described in the book is the principle of accumulation of mother in the body and its rational use, and if it is replenished from the outside, then why should he accumulate it in the body? In addition, accumulating mana within yourself and then using it has some limitations, because no matter how you look at it, this is not an inefficient way to use it. The guy continued to read books to study this issue, and now he became interested, what if he prefers to use it freely, not trying to restrain it? After all, it is really much better to restore mana from the outside and immediately spend it. Thus, the need for mana circles will disappear. And he was able to come to this conclusion completely on his own, in his youth. But it is also the most dangerous method that is not described in any book, but it is definitely worth it. Even if the guy said that, he didn't even know if he would succeed, he thought he would have to do some more research on the subject. His parents were really surprised how a child can read so many books in his free time, but they were also very happy for him, it's really wonderful to see. They were very proud of him, because their main task was to raise a very good person out of him, as well as an equally strong magician. His father was very surprised, because with such a physique, a guy can definitely become a good swordsman. But his wife got ahead of him, because in this case, their baby Ray will turn into the same mountain of muscles, like his father himself. 
He got a little angry about this, but at least said that he was handsome. Well, the guy continued to read books in his spare time and study all the information about this Manu. But he still couldn't understand why the parents were hiding, if they were still talking so loudly. Anyway, the mother began to suspect a little something was wrong, so she turned to her husband and asked, does it not seem strange to you that he only does what he reads? But this question confused him a little, what does she already mean? They looked at the guy again and said that ordinary children of his age want to play and walk on the street, but it seems to him that he is only interested in books. Well, he did not see any problem in this, and said that the mother should not worry. Isn't it good that he likes to study? In addition, she herself said that she wants to grow an excellent magician out of him. The girl looked at him and really agreed with this, although she did not say anything. But the guy heard all this and realized that he was still very far from this calling, so he needed to study very, very much. He continued to absorb one book after another, because he needed to finally learn how to restore his mana, moreover, to perfection. Another night passed in the process of studying books and the long-awaited morning came. His mother entered the room with a smile and greeted her child. But suddenly he continued to sit in the study of the book, and told his mother that he woke up a long time ago and continues to read, which she really started to cry and get a little nervous. Of course, reading books and learning is great, but in any case, he should frolic enough before he grows up. At that moment, the mother looked at her child once again and began to think that perhaps she really devotes little time to him. And then tears began to flow from her thoughts, because she had really been crying a lot lately. She walked up to her boyfriend and sat down across from him, asking if he wanted to play with his mom today. But this question turned out to be really much more difficult than one could imagine, so he surprised the guy. His eyes lit up, was she really going to teach him magic? He was very happy with this offer, because she wants to educate her child through children's games. So he shouted and got up from his seat, said that he really wanted this very much, and dreamed of going to play with her. But the mother herself saw something wrong and it alarmed her very much. She ran up and hugged her son very tightly, realizing that he was very happy, which means that he had been waiting for this opportunity for a very long time. Well, the guy at that moment just endured all these hugs. He looked at his mother and just could not understand what she wants to do now. They went for a walk with her and it was not at all what he expected. He told her that there were no books here, so why did they come here? But mom told him to put all the books aside today, so they will go outside and play better there. But Ray had completely different plans for today, saying that he would better go and do more and thank for this opportunity. He didn't understand what was going on now, why should he waste time playing games instead of practicing? The mother was very happy, because how can their baby say such beautiful words? Indeed, it is simply a delight to the ears of the mother of every child. She suggested that at least today he should go and unwind a little. But the guy was very surprised by this, because he didn't go out all the time, and also didn't plan to do it at all. But the mother insisted and asked only once to have fun with her on the street. And he hadn't really gone out since he was reborn, all his time was spent in the library and learning new skills. He didn't even know what the outside world looked like, so he smiled and immediately agreed, but just for once. That's great, then move forward right now. And when they had already left, the guy constantly looked around, because he could not believe that now this is his new reality, and the world in which he is now completely different from the one that was before. And yes, it's true, it was a very small beautiful town, with a cozy atmosphere, which was really a pleasure to be in. He looked at the very water in which the leaves floated and noticed the fact that for the last three years he only did yours, that he read books sitting at home. He looked at the beautiful windmills and fired, and also said that he could not even think about going outside and was like a beast that was locked in a cage. And all these thoughts began to press a little on his small young head, which really made him think about the current state. At that moment, his mother smiled and looked in his direction, it was clear that he was thinking about something very much, so she asked if everything was all right with him. But the guy did not know how to react correctly, and what to answer, so his mother suggested that he just look and run around this territory. They immediately began to do this, because there was no reason to worry or think about the difficult philosophical life. The guy was very happy, because after a past life as a surgeon, he finally had free time, as well as the opportunity to be a little happy, also to be a child. That is why he tried to live each of these moments in a special way, and also I absolutely did not distract them with what difficult adult tasks. At that moment, he really felt like a real child, which he actually was, but this time, it was really possible to worry about absolutely nothing. He was very happy and really couldn't believe that now this was his new reality. The sky was simply beautiful, as if it had been created at all for this moment and this work. In addition, the guy came with his mother to the top of the rock, from which there was a really beautiful view of the lake and the fir trees that grew near it. Indeed, this surprised the guys very much, because for the long years that he spent in the operating room, 
he never had time to see such beautiful edges and views and moments, so for him it was just surprise and pleasure. Before he was reborn, he didn't even have time to stop, he kept running and running all the time. He lived for the sake of others, and therefore he was sick of himself, because he simply had to survive. All of this paralleled the fact that he was the chief surgeon who saved every life except his own. He continued to look at this beautiful view and was finally happy, because he had never felt so free before, and expressed great gratitude for the fact that he was lucky to be reborn in this world. He smiled and immediately decided to share this moment with his mother, so he turned to her. He turned and looked at her with his sweet childlike smile. After that, together they began to look at the sky, and the guy himself began to thank her for having opened this world to him. But the thoughts of the old work still could not leave him, because he constantly remembered how he worried about each patient and sent him to the operating room. It was in life where he was constantly busy with patients and performed various examinations and operations. He recalled how an assistant approached him and reported that the next operation would be in five minutes, at that moment when he was just sitting in his office and leaning against the wall, begging at least someone to save him from overwork. And he remembers it as a terrible dream, since it could not continue like this anymore, it was really his limit. At that moment, black and white dots and flashes began to appear in front of him. These were very scary memories that made him panic and worry very much about this situation. He screamed in panic that it was cardiac fibrillation, at that moment when his mother tried to hug the guy and calm him down. She smiled and asked if he was just having a nightmare. But it was just a dream. He really did have a very good time with his mom, but why did he have such a terrible dream? He opened his eyes and looked away and wept a little. Meanwhile, the weather was still really great outside, and the city continued to live its own life, although there weren't many people there now. He remembered that he was reborn in this world, therefore those very dreams visited him, so the old life decided to remind himself. But the guy looked at the next building, saying that this time he lives this life completely different from the past. And so far, everything was very much like paradise, the people were friendly, and the trees and bushes continued to grow, delighting everyone around every day. It was time to return home, so my mother happily informed my father about this, saying that they had already arrived. At that moment he cleaned the room a little. Also very happy about such a walk and said that he had something. He jerked his mother's dress sharply, trying to get her attention. He looked at her with his cute and childish eyes, asking her to do a small favor for him, namely to teach him magic. From such a proposal, his mother was very surprised and frightened, because she did not expect that it would happen so quickly. So she asked her husband, how can he be so cute? And fell on him from happiness. She was very pleased with such an offer, so she asked the child if he was already impatient to learn magic. But since he wants so badly, she will gladly teach him. He was very happy with this answer and continued to smile as he never seems to be able to get used to such a reaction. But my mother was ready for this, so she asked why he wants to start training. But the guy answered in the affirmative that he wanted to study the element of fire, so the mother immediately activated the fire and showed it to her child. He was really very happy, because he understood that his mother was really a real professional in her field, but he did not show any special emotions. She was a little frightened and surprised by such a reaction, because how could this be? She just got fire, isn't it amazing why the guy made absolutely no reaction? So mom started waving her fingers, asking if the magic was too weak, but the guy just said that he had already used such magic so many times, so you definitely shouldn't be offended by this. To begin with, the mother invited the guy to sit down, we are looking for, of course, he immediately agreed. She looked at him and decided to let him know that magic is really not that simple. It is the magic that they are using now that must first be transformed into Mando. And when you use a spell, for example, fire, then the magic quickly comes into action and everything works out. The guy looked at her with surprised eyes and was very happy, because at last they began to teach him magic. But he still had another question that haunted him. He asked his mother if there is any other way to transform Manu. This made her think a little and so she asked the guy to explain a little what he means. She wanted to know if, for example, it was possible to transform fire or something like it. Mom explained to him that first he must spend mana, and then you restore it. All this happens due to the force of friction, as a result of which the same fire is formed. The guy waved his hands and said that there is a much easier way to convert mana just once, instead of three, right? But in this case, the mana reserves will quickly run out. The girl was very surprised by such a question, and also did not understand why he began to ask such difficult questions. She quickly thought and said that everything is already possible, there is some sense in this. She smiled and said that if all these three actions can be stabilized into one, then it is quite possible to realize everything. Anyway, at least in theory. At that moment, in their large three-story house, everything was also going on for a long and amazing atmosphere, during which the guy received new knowledge. He put his finger to his lips and began to think about what stabilization really means. 
It turns out that in its final form it will be possible to improve the properties. He looked at his hand, which, after another magic, began to extract his fire, and this surprised him very much, and also made his mother think several times more, because the flame that formed from his hand was very frightened and surprised her, especially since all this happened in their house. But the guy did not think about what happened in the house, he was pleased with the thought that at last everything worked out for him. At that moment, the flame woke up the father, who immediately approached them and decided to clarify what was happening here, why did the fire appear in the house? Mom also panicked a little and didn't even know what to say. She looked at the guy and said that he was able to use magic himself, she didn't even understand how it happened at all. When using magic, a mana flow inevitably occurs, which made her think very hard. To be honest, she still feels really bad about the process, but shouldn't he feel the same way too? But this experiment did set their room a little on fire. The guy sat and continued to analyze the situation, because it is easier for him to figure it out if you imagine that this is an atom. And to interact with mana, you will not need to keep it inside. To him, and he continued to sit and think about this topic, but the fact that he was still a child did not leave her alone. She looked at him and I was very excited and scared, but the guy smiled and only said that he seemed to have gone too far. He looked at his mother and tried to somehow smooth this situation with his pretty little eyes, asking what happened to her now. But she also did not know what to say, because just a child can already use magic himself, for which she is very proud of him. The guy also smiled and was embarrassed and asked if she really thinks so. He seems to be a genius. But the mother also continued to praise him and be happy for him, because their son is really very cool. Meanwhile, at night of the same day, some strange things began to happen. This has already become a problem for a guy who woke up in the middle of the night from some strange sounds. It was his father and mother who began to sit at the table and discuss what they would do if suddenly the guy was called to the academy at such a young age. So they decided to do everything in my power to prevent this from happening. The guy woke up so abruptly, and could not understand really now everything that was happening, was it they who were discussing it? But after all, my mother also understood that it was not so easy to do this. She claimed that her son is really a genius who is born once in 100, no, in 1000 years. If, after all, he will attract the attention of the academy, then what will they still need to do? They still tried to find an answer to this question. Ray also had no idea what academy they were talking about, but also understood that it seemed like he might be forcibly taken there because of his abilities. That's why he ate his hand into a fist and said to prevent it, he needs to become even stronger, before he tried to learn magic for fun. But from that moment everything has changed, now he is determined to study it further, because the absolute power over magic is quite comprehensible to him. In the meantime, the weather was really very beautiful outside, birds were sitting in the trees. Some silhouettes were visible in the window, it seems that there really was someone there. There was some kind of menu, as well as a book and a candle, which had already been burning since the morning. Ray woke up and stretched, as he practically didn't sleep last night as he studied magic. He looked out the window and was very surprised that it was already morning outside and another sleepless and interesting night had flown by. He did not leave his room all the time, so he did not even notice how time flies, it is really very strange, because he spent all his time studying magic. Then, should he still go outside and start to explore this world, because he is already 15 years old, 10 of which he is constantly learning and improving his skills in magic. Mana research experiments gradually increased Ray's skill levels. And his ingenious understanding of how mana actually works went to a completely different level. He could sit quietly in his room and meditate, creating holograms of magic around him. This became the basis of his rapid development, which is why he himself began to study books from an early age so as not to waste his time. Due to the fact that he absorbed a large amount of mana, his hair became really pure white. He did not know if his knowledge of medicine would be useful, but he was sure that this component should be taken in the same way for study. He understood that in any case it was worth trying it, and he wrote on the tablet that he was ready to heal sick people. He was really very shocked, because his new reality still began to connect him a little with his previous life, where he also remembered that before the exit, which he had the last time, there was a lot of fire and absolutely everything changed beyond recognition. At that moment, there was both wind and ice, as well as a lot of really amazing magical things. Due to the fact that the guy constantly studied magic, he was able to synchronize all the elements from his finger, and also began to control them very confidently. And all this at the age of 15, while all his peers still continued to play games on the street. He smiled and clutched his head, because he realized that this is the ideal future that he built for himself, because very soon he will be able to become one of the most powerful and successful magicians in history, just like he did before in surgery. The weather was really very beautiful outside, 
The sun had just come out and began to illuminate all the roads that were here. Suddenly, he began to move the wooden stick very hard, emitting not very pleasant squeaks. But there was nowhere to go, since it was part of his plan, he stood right in the center of the city with a sign in which he promised to heal all sick people. He began to cough, because he realized that it was really a little embarrassing, but there was nothing wrong with that, since he was completely confident in his abilities. He remembers that in his previous life he was a brilliant surgeon, so now he decided to also use his favorite skills to help people, just like in his past life. He began to shout that he could cure absolutely any person, so he asked to bring him as many patients as possible. His parents rejoiced, because at last their child began to do what he loved and enjoyed it. But not everyone was happy to see the young guy, as the inhabitants of the city very quickly approached him and began to ridicule the novice magician, saying that he had better go home and play doctor there. They began to mock and say that he really is the same sick person. Ray didn't like it very much, he didn't think that people would treat him like that, because what do they even know about him? Of course, he did not expect this, so he grabbed his head and smiled, because he understood that in order for people to begin to appreciate him, it takes quite a bit of time. Someone to approach him, but it was already getting dark outside. He fell to his knees and threw his sign, he was very upset because no one came up to him. He had already begun to get ready, because he realized that today he would definitely not be able to do anything. That is why you need to return home, but suddenly a girl appeared in front of him, which surprised him a little. The guy looked up at her and barely held back his tears, but the girl really came with an interesting offer, or rather, she wanted to ask, can a guy really heal a sick person? The girl was very much surprised, but no less than Ray. She was very interested in whether he could really heal any particular patient. The guy liked this idea, because now his first patient appeared in front of him. He began to raise his hands and really rejoice, like a little child, which is what he was. But the girl just looked at him again and asked if he really could do it or not. But Ray first needs to familiarize himself with his condition before answering such questions. The girl looked at him and also burst into tears a little, it was noticeable that she was really unhappy. She got very angry and began to insult the guy, because how can such a small child like him heal a sick person? Therefore, she began to insult him and leave. He was really very surprised by such an expression in his direction, so he simply smiled, absolutely expecting such a standard and banal reaction. He looked at the leaving girl and began to address her, which she certainly could not expect. Ray was very serious and said that maybe he looked like a 15-year-old boy, but there is not a single patient in this world whom he cannot cure. He was very self-confident, so he ordered the girl not to judge him by his young face. The girl was very surprised that the guy said such smart things, she could not understand why he was so angry, because he really is still a child. He, once again she looked at him and did not know why, but she had great trust and respect for him, because she felt a strong doctor in him. So she turned around and apologized, admitting that she really was wrong. Whereupon she asked him for permission to introduce herself, she was the only daughter of Viscount Gate. A girl named Gate von Elisa. She looked at the guy and said that she was not his little girl. He was also a little surprised by this, but he also introduced himself and said that his name was Ray. But the question did not leave him, if the girl is from a rich family, then what about her clothes? She was very surprised by such a manner of communication, because why did he begin to talk to her so respectfully? So she asked him to speak the way he used to. The patient she was talking about was her father and urgently needed help. She began to tell that it started quite recently. His skin on his chest turned red and some strange bumps appeared, everything was very swollen, and became the size of a balloon. The guy offered his finger to his chin, and began to analyze the situation, it became worse for a malignant tumor. But in any case, he must first look at and analyze the patient. And if he is right, then every minute counts now. He was very upset, because if this is a malignant tumor the size of a balloon, then you really really need to hurry up, because it would not be too late. The girl and the guy began to move quickly to the appointed place. And now, after a few minutes, they had already arrived, so the girl suggested that they go there as soon as possible. And the guy at that moment looked at their house, and was very surprised, but then he realized that the girl was from a rich family. Immediately at the entrance, first meet the butler, who is joyful and first welcome. The girl ran up to him and began to grab him by the jacket, asking how his father felt. But he had really bad news, he said that his condition had become very bad and he died suddenly. This frightened her very much and made her cry, because she could not believe it. Immediately after that, she began to run, and the butler tried to stop her. The child could not believe that this really happened, because this could not be. She ran into the room screaming and started screaming, trying to talk to her father. But at that moment her mother was already there, who was sitting and also crying, after which she looked at her daughter. She also decided to move closer to her father, 
whose tumor was already very large indeed, but she still hoped that he would be fine. Ray decided not to stand aside and approached the girl, asked her permission to examine her father. He began to analyze the current situation and saw there really three very large tumors that had been in the patient's body for a long time. Looking at them closer, he realized that they really sucked a lot of energy from his body. Putting his hand to his body, he still faintly, but still felt his father's heartbeat. Therefore, he concluded that he is still alive, so there is still a possibility to save him. From this, everyone was very shocked, including the butler, his mother and daughter. And the daughter began to grab his clothes, begging to save their father. Tears really began to flow in her eyes, she is not ready to believe it. And Ray himself only analyzed what was happening and realized that this was really his chance to prove what he was capable of. He looked at them and smiled, making it clear that he could handle it and there was absolutely no reason to worry. While he continued to examine his patient, along with his daughter, misunderstanding began to reign in the room, because all the people were really very shocked, because they did not know who this child was. But the butler said that Ray came with the girl. No one could believe that she had so thoughtlessly let some simple person into the house. One of them started screaming because he was very surprised by the fact that this guy was going to resurrect the dead Viscount. Is he some sort of swindler? Asked to come here and now plans to steal their jewelry. But his wife continued to cry because she did not understand what is now the meaning of my words. She looked at the guy and realized that she needed to cling to every opportunity now, so she only had to believe that this boy could work a miracle. The tumors were really very big, everything turned so black and the body began to rot. The guy activated his magic and realized that he needed to concentrate all the flow of mana on the tip of his finger and thus create a scalpel. At that moment, everyone was shocked and started screaming in fear as they had never seen anything like this before. They prevented the guy from working, constantly asking what is he trying to do right now. But he did not listen to them and simply closed his ears. But he really didn't like it very much, so he decided to explain everything by saying, I'm trying to fix everything, isn't it obvious? But still no one wanted to believe him. He was already so tired of it that he just exhaled and said, if they don't believe him, then he can just leave, if of course they don't mind. His wife started screaming at the security guard, she seemed to be very agitated and aggressive as well. She looked at him, then ordered him to try to believe this young boy, let him do his job. After the order was given, the young guy told everyone to leave the room, and with their cry they interfere with work. The guard, of course, clenched his hand into a fist, and thought to himself that this child is really very cheeky. Ray decided to act, and noticed that after he pierced the tumor, only pus came out instead of blood. He looked at her again and realized that it was not just a tumor, but something special. Having studied it more closely, he realized that it was formed under the influence of poison. It seems that someone wanted to poison the king a long time ago. Therefore, he continued to stand near the king and tried to help him by forming a huge magic circle around himself with the help of mana. It's time for a full-fledged operation, so he got ready and began to straighten his elbows. After he prepared for the operation, he still has great skills from a past life, he immediately formed a scalpel from his finger, as well as other necessary tools, and was ready to start the process. First of all, he needs to remove those parts that have already festered so that the infection is not transmitted to healthy organs. The whole family watched this process, and they were also really a little embarrassed by the fact that this was all done by a little 15-year-old genius. He also needed to make an incision in his right side on the side of his chest. After he did this, he grimaced a little at what he saw, since the picture was not the most pleasant. And it happened as he expected, even the lungs were affected, which means that the disease has been progressing for a long time. He was very interested to know why no one had considered him before. But fortunately, now he will be able to fully engage in his treatment, which he is doing right now. The rotted part of the lungs is not that big, so it can be easily restored. Immediately after that, truly magical things began to happen on the operating table. Ray decided to create a surgical thread using mana, after which he planned to use it and sew up the body. All his skills, which he had been honing for 10 years in the library, were very useful to him right now, because he continued to work a miracle in front of the whole family. They were all as shocked as possible, but no one was screaming or resisting his actions, everyone was just watching. Suddenly, another maid came up, who said that the boy brought by the young mistress was really very smart. Also, the butler complimented him, because he also did not expect him to be so cool. But the guy was as focused and serious as possible, despite the fact that he already had charisma, which is not inherent in his age, just like skillful hand movements. He was truly a genius who is born once every 1000 years. He continued to sew up his patient as if he were in the operating room in a past life, he only had one last stitch left to do. Everyone watched him and concluded that he was like a puppeteer who was pulling the strings. No one could say anything bad about him, because everyone was shocked that he really was such a cool specialist. 
Almost no one had any doubts that Ray could really work a miracle and save their patient. The maid who literally just arrived was also shocked by this, because she had never seen anything like this in her life. Therefore, together they looked at the guy again, and both agreed with this. The operation was not easy, so the guy was sweating a little, and decided to wipe his forehead, as he was almost finishing the operation. He has already done all the main points, and also sewed up all the wounds of the patient. Only the simplest task remains, just to start the heart so that it works. He began to give him artificial heart massage, and in addition, he decided to create an automatic external defibrillator, which is intended to restore the normal functioning of the heart, all with the help of his magic. And after he himself created a defibrillator, he began to massage the heart, stimulating its work. And after just a minute of time, the patient's heart began to beat again. It began to be covered with blood, everything was so cool done, as in a previous life. The guy received unexpected positive emotions, because for the first time he managed to save the patient in this life. He turned to the patient's family and then informed them that the operation was indeed a success. Everyone was shocked, including the guard who disliked this guy so much. But Ray was no less surprised, because he did not understand why they had such a reaction. Looking at the patient again, he saw that blood was coming from his mouth, so everything became clear to him. Due to the fact that the blood in the dead body suddenly began to circulate, there was a strong bleeding, which must be corrected now. Here the guard really could not stand it a little, and could hardly restrain his emotions. But it did not last long, after which he immediately began to poke his fingers at the guy and scream, accusing him of being a scammer, which he was sure of from the very beginning. But Ray did smile, and he felt a little embarrassed as he tried to explain to everyone what just happened. But the guard absolutely did not believe him, and tried to convince everyone else of this, since the patient still continued to lie dead. The guard was very angry, so he asked the guy if he really wants to explain to him right now and prove that the patient is alive. Can't he see that blood is flowing from him? But Ray tried to calm them down, because for him it was not a problem. This is a normal moment during the operation, the most important thing is that the patient is alive. But no one wanted to listen to him, since he simply opened the body of the deceased, does he really not have at least a drop of humanity? Ray clutched his head, as it was very strange to him that absolutely no one wanted to listen to him, despite the fact that he tried to explain everything. At that moment, the girl also entered into a dialogue, and told him that he had promised her that he could definitely save her father. She looked at Ray and started screaming because she just trusted him. But the guy continued to be shocked, because he really did his job well, and the patient really did not die. The girl asked to look at him, at the moment when the patient continued to lie down, not showing active signs of life. She continued to cry very hard, because her father had just died, because of this guy, since the girl brought him to her house. Ray was very upset, he could not understand why she did not believe him. All he asked was just to wait a little. It's really very strange, because what's wrong with them? Do they really not know what an operation is? Absolutely unexpectedly for him, all the guards began to insult the guy, one of them even put a sword to his neck. The guard started yelling that the guy had killed the Viscount. And now he still dares to argue with the young mistress. He called another guard for help, and also asked if what he had done with the body of the king was not enough for him. They approached him even closer, and began to threaten with weapons, which Ray clearly did not expect. He exhaled, and said that saving his life was indeed not easy. And instead of gratitude, they just bared their balls and sent them towards the guy. He addressed the guard in a rude tone, asking him to repeat what they were trying to accuse Ray of. Do they really believe that he is the swindler who killed the Viscount? From this, he got very angry, and became as aggressive as possible, saying that this time, they definitely contacted the wrong one. Indeed, not everyone is ready to endure the loss of a loved one, and everyone has their own different emotions. As a doctor, the guy understood this, and it was clear to him that they were seriously angry. He looked at the guards and put his hands in his pockets, waiting for the fight to begin. But he also gave himself an account that nothing else could be expected from this world, in which he had just begun to appear as a person. He exhaled, and tried to explain to them once again in a calm tone that the operation was indeed successful and that a little time was needed. He was about to leave, and said that they looked at the patient after a short period of time, since he needed to recover from the operation, and now, in order not to waste time, he would just go. He looked at them and got angry, making it clear that they should not stop him in any way. But the guard was very angry, it was clear that he did not like the guy from the very beginning, so there was a feeling that he was ready to break him right now. And so it happened, he could not control himself and pulled out a sword, saying that he would destroy the guy for disrespect. Ray was as cold-blooded as possible, since this is not the first conflict situation in his life. Who was trying to stab him with his magic chains? He did not expect that this could happen to him, because how could such a small guy be able to shackle him with magic? How is this possible? 
he was like a defenseless child, watched by his entire army and waiting for instructions. No wonder he immediately ordered an attack on this guy. Although he was scared, he understood that Ray would not be able to use several spells in a row, so he needed to hurry. But Ray was really smart, so with a slight movement of his hand he used his next grip. A few seconds later, two knights were immediately chained and disarmed. The most important commander was really frightened, and already began to worry a little, because really the guy in his youth had mastered double magic. The commander looked at him and could not understand how he got such knowledge of magic, but the guy really understood very much in him and is strong, it was clear that he was not ready to give himself offense, especially when he did everything as correctly as possible. He looked again at all three guards who were trying to catch him, and like a true gentleman, he said that he was warning them for the last time. He ordered the guards not to even try to catch him. It was already really dark outside, the guy spent a lot of his time with them, which he could have spent on learning from the same magic. He was upset that his time was wasted, and no one appreciated his abilities. He realized that no matter how far they were from modern medicine, but such behavior is already quite savagery. It was unpleasant for him that everyone held him for a stupid child, besides, they also called him a fraudster. But he did not doubt himself a bit, and went to the door of his house, rejoicing that this was really the first patient who had been cured in this world. As he thought, his medical background is of little help in this world. His mother was waiting for the guy, and therefore decided to ask why he came home so late. But he told her that he was really very busy, so he didn't even keep track of the time. She began to scold him, because does he really not remember what time she ordered him to be at home? He was supposed to come back at 7 p.m., did he not look at the time? There are really a lot of bad people in this world, why didn't he think about his mother, and what would she have to do if something happened to the guy? Therefore, she punished him and now he will sit at home for two days. She continued to scold him and used her index finger while Ray himself just tilted his head and listened. It was very unpleasant for him, because why everyone everywhere keeps him for a small child, that is why this thought did not allow him to sleep peacefully and he spent the whole night in insomnia. Meanwhile, in the mansion of the king, to whom the guy just performed the operation, really interesting things began to happen. The king woke up and asked everyone what had just happened. In addition, he did not leave the thought of who is this guy after all. Everyone was shocked, including his daughter, who started shouting in the direction of her father from happiness, rejoicing that he could speak again. He burst into tears of happiness, because life returned to him again, which means that it is not yet time for him to die. The daughter and her wife were very surprised and frightened at the same time, because they had never seen such a miracle before. Who insulted the guy and wanted to destroy him was also shocked in the same way, because he couldn't believe that his employer was alive, but how could this happen? He hid his weapons and could not believe that the Viscount had really been resurrected. Immediately after that, they began to remember the words that they spoke in the direction of the guy, they took him for a scam. In addition, the guard also felt ashamed that he insulted him and wanted to kill him. The wife also closed her eyes and began to cry, because a young guy in whom no one believed could work a miracle. They looked at their room and realized that it was a huge mistake. After all, they did not even thank their savior in any way. That is why the wife ordered the security guard to take responsibility and find the guy as soon as possible. Patamushta this issue is a matter of honor for their family. The guard was very shocked, did he really have to take responsibility for this? He took a step and said that it was indeed very stupid magic. But his wife insisted that he find him as soon as possible and apologize for his rudeness, with which he, of course, agreed and began to carry out this order. The butler was also shocked, and still could not believe that such a young boy did such a miracle, is he really a saint? Suddenly they all turned sharply in the same direction and were frightened by this phrase. They looked at the window and continued to discuss the guy, because they had never heard that saints could use magic, so it was incomprehensible to them. The butler looked at his king, and then asked everyone to also notice how prettier his face was. Have you all seen it? He's definitely gone to hell. He the guard was terrified and asked everyone in the room, because if he is not a saint, how did he bring the king back from the other world? A huge emblem has appeared, so who are the saints? They are chosen by the gods themselves and endowed with incredible divine power. This is an opportunity to hear the will of the Lord. It is they who are destined for the fate of God's favorites. And they are also God, only in human form. The wife grabbed her chin and got very nervous, because was that boy really one of them? She had never heard that there were saints in their kingdom. Perhaps the rumors about his greatness have not yet spread strongly enough, since even the high priest could not cure the illness of their relative. If he is a saint, then the commander of the knights made a really big mistake. He already understood this himself, so he asked for forgiveness, because with his ignorance he disgraced the honor of the whole family. The wife was upset, but nevertheless said that it was the fault of all those who are in this room. Therefore, the girl offered to go in search of a guy and ask for forgiveness. 
At that moment, the father also woke up, who began to ask what they were talking about there. This scared his daughter a little, and he held on to his chest, where they had just been early after the operation, and also asked what is the other saint that they are discussing. What were they trying to do behind his back? But his daughter approached him, after which she reported that the saint was able to heal him. The father hit his papa with his fist on the blanket, and decided to ask, did he really wake up thanks to the saint? After that, he looked at the guards and started yelling at them, as they also managed to get rude to him. He was ready to tear them apart, because how dare they do that? He looked at his hands and felt young again, so he ordered them to find him immediately. It is necessary to connect absolutely everyone who is in the mansion in order to find it by any possible means. He once again looked at the room, after which he began to shout, ordering him to immediately begin this task. Well, Ray continued to sit in his room and read literature about magic, but he noticed that his ears were really burning very strongly, did someone start discussing him so much? He spent the next morning in the forest, because he had come to this path since the very morning. His mother wished the boy luck and supported him in learning a new skill. He was very excited because he was standing with his wand and trying to use his spell, trying to activate the healing ability. But apparently something did not go according to plan, because the wand broke into pieces, and the hand was also partially damaged by such an action. Ray wasn't used to the fact that he didn't get something right the first time, he was already used to it, because he considered himself a young genius. He made one more attempt and then a fire formed from his finger, not at all what he really wanted. His mom found it funny to watch, so she took her movie glasses and popcorn, because the boy always managed to get fire, no matter what else he tried to do. But Ray was determined, so after another attempt, everything worked out for him and healing magic was formed. Unfortunately, it didn't last long and after a few seconds it completely disappeared, leaving the boy confused. He was very aggressive and upset, because he didn't understand why he couldn't do anything. He is a genius who has learned so much already, but only healing is not given to him at all. His mom kept laughing and told him to try again and listen carefully this time while she explained. Healing is a magic that increases vitality through mana, it is very useful. He was surprised that he managed to activate the healing ability this time. And not only healing, but also other types of magic that are converted into abilities. Mom tried to encourage her son and asked him to try again. Then she turned sharply and heard a strange sound near them. It was a deer that ran out of the thick of the forest and was looking for shelter. He needed help because his leg was injured. Mom suggested that Ray try to heal the deer leg. This will be good practice for him, he thought, and it was really more interesting than studying on a daw. They agreed to approach him quietly so as not to scare him. Mom started to laugh, but Ray did not understand what was funny about this situation. They adjusted and began to carefully reduce the distance to the deer, but the boy did not look under his feet and accidentally stepped on a branch that broke. And this attracted the deer's attention. He became alert and realized that someone was sneaking up on him. They didn't have time to get a few meters before he jumped into the forest and ran. Mom nudged Ray and told him to catch up. He didn't really want to do it, but he listened to his mother and ran after him into the forest. Does a person who has been called the hands of God have to learn healing the hard way? Of course, because as a doctor he should have saved even more lives. If you compare what he did in his past life, people in the modern world did not understand the approach of modern medicine at all and did not trust it. Before every trip to the doctor, they felt anxiety and fear. Ray used magic shackles to stop this deer. The guy was shocked how quickly he ran even with a damaged leg. He approached the deer and started talking to it and promised to help with its wound. If magic is used here, then he is ready to do anything to get hold of it. The mother watched every step of her son and controlled the process. But she was very surprised when she saw such great strength in him. Before, he did not succeed in anything and he could not even show his abilities on a branch. He thought it was because he was still a doctor. Something went wrong and he needed to start over. After his magical powers, the deer was lying down and looked as if it was dead. The only thing that distinguished him from the dead was his breathing. Ray looked at him and could not understand what he was doing wrong. But after some time, they both realized that everything did not go according to plan. And he killed that deer. Ray thought he should be healed after his spells. Now he was a doctor who couldn't even cure a patient. The boy began to remember how he was taught this matter. It was the only thing he couldn't do compared to other wizards was heal it. It was all because his mana path was special among others. The main thing is not to use healing on people. He imagined that a patient came to him and asked to heal him. The guy applied his skills and the patient began to see the light at the end of the tunnel. As a result, the whole family will cry over the monument of a loved one. Ray understood that he should not use healing magic just yet. He couldn't afford to hurt anyone else. Mother and son walked through the forest and headed towards the house. It was already dark outside and all that remained was to enjoy the rest. Mom prepared a very tasty meat snack especially for dinner. When the eldest son asked what this delicious dinner was for, she was embarrassed. 
he added that it must be in honor of the fact that the sun could not cope with the healing, and together they began to laugh and joke with Ray. He vowed never to study healing magic again in his life. Meanwhile, a planned government began in the Holy Kingdom. There was a very beautiful sculpture that seemed to start talking. The Holy Father felt this and fell on his knees before her. It seemed to him that she completely called him to her. She gave the task for the Holy Father to find this person. The Mother of God told him to go and find a new white-haired boy for her. While the guard went to search for a new saint, the knights discussed this news. As far as they knew, he was young enough. But he didn't matter if he was chosen by God. They believed that there was nothing wrong with the fact that they would have another saint. This is the first time in history. All this happened ten hours before sending the delegation of the Holy Kingdom to search. Meanwhile, the owner called an assistant to her. He fell on his knees before her and thanked her for her mercy. He then asked what important business she had prepared for him. The mistress told them to find a white-haired boy in the kingdom of Cilia. Then there was silence between them, which continued for several minutes. He said that there could be thousands of white-haired boys in the kingdom. But the mistress said that the new saint is only fifteen years old and he must find him and bring him to the kingdom. He accepted the task without any hesitation and promised to do it right away. He ran out of the room and immediately started calling for Aaron. The boy approached the men and asked why he was calling him. He ordered to gather a delegation. They need to go to Cilia Kingdom as soon as possible. The men thought about what kind of new saint he is, who is fifteen years old. Chosen by God. Ray's father suggested that he try to learn the art of swordsmanship. This is a good skill that he can use to protect himself. Ray was interested in this and he really saw the meaning in this training. Compared to his past life, where his basic needs could be guaranteed. But here sometimes you have to take risks even for the sake of one apple. He said he wanted to try it once. Dad was happy and offered to start training right away. They clashed swords on the training ground. Father praised Ray. For the first time, he showed himself quite well. The fact that he used to be fond of fencing helped him a lot. It was even very easy for him, but he still didn't have the strength to beat Dad. Therefore, he began to think about what he should use in order to win. What trick can be used? Ray stopped and seemed to refuse to continue the fight. Father did not understand what he was trying to do and why he stopped. He asked if Ray was ready to give up after a grueling confrontation. He did not like this word and he again stood in front of the enemy. The guy replied that he needed some time to change his strategy. Father was a little surprised that he chose to use the sword aura. And they crossed swords again in this duel. Ray attacked with great confidence, even his father was shocked by such a technique. He even began to think about the fact that if he continued to attack like this, he would lose. He had no choice and he must also start using the aura so as not to lose. If he does not do this, then his chances of winning are almost zero. Ray looked up to his dad with delight and was proud of him. His strength was unmatched. And his aura was not like the standard one. He tightened his weapon and was ready to attack. When he hit Ray's sword, it just flew ten meters away from him and the guy fell down as well. He was so engrossed in his father that he missed the attack. The father ran up to Ray and said he didn't mean to hit that hard and apologized. Recently, there have been a lot of scouts on the market. No one understood who they wanted to find and why. They were scouts from the royal castle. They were sent by order of the mistress. They were disguised as completely different workers at every step. They communicated with each other. And everyone adhered to the same opinion that it is impossible to find a person knowing only his age and hair color. This made them very angry. They were required to report every day. And again the managers came to learn about the results of the intelligence. But they simply had nothing to answer, because it was almost impossible. Especially if he was always somewhere at home. It was easier to find a needle in a haystack. White hair and fifteen years old, this information is very little. He considered them completely ineffective and he only wasted time with them. The Kant started yelling at them because they didn't have a clue after several days. In turn, the Kant listened to morals from his boss. He said that he was an unusual boy and if people find out about his act, then a war would begin and the Holy Kingdom would declare war on them. If he didn't want to tarnish the name of their family, then he had to find him now. The Kant was ready to pay any money to whoever would find him. A man was standing nearby who heard the whole conversation and he asked how much they would pay for it. If the payment suits him, then they will be able to fully count on him. He was not even a man, but a boy. He always had a smile on his face. After training with his father, Ray had a broken and cut arm. He apologized to his son and said that it was not on purpose. The boy laughed and said that there was nothing wrong. His mother ran up and asked what happened to his hand. She saw that there was a broken bone. Ray reassured his mother because they could heal her with magic. Mom said that she would fix everything, but the boy insisted that he would heal his hand himself. He began to heal his hand without any strain. A large amount of magic immediately concentrated around him, although there was no such thing before. 
Mom was shocked by what she saw with her own eyes. It was something new for her, and after a few minutes, the wound completely disappeared and the hand looked as it did before the injury, but his mother did not understand how he managed it. Because they trained for a long time and he did not even manage to heal a branch, but here he healed his hand without any problems. The father was also shocked. The mother reminded that his last attempt ended in the death of the deer. Ray realized that he definitely needed to explain the situation. He turned to his parents and said that he wanted to tell them something about himself. Ray began by saying that he was different from ordinary people. He was different, one of thousands of ordinary people. Mom said she never doubted that and he would always be the best, but dad whispered something in her ear. Mom said they would always be by his side no matter what. Even if he brought home an orc daughter-in-law, they would still support him. This was too much even for those who were not superstitious. In the evening, the parents asked Ray again about his mana flow, because they had thought of something else at first. He replied that he uses his mana a little differently. He can endlessly use the streams of mana that he himself produces. These streams of mana were much stronger. Now the mother understood why his magic was so powerful. That's why when he uses healing on others, they just can't handle the streams of pure mana. They all remembered that the meat was very tasty that evening. The parents understood that their son was a genius, but asked him not to use these abilities on other people. This could be very dangerous, because he can't even heal ordinary people with magic. But as a doctor, he can't back down. He has to find a way out of this situation. Mom and dad also began to think about this question, but nothing came to mind. The boy knew for sure that he needed more practice in surgical operations. After their conversation, Ray said he needed to leave for a while. According to him, he went for a walk. Because the guy could not say that he was going to look for new patients. But before leaving, his mother asked him not to go anywhere with strangers. He promised that he would not do this and would return soon. Two tourists reached the village, but they did not think that it would be so big. They were going to pass this place quickly, but now they can even rest there. A guy approached them from behind and asked them to ask one question. He wondered if they had met a similar boy anywhere, with white hair and blue eyes. Such a handsome guy, but it was a very bad picture for them to compare anyone to. The guy started shouting and demanded answers to his questions. The men asked not to shout, because they really had not seen anyone like him. Ray was just passing by and stopped to see what was going on between them. In their place, the population increased significantly and various people came. The boy heard the name of the knight, which was familiar to him. He said he was paid a lot of money to find this guy. If he knew where he was, he would not have asked passers-by about it. It seems that he was a respectable young man. Then the knight looked to the side and saw this boy in front of him. The boy thought that maybe these people were looking for him. He ran up to the boy and began to examine him and compare his drawing. Then he moved even closer to Ray. He had white hair and blue eyes. The knight asked to write to the guild that he had found him. The knight tried not to frighten him and said that he was from the information guild. But Ray didn't care, he agreed to go. The men even liked it, that he was so young, but so sensible. He asked if he had been taught not to communicate with strangers. But the boy did not understand why he was being asked this. Ray said he knew they were looking for him on Bacon's orders. He just wanted to see his patient. When they were already riding the chariot, the knight asked to ask the boy a question. What did he mean when he called Vicant a patient? Is someone sick in his place? Without thinking, he answered that it was true, without even looking him in the eye. Ray asked if he was all right now. After his treatment, the knight began to think of him as delusional. He was very similar to him. While they were talking, they were taken to the right place. The boy went outside with a smile on his face. As soon as he took a step from the chariot, all the servants began to greet him. They called him a saint and welcomed him into his kingdom. At first he was scared, but then he even started to like it. Although Ray was happy to be here, he had something to say to the king. He was not the saint they were looking for. They found the wrong one, but the king did not allow such a thing to be said in his presence. He knew that the boy was a saint and was sure that he had saved him and his family. The king considered Ray to be the one who raised him from the dead. Therefore, he cannot be a saint. The guy said it was a normal standard treatment that any doctor could do. Then the queen joined in and she was also sure that Ray had saved their family and wouldn't let him deny it. The woman made her daughter Alice express her gratitude to Ray. She was a little scared, but thanked him for saving her father. She was wearing a very beautiful dress and elegant gloves. The boy paid attention to her, but could not remember her from last time. Especially the last time, when he treated her father, she said that he was brought for nothing and that he would not be able to help. Parents were shocked by such behavior of their daughter. Dad turned to her and asked if he taught and raised her in such manners. He ordered to quickly repent and apologize. Ray was very flattered and liked it. He tried to say that he was not offended and just decided to joke. 
The boy didn't understand why they behaved like that, because he didn't really do anything special. Then he turned away from the royal family and returned to the maid. He asked where the guy who came with him had gone. She answered that he left almost immediately. This guy was running in an unknown direction very fast. He couldn't believe that the boy was really a saint. He was very happy that he managed to learn such valuable information. He needed to get to the guild as soon as possible to inform the guild. Ray hoped nothing bad would happen to him on the way. The boy was treated to delicious food and asked every time if he liked everything. The king said that they were trying very hard and he was very happy that he liked it. The boy admitted that he doubted that he would ever be able to taste such food again. He could not worry about it, because after he arrived in the holy kingdom, he would eat this every day. Ray froze on the spot and couldn't even swallow his tea. He asked the commander what he was talking about. The men thought that he had already been informed. The delegation of the sacred kingdom has already arrived and is ready to take him home. The guy was angry and asked how they even found out that he was here. There were rumors that the father received frankness from the mistress herself. Ray didn't understand what they needed him for or what that meant. A holy kingdom that was blessed by the gods. Every time the saints appeared, the mistress sent frankness. She didn't speak directly to people, but she comes under signs and hangs. They say that a nimbus always shines over the saints. It blinds the eyes. The boy asked what he should do now. The commander replied that he needed to go to the holy kingdom. They sincerely congratulated him on such a significant event and wished him only luck. Meanwhile, his parents did not even suspect that he was not at home. Mother thought that he was very tired from the walk, so he did not leave his room. Father said that he should not be disturbed for now. Before going to sleep, Ray thought about everything he had been told about the sacred kingdom. He was so worried about all this that he fell asleep very quickly. He just wanted to live a peaceful life in this amazing world. The morning came and Cilia Castle greeted passers-by with its glow and beauty. The maids talked among themselves about who had arrived and was living in their annex. It was a holiday from the sacred kingdom of Gay. Finally, the holiday came to their kingdom. One of the maids asked what she looked like. And she heard that this girl received a blessing even in childhood. She had beautiful hair that reached her waist. Her eyes were like pink diamonds. It was said that she was so beautiful as if she were always illuminated by the sun's rays. If they are lucky, they will be able to see her while she is in their kingdom. Saint was looking out the window and at that moment a servant knocked on her door and asked if he could come in. The girl replied that he could enter without any problems. He opened the door a little and said that she had to go to a dinner party. She was upset that she was not allowed to rest for a second. The servant allowed himself to say that the saint should hurry in order to be in time. While she was leisurely preparing for dinner, she remembered one thing. She asked the servant if he knew anything about the saint. He just had very good news on this matter. The girl could not believe that her life would finally become a little easier. A smile immediately appeared on her face. She had been waiting for this moment for a very long time. Finally, he will arrive and there will be a person who will understand her. Ray still managed to escape from the commander and return home, but he understood that now they know where he lives and it will be very easy to find him. He couldn't come up with anything. If people from the Holy Kingdom caught him, he would be finished and his second life will be much more complicated than the previous one. The boy will have to pray to a god he does not know. He shouted aloud that he did not want this. And at that moment, his parents entered his room. Ray thought about telling his parents so they could run away together. But the fact is that they have nowhere to run. They have a job and a house here. Wherever he hides, the sacred kingdom will continue to search for him. The mother noticed that the son was very nervous since the previous evening. The boy did not answer her and did not say a word. He burst out of his bed and said he needed to leave for a while. His parents could only guess what might have happened to him. Meanwhile in the kingdom of Salia, the vicomte was speaking with his commissioned knight. He told him that the holy kingdom itself was interested in this boy. That is, his guesses were confirmed about that. That he was a holy boy. He could be identified by his blue eyes and white hair. The knight said that he could rely on him. Because he came to him as soon as he received this information. Vicomte understood and already submitted the information to the sacred kingdom. All that remained was to find this guy. He decided to send people to look for him on the outskirts of the city. Most likely, he lives there, because it is clear from his appearance that he is not from a wealthy family. Everyone will be looking for a guy in the village and thanks to this they will buy time. Then it will be as they agreed, when the kingdom pays the money he will return. The knight looked towards the forest and thought. He had a question. Vicomte saw that the knight was distracted and decided to ask what was wrong with him. The boy pointed to the forest and asked if they had already searched it. The commander immediately changed his face and asked if he didn't know who lived there and why they didn't go there. But the knight decided not to rush to conclusions and assumed that the saint could live there. But the commander was sure that if he lived in that forest, he simply would not be able to survive there. 
Those who are there do not like outsiders at all and are never happy for them, they knew only themselves and their values, but for some reason the knight had a strange premonition that he might be there, and his house can be located exactly in the place that everyone avoids, the forest gave its guests peace and tranquility. Its light rustle of leaves could enchant anyone, Ray decided to take a walk in it. He was thinking of getting some air and figuring out what to do next, but unfortunately he had no idea how to prevent it, is there nothing left for him but to run away from his family and his fate? but the boy also did not want to spend his whole life as a fugitive. He sat down on a large stone and wanted to put his thoughts in order. And while he was thinking about the future, someone could be heard walking through the forest from afar. He quickly stood up and began to sort through options for further movement. With every minute the sounds were getting louder and closer. He couldn't believe that people from the sacred realm had already found him. After a while these sounds disappeared, Ray decided to wait to see what would happen next. But it seems that these sounds from the depths of the forest just dawned on him. While he was looking in one direction, the trees and bushes began to rustle in the other direction. He did not understand what was happening there and began to carefully inspect the area. Then he heard the tree begin to speak to him. The boy clearly heard this voice, but did not understand where it came from. This voice asked him what he was doing in this forest. He thought maybe it was a forest spirit. But he replied that he just stopped to rest a little. But he was told that this was their territory and he had better get out of here. He did not pay attention to their remarks and said that he wanted to sit a little longer. The voice repeatedly told him to go away. Ray became wary of whoever was talking to him. He was indignant that some persecuted him, others chased him away, but he wanted the voice to understand that he was leaving because of his own desire, and not because of what he ordered him to do. Before leaving, he asked him to come to him and show his face. There was no reaction from the voice and no one was going to come to him. Since there was no direct threat to him, he decided to sit still and rest. A voice appeared again, ordering to go away right now. But the boy absolutely did not respond to these requests and continued to enjoy the surrounding nature. A silhouette appeared behind the tree and said that he was at a loss for words, what an ill-mannered human creature had come into their territory. But Ray replied that he didn't even come out to greet him because one of them was still ill-mannered. The boy was carelessly lying on the stone he had chosen for himself from the very beginning. And some creature suddenly jumped out in the boy's direction. He noticed this and was very scared. But he needed to protect himself somehow. Ray used his powerful mana streams and fought off the attack. He quickly jumped down from his resting place, and he began to complain that he was attacked unexpectedly and no one does that. If he hadn't left his mana active, he wouldn't have been able to defend against this blow at all. He then looked at the person attacking him and was surprised. This person was wearing strange clothes that he had never seen among ordinary people. The ears were very long and pointed, and as a result, it turned out to be a girl, thanks to her appearance, the guy assumed that she was an elf. He was at a loss as to what an elf was doing in this area. The girl noticed that he had completely blocked her abilities. She realized that this guy was not an ordinary person like the others. He was ashamed and said that it was really true. In this case, she categorically forbade him to be on their territory. The girl began to prepare her next attack, but the boy hoped that after the first she would calm down and understand that there was no point in this. When they collided in a duel, there was a huge explosion. The girl flew several tens of meters away from Ray. But when she looked at him, she saw that he was in perfect order. He just soiled his shirt a little. She could not believe that he belonged to a superior race. He stood and did not understand what the girl was talking about and what a higher race was. Then she said that she had changed her mind and would let him stay with them in the forest. Then she asked him to follow her. But now he himself did not want to stay and said that he had to go. The girl said that they respect the strong. These are the rules of the forest elves. She invited him to their village. Ray did not know that in this forest there is a village where elves live, although at the beginning she tried to attack him, but she was not bad. Just like any normal person, she defended her home. The boy agreed. He only had one request. That she stop attacking. After the agreements, they set off together on the road to the village of elves. Ray noticed that she hadn't even introduced herself to him. The girl replied that she was called Fila from the Gradle Flame. The boy stopped and thought about what a beautiful name she had. But she did not like this flattery and began to get angry with the boy. In order to correct the situation, he began to say that her name was terrible and he did not like it at all. The guy said if she wanted to address him, she could call him Ray. While they exchanged words, Fila said that they were already there. The boy was very surprised when he saw such a village in front of him. It was very beautiful and clean. He had no idea that they could have such a village. Did she really spend her whole life in the forest? Because he had never been here before. The other elves noticed him and realized that an ordinary person had come to their village. It was Fila who brought him here. They started asking her why she did it. Their reaction was expected and fully reasoned. 
It is logical that they will be concerned about the safety of their town. Another girl ran up to Fila. She was very happy to see her at home. Then she asked who this guy was. She assumed that it could be a new assistant. Fila replied that she thought he should be brought here. Everyone began to gather around the boy and look at him. He looked like he couldn't even defend himself. Fila also thought so when she first met him. Then she tried to chase him away, but she couldn't do anything. He was stronger than it seemed at first glance. The girl was surprised that he managed to stop Fila's attack. At first she thought that maybe he was from a higher race. But it seems that was not the case. The girl began to look at him and from the outside there were no signs of super abilities. Fila asked her friend how Lady Ira was feeling. She lived in a house that was built especially for her. Since it was above ground, it was safe enough. The girl replied that nothing had changed and she continued to sleep. And she also remembered that an elder was looking for Fila and she needed to go to her. Fila interrupted Ray's communication with the other residents and told him to follow her. He knew that elves do not treat strangers well, but it seemed to him that he was received well enough. Fila said it was all because she brought him here, not someone else. He thought that this girl was trusted in her village. Respectable people in their village lived in trees in special houses. So they went upstairs and knocked on the door. Fila met the elder and said that she had come at her request. The woman greeted her and was very happy to see her, so she invited her to visit her. She insisted that she come in because they had not seen each other for a long time. Fila began to ask about her well-being and the news that appeared while she was not at home. She replied that everything was normal and she was interested in who came with her. Fila said she brought the human child because she thought he might agree as an assistant, but the boy asked to wait. Because he did not agree to become their assistant. As a result, they still came in to drink tea and discuss the news. Fila assured that this would give him many advantages. He would be able to move freely around the village and even make friends with other elves. But the boy did not understand why he needed it and why he had to agree. The elder began a conversation about why she was looking for her. It was necessary to keep this conversation a secret from the other elves. Fila turned her full attention to the elder and was ready to listen carefully. The girl said that she would take this secret with her to the grave. The elder also said that this boy should also go outside, because the conversation was really very serious and important for their village. Ray went outside and could not believe that he was being manipulated as they wanted. First come, then leave. He had time to think about his future. Become a saint in the holy kingdom or become an assistant to the elves. It was a very difficult choice for him. He didn't really want to choose any of these options. Meanwhile, in the kingdom where Cilia were involved all to find the saint, Svyatka asked the assistants if they were able to find out anything about him and find him. But they all answered the same that they did not have any results. The girl said that they could not find him only because of their laziness. They began to cry and swore that they had done everything for this. But if they did everything possible, then why there were no results until now? Why does she need such servants? They asked to give them a little more time and they would definitely be able to find him. The saint was upset because no one in this world could understand her like another saint. She thought and decided to give them one last chance. But she said that they might not even come to her with bad news. This time they must exceed their capacity or her patience will simply wear thin. Fila talked to the elder alone and did not understand how she could die due to mana. Her breathing problems are finally over, either the disease is receding or she is living out her last days. Besides, she is still unconscious. Fila was stunned by such news and did not know what to say to her. After they finished talking, the girl went outside to Ray. She was completely broken and the boy saw it perfectly with his own eyes. The girl did not say a word after the conversation, and tears welled up in her eyes. She stood silently and looked at the lady's house opposite. Ray decided to ask why she was so upset. The girl said that the person who lives in that house is sick and most likely it is an incurable disease. Then she thought that he was eavesdropping. But the boy said that he didn't do it on purpose, he could just hear something even through the door. Ray thought about it and he also lost his temper after he found out. The girl told him not to worry. Because he was human and they were elves. They belonged to different races. Sometimes even people can't understand each other, and this includes different races. Only he wanted to make one small clarification. There is no shame in caring for others regardless of their race. What difference does it make for whom his soul cares about, and the soul of a creature of another race is exactly the same. Fila forgot about their main problem even for a minute after this speech. They went to her house to drink tea. When they sat down at the table, the girl kept looking at the boy without taking her eyes off it. He seemed to her a very handsome and attractive guy. She watched every action of the boy and how he drank tea. Then she caught herself thinking that she was starting to like him as a boyfriend. Fila did not understand why this was happening to her. At that time, the boy turned to her with a request. 
He asked about Lady Ira, she said that she was dying. Ray decided to offer to heal her with his powers. Fila was shocked by such an offer from him and lost her voice. He said that his goal is to help people. And he does not care about race, whether it is a person or an animal. After she thought a little about his words, she decided to ask if he was sure that he was capable of such a thing. He said that he is sure that any disease can be cured. And he can try to help her. But he didn't even know anything about her condition. How could he say such things? The boy saw that Fila did not believe his words at all. He began to think how he could prove to her that he could heal people. Then he raised his hand sharply and tried to use his mana streams. Fila jumped up and quickly grabbed her sword so she could defend herself against the attack at any moment. The boy used his abilities to create a blade out of mana. After that, he swung and stuck it deep enough in his leg. He felt a sharp pain and was in no hurry to remove the weapon from his leg. The girl threw away her sword and began to scream and ask why he did it. When Fila ran closer, she saw that there was a very deep wound. After she looked, the boy began to use one of his healing skills. The whole house shone. His energy seemed to penetrate the walls. Fila did not have time to observe everything that was happening at that moment. After he accumulated this mana, Ray channeled it into his wound. He spent a lot of energy in order to demonstrate his abilities in the best way. Even the elves who were not far from the house saw that the light was radiating from it. You'd think it was some sort of mystical tree house. This went on for about a few minutes and when the boy finished he looked very exhausted. However, his wound was completely healed in those two minutes. Only his pants were damaged. Fila tried to explain this fact in her head. Ray said that if there is a person who can heal that elf, then it is only him. The boy was sure that he would definitely be able to help her. But when they voiced their proposal to the elder, she said absolutely no. Fila tried to explain to her that this is their chance and they cannot treat Lady Ira so irresponsibly. She was someone they respected and worshipped. But even with good intentions, they cannot take such a risk. The elder cannot allow an unproven medicinal method to be used on her. No matter how the girl tried to prove to her that they could really help, the woman refused to even listen. She asked them to go about their business and do something useful. Fila was upset and even angry with the elder for not giving her the opportunity to even try. Ray thought what's the point of her not even trying? Who will they worship if she dies? Fila and her boyfriend went to the forest for a walk. It was obvious from the girl that she was very upset, especially since she saw Ray's abilities and believed that he could help. She really hoped they would convince the elder to agree. Ray said that everything was fine and maybe she would be able to heal without his help. She started to smile, but her smile showed desperation. Ray asked if he could visit them in the village sometimes. She replied that she could and, if she wished, she could even stay to live with them. The more he earned the recognition of the other elves. The guy listened to the girl to the end and thanked her for her kindness and sincerity. He said that he would leave. The girl did not think that the boy would leave them so quickly. Ray was a little embarrassed and said he had some business ahead of him. He promised to come back tomorrow, so he asked Fila not to miss him. It angered her, although she understood that it was true. When he left, the girl felt relief and sadness at the same time. She watched as he moved further and further away from their village. At the same time, the girl could not tear herself away from his silhouette. She couldn't take it anymore and decided to calm down and leave. As soon as the girl left, the boy left the path and ran into the forest. He wanted her not to see his next actions. Ray climbed into the nearest tree and began to examine the village. He tried to find among the many houses, Lady Ira's house. And so he finally saw him in the distance on the highest tree. The guy looked at him and said that doctors never abandon their patients. He needed to get to this tree without being noticed and he did. When he opened the door to the house, it was like a royal court. It seemed to him from the street that it was an ordinary tree house. He began to look for the lady's room, and when he found it, he quietly entered her door. As soon as he opened the door, a glow rushed from the lady into that crack. Everything around in the room shone and glittered, because the house was located specifically opposite the sun. The boy came closer to her and saw an exceptionally beautiful elf. She was lying as if she were already dead. All in white, beautiful clothes. The body was not completely covered with a cloth. Her hands were folded on her chest. She was very beautiful with long beautiful hair. But her eyes were closed. Ray liked her very much, because her beauty could enchant anyone. He tried not to be distracted and to collect himself, because he could not lose his common sense in front of the patient. He took her hand to check the lady's pulse. Then he bent down to her face to check if she was breathing. All this was normal, so the reason for her sleep was something else. He took her hand tightly again and held it. It looked romantic enough. Ray wanted to look inside the body with mana. He could walk through all her nerve cells and check the whole body. But her body was also fine, otherwise he didn't even think she was dying. Will he not be able to cure her? It was necessary to better study the peculiarities of this world before rebirth. 
While he was with her, a strange smell began to appear in the room. The boy also felt it on himself and began to think about what it could mean. It seemed to come out from under the body of this lady and was not very pleasant. When the boy turned her over and saw what was happening to her, he was shocked. This horrible smell was coming from the bedsores on the back of her body. He did not understand how they could bring her to such a state. They told her how much they loved her and adored her, but they couldn't even take care of that. He needed disinfectant to treat his wounds. But where could he be taken, because now his possibilities are limited, because no one knows that he was next to the lady. When he looked up, he saw from the window a very beautiful lake in a green meadow. He immediately went there and found a leaf in the form of a water vessel. Then he went to the lake and collected clear water there. He couldn't directly use his healing magic because it was dangerous. He still remembered the deer he tried to heal. So now he decided to channel the healing power into the water. In any case, he had no choice but to act on this plan. He returned to her room cleaned his hands and began to use the water to heal her wounds. At the last moment he stopped and remembered that this was a creature that everyone respected and worshipped. The words of the elder stuck in his mind that she did not allow the use of the latest methods to treat Ira. He hoped that later he would not be punished for having dared to touch God's creature. Her back looked terrible. This was logical because she had been lying in one place for several weeks and no one had turned her over. In any case, how could they abandon her in such a state if they respected her so much? They had no reason to forbid saving her. Hopitz began treating her bedsores with his healing water. He carefully moved along her body and gradually healed the wounds. Ray was so engrossed in the process that he didn't notice it getting dark. He had to go, because the journey home would still take some time. Until he could figure out the cause of the illness, this was the best he could do for her. He decided that he must come tomorrow. Meanwhile, the servants in the kingdom were looking for the mistress to bring the news. They should soon receive information about the search for the saint. Their guild is searching all the kingdoms, so it was only a matter of time. The girl has already heard it so many times that it just immediately becomes unpleasant for her. She warned them that her patience was on the limit. That is, they allowed themselves to test her patience. The servants fell to their knees and again began to cry and beg for mercy. The girl was already fed up with their bullying and she had enough of that. She got up and said she couldn't trust them anymore, and she will personally search for him. Svayata asked to prepare ammunition for her departure. Meanwhile, Ray once again came to Lady Ira to wash her wounds. They noticeably healed and after a week the boy expected that they would completely disappear. Everything went very well. Every day he entered her house and worried about her. First, he wiped her body with purified water, and then warmed the stiff muscles to circulate the blood. The rest of the time he spent in her study. There he studied her boring books and this became his daily routine. The boy looked at her drawings and had fun in this way. Of course, she never answered his questions, but he always spoke out loud anyway, told her about how he got to her or what happened with Fila, and also about other things that came to his mind. And thus a month passed. Ray came to her house the next day and opened the door. He began to tell that Fila had a day off and they decided to have tea. But when the boy came closer, he felt this terrible smell again, but much stronger. He stood shocked at the entrance and did not understand what was happening. Ray then dropped his bag and ran over to her bed to check on her but she was barely breathing and if a little more time passes she will die completely. Something prevented her from breathing and it would be noticeable even to an ordinary person. He could not even think that this could happen. The guy started looking for a ventilator, but then he remembered that he was not in the hospital. He was very angry that he was powerless in this situation. The only thing he could do at that moment was nothing. He just literally watched her slowly die. But he could not allow that, because this is his patient and he will fight to the end. The boy looked over her whole body once more to find the reason but there were no external damages and no traces of poisoning either. Vital organs were functioning normally. Then it was not clear why she was dying. He had to find a way to heal her. He began to think and remembered that he possessed strong mana streams. But should he have used his power, will Ira be able to withstand his mana and not have the same result as with the deer? The thought of this made him laugh a lot and he smiled. He studied medicine in order to save people, not to be afraid of them. And at such an important moment, everything flew out of his head but he had to pull himself together and do his best. The boy began to activate his mana and concentrated in one place. The whole room was covered by a bright glow that penetrated the walls. The house began to shimmer thanks to Ray's powers. Many elves who were nearby saw the same glow again, but already in the lady's house. Ira was filled with his magical energy and began to glow as well. Ray hoped she could withstand such powerful mana streams. The guy gave all his strength to heal her, and tried to control the mana so as not to hurt Ira. She rose to the very ceiling under the influence of magic. Her body seemed unreal, as if from a fantasy film. Fila saw that many people gathered near the lady's house and decided to check what was happening there. When she ran up, she saw a bright light coming from the lady's house. 
She had only seen such a glow once, and that was when Ray was healing his wound. Is he still trying to save their Lady Ira? She did not know how long he had been doing it. But even a creature of another race cared much more for her than they, those of the same race. She ran into her house, opened the door and saw something crazy. Ray used his abilities to make some inexplicable movements. There was a huge concentration of mana around him. The girl could not even imagine that this was possible. Ray gave all his strength to this healing. It was incredibly important to him. He needed some more time to fully finish this process. And finally he stopped and all that remained was to hope for a positive result. She was still in the air under the boy's mana. After some time, this barrier collapsed and Ira was free. Due to this powerful wave, both Fila and Ray simply flew away several meters. The boy was affected much more because he was the one using this power. He fell to the ground, but even though he was in a lot of pain, he kept thinking about Ira. When he regained consciousness a little, he was able to open his eyes. And he saw in front of him a beautiful girl who radiated joy and beauty. He had nothing more to worry about, everything worked out for him. Therefore, he fell powerless, finally relaxed and closed his eyes. He did not understand where he was. The feeling was as if he was in water. It was a very pleasant feeling and he wanted to rest like that a little more. He opened his eyes a little and saw Ira, who was telling someone that she would take care of him herself. The elder argued with her and said that this is a human being and he is not their friend. He tried to do something with her body without permission. The boy realized that he was alive and heard Ira's voice for the first time. She told the elder that she didn't want to hear it anymore. They left her here to rot for twenty years, and this person helped Ira without hesitation. It even sounded funny. He was saved by a person who simply felt sorry for her, not those who worshipped her all her life. The boy seemed to be flying somewhere in the sky, he almost did not feel his body, and completely surrendered to the current in his thoughts. Her voice calmed him. He was very sweet. He shouted very loudly and started calling Ira. Then he calmed down and realized that it was most likely a dream. Ray tried to move his limbs to see if he was awake. Then Ira spoke to him and asked why he called her. She sat next to him and did not take a single step away. Ira said she would be there to help him recover. The guy was embarrassed and could not believe that everything worked out for him, and that he did not risk in vain to save her life. She came up and hugged the boy and thanked him for saving him. Ira also added that Iona drew the picture he found when she was sad, so she asked him not to laugh at it too much. Ray was even more surprised because it seems that she heard all his stories and conversations. Ira replied that she heard absolutely everything he said. The boy cried and the girl asked why he was crying. She was grateful to him because he was the only one who cared for her until the very end. And if he had given up, she wouldn't be sitting in front of him now. Ira said she didn't even know her rescuer's name. The guy finally relaxed, smiled, and said his name was Ray. She thought for a moment and said his name several times. And then she started to smile sharply and said that it was a wonderful name. It was already dark outside and they were still talking. The boy stood by the window and watched everything that was happening in the village. He offered her to come out to people when she had already recovered. After all, they probably care. The girl replied that for the past twenty years she did not really care about them, they did not even visit her. And none of them cared about her. Besides, her anger will not be able to disappear in one day. Ray listened intently and completely agreed with her opinion. Then he decided to ask how long it had been since she regained consciousness. But for some reason, the girl pretended that this word was completely unknown to her. The guy decided to repeat and asked when she started hearing him. Ira answered that she never lost consciousness. All this time she heard everyone. Ray was shocked by this and didn't know what to say. That is, she did not lose consciousness from the very beginning. She wanted to say that she was lying unable to move. And just waiting for something. Ray wanted to say so many words to her, but decided to hold back. The guy took her hands and simply said that she handled the situation very well. The girl was embarrassed and slightly lowered her head. And then something really moved her and she was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. The girl said that she hated the people around her. All problems were always caused by people and always remained unpunished. The mere mention of people made her hate even stronger. Then she firmly took Ray's hand and pulled them forward. Everything was fine with her body, besides, her life had just begun. Ira said, until one person promised to heal her, she immediately got angry from her touches. But with Ray, everything was different. He did it selflessly and did not ask for anything in return. And like no one else, he cared for the girl and made a lot of effort. She remembered how he talked to her. And told how Fila invited him to tea. He said that he never thought that elven tea was so tasteless. The girl answered in her subconscious as best she could and said that their tea was really not very good. Then he read a book about dire flowers. The boy asked if these are the flowers that grow in her garden. 
she replied that it was them and he was very similar to them. Devotion and a smile, that's what these flowers meant. After that, he noticed her drawing and said that drawing is definitely not her talent. She already knew she was bad at drawing, but hearing it from someone else was strange, because no one ever contradicted her and always praised her so that she would not do it. Because everyone was afraid of punishment. The only thing she wanted when she slept was to answer Ray at least once. Ira could not stand it and her emotions overcame her. She began to sob in front of the boy. She covered her face with her hands so he wouldn't see her tears. Then she pounced on him and started hugging him. And thanked him once again for not giving up. Meanwhile, in the kingdom, the holiday did not find a peaceful place for itself. She asked the commander if he did not know exactly where the holy boy was. The girl came to visit him, so she apologized for such a late meeting and allowed her to go. Before leaving, she added something to her monologue. If they try to deceive her, the truth will come out sooner or later anyway. Saint looked at the map and thought about where she should go next. If they couldn't find any traces in the neighboring kingdom, the only place where they did not search was the nearby forest. She ordered the entire guild to gather and prepare to go into the forest. It was deep night outside. The full moon was walking among the stars. Ray asked Ira how the villagers would treat him now. She asked him not to worry about it because he had saved her life. Moreover, they did not intend to do this, and that says it all. And if someone treats him badly, it will only make her worse. You will have to have a personal conversation with such elves. By the way, despite the fact that Ira woke up, she still did not see the other elves. The fact that they did not appear to her even after she recovered meant only one thing. They were very frightened by this flow of mana coming from the house. Therefore, the problem was precisely with this guy, that they did not dare to visit their lady. Ira took his hand and said as he filled her with mana. He held her hand as tenderly as if it were his loved one. At first, she was scared and did not think that someone would touch her body, and even more so that it would be a person with mana. But when she felt the flow of mana, she realized that there are still good people left in the world. That's why she asked him not to bother. It was enough for him to just be next to her. Ray was very happy to hear such kind words addressed to him and it really calmed him down. Then the boy said that from the very beginning he was interested in how old she was. It was clear that the girl did not like this question and answered that it was a secret. He knew that elves lived much longer, so he assumed she was around 200 years old. Ira pretended not to hear the question and turned away. The guy was persistent so he asked again and said that maybe she was 500 years old. She continued to be silent. But when he said that she might even be 1000 years old, she jumped up and said that it was already too much. She did not understand why he thought about her age at all. The boy replied that he was just joking. Ira pretended to believe it and started laughing. They sat together and watched the stars in the sky. The girl had never felt anything like this. Was it happiness? The guy said that it's strange to feel happy when people make fun of you. But she was sure that she was happy now. Ira could not feel happiness because she was never interested in anything. Ray interrupted her and said that now she can be happy. She agreed, but on one condition. If he will be next to her. The boy was not surprised because he understood that this situation had brought them very close. When he treated Ira, the feeling of inferiority or even lack of something did not leave him. Maybe he was the best doctor in his past life, but here he is just a helpless person hoping for luck. The most important thing in medicine is experience. He needs to gain experience in this world in various fields. If the holiday kingdom is the most developed in the field of medicine. Moreover, if they themselves are looking for it, then there is only one thing left. Become a saint and gain all the knowledge and experience of the holy kingdom. He was very sorry that he would not be able to stay with Ira, but he had no choice. They were sitting on the bed and Ray said that it got really loud outside. In the middle of the village, people gathered in front of the elder. Ray said maybe they should go out to the people. They protested against the elder because she was hiding the fact that their queen was terminally ill. She tried to apologize and said she made a mistake. Their denunciations became even louder. In such an atmosphere, it is better for them not to interfere. Ira understood that no one had come to her all this time. He saw that the girl was angry and asked her not to do this. But she did not listen and went down to the center to the people. The lady looked very presentable and beautiful. Her health was in perfect order. She stopped by the elder and greeted her. Ira looked angry and asked to stop these accusations. Everyone began to worship her and greet her. But she said she didn't want to hear it anymore. Ira asked if there was even one elf among them who came to visit her personally. Everyone was silent and no one could answer this question. The girl knew the answer to this question, but she still felt very offended. None of them even tried to find out what happened to her. And now they are trying to blame someone for their guilt. Although they themselves did nothing good. One of the elves dared to tell the truth about the elder. Ira thought he was just going to make excuses for their actions. 
but he said that if the elder had told them what had happened to their lady, they would certainly have come to her. He suspected that she had personally ordered the elder not to tell about it. The elder watched this from the outside and understood what nonsense he was talking. Ray also heard and saw all this. This elf definitely made things difficult. Ira was extremely angry and was ready to punish the hypocrites. She has demonstrated her power and strength, which makes her their queen. The girl decided to order them and use minimal force for this. She threw particles of her magic at them and paralyzed the elves. They felt pain as from an electric shock. Ira sometimes has to be cruel so that no one takes her kindness for weakness. She considered these elves to be ungrateful scum, and if they believed that it was her fault, then she was ready to leave this forest. The elder tried to stop her, but it was in vain. The elves fell to their knees and began to beg for mercy and to stay, because without her they can do nothing. The girl climbed back into the house and Ray asked if she was all right. He couldn't even imagine what would happen to this place if the head of the elves left. This meant that they could be attacked at any moment. Ray reflected on this act on the part of the girl. Is she really ready to go to such lengths for the sake of justice? Ira was now very hard to calm down. She didn't understand how they could afford it, and when she missed that moment, her status as head of the elves became nothing. Ray waited for a good moment to pop the question and asked if she really wanted to go. She replied that it was a better solution than watching their arguments, and it was obvious that they needed her help all this time. He asked where she would go if she decided to leave the village. There was one place she always wanted to visit. She was not there for only 20 years, although in reality it is an eternity for people. If she is about 1000 years old, then 20 years is really very little. Elf stood at her door and asked to come down and asked to forgive them. They begged to give them one last chance and they would make it right. Ray looked at her and realized that she said all this out of anger. But the elves didn't lie, she really wanted to leave. The boy was forcing her to admit that she really didn't want to. Maybe they did wrong, but in fact they needed her help and support. Ira thought about it and agreed with this opinion, although she was very angry with them. The story about the legendary surgeon doesn't end and continues to develop, and the dialogue between the guy and the girl is just beginning to continue, where Ray still manages to convince the girl that they still need her. His wonderful gift of negotiation, which he himself had accidentally discovered, made him feel really good and he began to rejoice. But the girl still continued to be troubled by something, so she decided to ask him something unusual. She turned to him and wondered, could he stay to live with her? Such a question definitely stumped him, because he had never had to deal with this before, except in his past life, and that was unsuccessfully, so he was worried. The girl tried to calm him down, because they would have much more fun together, but Ray turned around and refused, which the girl obviously did not expect and wanted to know the reason for such a sharp answer. He looked at her with a confident look and said that he needed to go to the holy realm. She was also surprised, for she didn't understand what he had to do with them, but the guy explained that they had been looking for him for a long time. The girl was also puzzled, for why would they do that? But the guy was amused and even embarrassed, because they all consider him really holy and say that the priest received a revelation from the goddess herself. His friend was even more shocked and couldn't understand what was going on right now, was he really a saint? But he uses mana to heal, not divine power. Ray believed himself to be a saint, so he laughed and said that there was nothing wrong with not getting a blessing, although he noted that he didn't know anything yet. The friend was shocked, for how could it be, a saint and no divine power? Between a saint and an ordinary person, divine power is the main difference. She moved closer to him and decided to ask him if he had used magic when he treated her. He exhaled and averted his gaze, he hadn't planned to do that, it was just that the situation was really urgent and required immediate intervention. The girl noticed that her illness prevented her from using magic, yet she was conscious the whole time, so it was more like a curse rather than an illness. She remembered starting to glow and didn't understand how Ray was able to heal her with basic first circle magic. It completely overturned the whole idea of existing magic. Besides, is he really a saint, but without divine power? Perhaps we are witnessing the emergence of one of the most incredible saints in history. And Ray stood there and was just shocked, for still he himself had a hard time realizing it yet. The girl smiled and was also equally shocked, because exactly also before she had not encountered something like this in her entire life. She also tried to impress Ray, who looked at her, by saying that because there was still no way she could leave the village, she felt pathetic. She smiled and said that now they should start heading out. When they came out, there was already before them a vast army of the inhabitants, who knelt and bowed their heads before their chiefs, in token of respect. The girl came closer to them and was very aggressive, so she made them explain themselves for their words and actions. They looked at her and were very scared, so they started apologizing for their rudeness and for not taking her protection for granted. The residents continued to look at their leaders with fear and were ready for them to unleash all their anger on them. The girl looked at them again and was very happy 
she realized that she had probably overreacted when she told them that she was planning to leave the village. She also exhaled and said that she could calmly understand why they were all angry at the elder, however, she hadn't done anything wrong either. Ray felt really funny about that, he realized that if people found out about it, they would all be in great danger now. But the leader continued to talk to them and accuse them and added that they are not absolved of responsibility because they didn't even try to find out anything. You are all to blame, but you should show respect for your elders, for if there is no elder, there will be no elf who can be responsible for the village. The residents continued to kneel with their heads down, making it clear that they had already realized everything and understood their mistakes. She was very pleased to be respected and listened to, so she smiled back at them as well. Whereupon the girl waved her hand and since she had already calmed down, Toe smiled at once, and asked, how about having a feast in honor of her savior? The boy was shocked by this, for he remembered what had happened to him during his first visit here. It was not apparent that he was excited after all, but he was tired of tithing very curious and inquisitive, what was the feast after all? Meanwhile, some really really strange things started happening in the bushes, it looked like a really real massacre had started there. At this moment, three warriors were already there, fighting a huge monster that was apparently guarding the forest from danger. The most important one ordered them to immediately try to focus on the target, for they needed to clear the path immediately. She waved her hand and used the exact same magical power, as today was the day they were bound to end it already. Meanwhile, the camp was not quiet either, everyone was milling about and looking for Mistress Iriel. The warrior commander informed her that it looked like they would make it to the elf village within the day. She was drinking coffee and wasn't very satisfied, maybe their scouting team wasn't that big, after all didn't the commander think the search was taking too long. She looked at them again with her beautiful eyes and asked them what they thought about it, but he decided to reassure her, because there are really a lot of different monsters in the city, so they are moving relatively slowly in her opinion, although he on the contrary thinks that everything is moving really fast. She continued to drink to calm herself down, still she should have gone alone, it would have been much quicker that way. The commander began to cry and apologize to her for the inconvenience. She finished her coffee and threw the mug on the table, on which it began to wobble and nearly shatter. Immediately afterward, she stood up and ordered all of her soldiers to get up and get ready to move on, for they had already rested enough. The sky was blue and the weather outside really was perfect for a walk. Ray still continued to be in a bit of a state of bewilderment and euphoria, he was pleased to be receiving such a large portion of attention in his direction. Everything around was decorated by the locals and they created a festive atmosphere. Ray looked at the little town and didn't fully understand what it was all about or why such training was necessary. Locals danced and cheered, some were looking for a new date, and some were just enjoying themselves and celebrating their leader. Someone walked up to Ray and started tapping him on the shoulder, catching him off guard, which was unexpected enough for him. FIA called him over to her place, as everyone at the party was already waiting for him. She started smiling and asking why he was standing there, because he was the main character of the party. He was pleased, even though he thought the party would be more modest. You are the savior of our village, how could we make a lesser celebration for you? There's just one small nuance. The girl will not be able to attend the holiday, because she had some really very important things to do, so she wished him luck and said that he would manage without her. Ray was clearly unhappy with this outcome and asked where FIA was planning to go. She placed her hand on her holster, which held a large dagger, for the safety of the village could be jeopardized more during the holidays than on other days. It was at such times that the guardian must be most vigilant. She waved her hand at him and wished him a pleasant rest, informing him that they would meet later while the guy still continued to stand in bewilderment. It was obvious that he was clearly agitated and worried about something as well, so there was nothing left for him to do but hope that everything would be alright. He gave another shout to the girl who was already walking away. FIA, I'll find you tonight, we'll eat something delicious. She was clearly shocked at such a statement and it seemed to make her angry. She ran up to the guy with red burning eyes and lifted him above her, asking if he really meant it all now. FIA was still just surprised, after all, no one had ever said anything like that to her before, especially since they also wanted to come to her. Ray noticed that the girl was very nervous, but he didn't pay much attention to it, because he realized that she lived in the forest all the time and it was unusual for her. Then she let him go and ran away sharply, for she had to run away. In parting, she shouted to the guy that he would definitely come to her, because he had made his promise. He lay very happy on the ground and didn't mind doing it, if it would only make her happy it looked like he was really starting to fall in love with her. He looked at the festive village and wanted to walk around it. To one side, local guys stood around and competed to see who had the strongest pumped arms. And on the other Ray was surrounded by several pretty girls at once, who started grabbing him wherever they could and asking him to go along with them. The guys also did not leave him alone and invited him to the table, where a lot of delicious food was prepared, which he loved so much. 
He was of course grateful to them, even though the whole thing had really worn him out a lot. The house, which is located in a large and powerful tree immediately received information, opened up old doors that were long overdue for replacement because of the unpleasant creaking noise they create. On the table was a cup of tea that had literally just been brewed and everyone was asking what happened. Why did the chief guest leave the party that was organized in his honor? He clutched his head and began to smile, as he finds such activities difficult, and there was Northwest other quiet place to be. Ira smiled and said that since this was the situation, then let him settle down as he pleased and start resting. Ray stepped closer to her and had no way of knowing what that wonderful scent was. It made him smile at once, for were they really the same flowers that grew at the entrance? That's right, today is also a girl's special day that she is celebrating in this way, so she would like to share this beautiful moment with her boyfriend and also poured tea into his mug. So he immediately began to enjoy this drink, as it was just what he needed in this weather. But still, he was still stuck with the question he so wanted answered, so he approached Ira and asked why on earth she wasn't going outside. She smiled and said it wasn't at all appropriate to talk about such complicated things over a mug of tea, so Ray apologized and said it wasn't appropriate at all if she wasn't ready for such a conversation. Ira thought for a moment, after all there was no point in her hiding this information, so she began to contemplate where to start. A long time ago, there was a conflict between the common elves and the higher elves. It's all about the fact that high elves have a different status from ordinary elves from birth, so it's customary for high elves to be respected regardless of their age. However, an ordinary elf had a conflict with a young elfess of higher bloods. This forced her to leave the village, which had some consequences. She smiled and looked at the guy, for he himself knows what happened after that, doesn't he? He was shocked at the information he had received, was she really not coming down for another conflict like this? Ira was very upset, so she didn't even know how to choose the right words. Suddenly her eyes opened abruptly and she saw something strange, it looked like what she was so afraid of had just happened. She turned sharply and looked back, she needed to act immediately, for every second mattered now. Ray also got excited and immediately asked her what had just happened. She put her hand on the table and said that something terrible had happened outside the village, but Ray was still trying to ask her for more details on what she meant. It's all about the fact that uninvited guests have just paid them a visit and they need to prepare for battle. Ray stood there in shock, for he didn't understand who she was talking about. As a sudden realization also came to him, were these really the same people who had started his search? As we entered the village, the sun began to set over the horizon and slowly night fell, which also brought fear. FIA stood and prepared to guard her home, not realizing what the humans had forgotten here. They also came here with an army of warriors, which would not go unnoticed. So she drew her dagger and prepared for a battle that could possibly be one of the last in her life if something went wrong. The chief of the army stepped forward and removed her helmet, announcing that they had come to this land in peace. She smiled and said they were just looking for a saint and would like to see him. But FIA wasn't in a very friendly mood, it looked like she was ready to fight to the end. So FIA without wasting a second started shouting in their direction and asking what people were here for. On the contrary, they were shocked at the sight of the elf, because they knew about them only thanks to rumors and did not even suspect that they existed in reality. But FIA wasn't quite ready to have a peaceful dialogue with them, so she was already ready to pull out her dagger and start a battle, but still before doing so she decided to clarify the reason for their visit. The commander looked at her with a smile and said they were looking for a saint and wanted to see him. FIA immediately realized who they were talking about now, so she tried to keep Ray and the village safe by saying that he wasn't here and they should have left. But the girl wasn't going to do that and with her arms spread out began to walk closer and closer to the elf, trying to talk to her and questioning her, perhaps she had met the white-haired guy after all. As soon as FIA heard that, she immediately remembered Ray and clearly understood that they were talking about him now. It was very creepy for her to realize this, because her new friend or maybe even future boyfriend was now in jeopardy. The commander smiled, because she realized that with this question she had achieved her goal and found out all the necessary information. She was happy that they had managed to find out where he was, so she immediately informed her army. FIA yelled out that she had absolutely no idea who she was talking about right now, but she didn't believe her, because she knows this boy, right? After saying that, FIA became very aggressive and her anger began to overflow. But the commanderess continued to stand with her arms unfolded and tried to calm her down, informing her that they had come here in peace, and only in peace. All they wanted was a chance to see the boy and talk. She looked towards the elf and informed her that they would leave as soon as they reached their goal, so she could help them do so, in return for a reward. But FIA was not prepared for this outcome and immediately drew her dagger from her holster, making it clear that there was going to be a battle now and she would not make concessions to them. The army was also also shocked by this outcome and some of them were also scared as they were not prepared for this. The commander grabbed her head and was clearly upset, because it looked like she wouldn't be able to avoid bloodshed this time 
but without giving up hope she once again turned to the girl and told them to just give it to them and absolutely no one would get hurt. But FIA reported that Ray saved them, so for the sake of his protection in the village, absolutely everyone in the village will gladly stand up to them, protecting the guy. The girl looked at her with a perfectly calm face, which still showed moments of misunderstanding. If you keep standing in our way like this, a holy war could break out. With a smile on the outside, she asked if she was really ready for this. From such a question, FIA almost fainted and became very frightened, because she had never encountered such a thing before. She looked at them and realized that these were guys from the holy realm and they definitely didn't come here in peace, even if you made concessions to them. So she clenched her teeth and was fully prepared to give her life defending the village, and that's not easy to do, you need great willpower and those people you wouldn't spare to give your life for. FIA drew her dagger with a sharp movement of her hand, making it clear that there would be no peaceful solution and she was ready to confront them. The commander looked at her and realized that meant she was choosing war. FIA was very angry, so she asked isn't this what people always wish for so much. The girl raised her hand and pointed towards her opponent with her index finger, leaving the question unanswered. She ordered her warriors to remove it, so they immediately began to do her bidding. FIA was prepared for this, so she waited for the crowd of frightened soldiers who were already approaching as close to her as possible. Suddenly she began to glow and some magical glare appeared around her body, it looked like something strange was starting to happen right now. The soldiers were also frightened and started screaming in panic as the girl disappeared right in front of their eyes. A second later, she was already at their backs and with a sharp thrust of her dagger, she delivered a crushing blow to their necks, after which she flew through like a bullet, piercing her opponent. The commander watched her and realized that the girl was actually strong, at first glance, but it wasn't that simple. After analyzing her fighting style and how she deftly dealt with the entire army, she wouldn't have thought that FIA possessed an entry-level blade aura. In addition to the soldiers, there were also priests in the army who began to pray during the battle, asking God to give protection to their bodies as well as their soldiers from enemy attacks, receiving a blessing. After activating divine protection, they also asked him to heal the wounds that had been inflicted by the enemy, which immediately began to happen. So FIA began to attack the priests as well, who began to hinder her a lot by reviving their warriors. The soldiers began waving their arms and shouting that the enemy was much faster than they thought, so they needed to get ready as the priests tried to help their other colleagues. One of the soldiers drew his blade and threw himself further into the fight, which was moving into its most active phase. The priest was trying to heal injured co-workers who were already lying unconscious and had practically said goodbye to this world. But FIA was able to catch up to him as well before he used his healing. It was very difficult for her, because there were too many of them and they were getting back on track very quickly with healing magic, so if things continued like this, she wouldn't be able to stop them. She started to panic a bit and a cold sweat appeared on her face, which informed us in the world that the situation was really not easy and it was worth making a decision instantly. So she looked at the commander and realized that she could be her next target to eliminate first to stop all of this. She skillfully and without respect stepped over the defeated soldiers and ran in her direction. And in just a second she was at the side of Iriel with the dagger, who did not worry in any way and remained calm, perhaps she had no idea of the danger that was coming at her. On the battlefield, a very strong thump sounded, the sound of which spread out for several kilometers. FIA was startled, for clearly she had not expected this outcome of events now. Her strike was stopped by Iriel's simple magical defense and bare fists, causing FIA to hover in midair with complete incomprehension and rejection of the situation. She smiled and looked at the girl, letting her know with a smile that this was the difference in strength. After these words, she clenched her fist tightly and without much trouble broke the very magical dagger that the girl had fought so long and skillfully with. Taking advantage of the situation and the fact that her opponent was shocked, she immediately charged her fist with magic and prepared to deliver a powerful blow. It was indeed very strong as there was even a fire flash after it hit. FIA flew tens of meters upwards and was defeated, she had never had to fight opponents of this level before in her life. So with great speed, she fell to the ground, gathering dust and all the dirt that was on the ground with her body. Iriel calmed down and looked at the girl, asking if she really wanted to continue all of this. FIA looked at her opponent, who was rather blurry due to the fact that her vision had not yet fully returned from the blow she had received, and sighed. Covering the injured part of her body with her hand she was very determined and made it known that she would never let them pass on. Iriel was amused by this, so she praised FIA for her persistence, even though it was really stupid of her. She stepped closer to her and asked her to make the most deliberate decision possible, no nonsense, just give them the saint and that would end all suffering and no one would get hurt. But FIA was determined and wasn't going to make any concessions at all, so she activated her magic ability and dragged the first stick she could find to her hand. This was her magical weapon for the first time, with which she was going to continue to confront Iriel, who still stood as calmly as possible and watched the situation with understanding. FIA was wounded but she was ready to fight, 
there was no way she was ready to give it to them. Help was on its way, Ray and his friend were still on the way and rushing to come to the rescue in time. The boy kept asking how much farther they had to run, but the girl reassured him, informing him that they were very close and she could already feel them not far from her. They tried their best to run as fast as they could to get to the place in time, most importantly, so that it wouldn't be too late. Ray visibly began to get nervous, for he didn't realize how many of them were there and how, and had they really amassed an entire army. What they saw shocked them, they could not even say a word for a very long time, because they did not expect to see such a thing. There was blood everywhere, on the ground, on the trees and even on the flowers, the battle was indeed very terrible and the loudest in the history of the village. Ray saw FIA who was surrounded on all sides by an army of soldiers and started shouting to her, trying to support her and find out what happened. She was already very hurt and her strength was running low, the girl was really struggling, especially after the missed blows that Iriel had given her. Ray was scared so he immediately rushed to her aid, pushing all the warriors in his way, ordering them out of the way. They saw the grey-haired guy and were shocked, did he really come to her rescue himself? Everyone was shocked, for was this really the saint everyone was talking about? They knelt down and saluted him, making it clear that they were ready to do his bidding and listen to what he told them. Iriel also stepped closer to him in her soiled heels that were completely stained from the battle, after which she also informed him that she was indeed very happy to meet him. She was all battered and dirty, but still introduced herself, calling herself Saint Iriel Belias, she was really very uncomfortable with her appearance. But Ray was very angry and looked at all of them with contempt, he didn't want to listen and take it all in, as they had caused a lot of trouble for his girlfriend. He turned to Ira, trying to find out if she was really thinking exactly like him right now. She ordered everyone to stay where they were and Ray to stay away from Iriel. Besides, if they don't want to die, they shouldn't block her path. The soldiers were shocked at such a statement, but they couldn't do anything, so they just stood still with incomprehension. The guys rushed to their friend's aid, trying to find out how she was feeling and saving her from a further battle that was clearly not in her favor. But FIA was in a state of shock and kept saying the phrase to herself, stop, I must stop her and not let her into the village. It was evident that she had no more strength and was badly wounded, for right in their arms she began to faint and fall to the ground, but the boys caught her. She started bleeding all over and her shoulder was very badly wounded, all the while having to fight alone. It was necessary to set the bone to put her out of such agony, but it would hurt a bit, but FIA was prepared for this outcome, there was no other way out of the situation. Iriel began to approach the saint and with a smile invited him to go to the holy realm from which they had come, for everyone had been waiting for his arrival for a long time. But Ray certainly didn't care about that right now, so he ripped open his t-shirt with a sharp hand, trying to make a peace tourniquet to bandage the wound. After that, he immediately rushed to his friend's aid to relieve her of such torment and cure her. Iriel was not appeased and reported that he was the one chosen by God himself, a great achievement, so it was time to reveal Ray to the world. He was shocked, as he clearly hadn't expected to hear such a thing. So he asked Iriel to repeat what she had just said, was she really talking about accomplishments? That's right, isn't that an accomplishment where you are doing God's will? From this point on, they have a lot of work to do. Ray was in incomprehension, because he could not realize what they wanted from him and what exactly she was talking about. He looked at FIA who was in critical condition and asked, could they talk about such things now that she was not well? But Iriel was ruthless and informed her that all this was just a consequence of her refusal to obey her request. She could not go against God's will, so she offered her a reward and also warned her that otherwise force would have to be used, but she still refused. Waving her hand she said they didn't kill her after all, but Ray understood absolutely nothing, was invading their territory and taking him by force normal behavior. But Iriel informed with a calm face that they had no other choice. Ray was surprised, did they really think he would just follow them obediently after all they had done? Iriel's eyes lit up and she began to threaten him, saying that she wouldn't want to use force on a saint. Ira started to get angry as well, after all she was amused to hear such things, apparently it wasn't enough for the army that they had invaded their territory, so they also dared to threaten her savior. So she got angry and suggested that Iriel reveal all her power to her. But Iriel informed them that the power of the holy realm would be no match for some elven woman. Ira was ready to fight and since she was so confident in her words, why not put it all to the test and see who was stronger? The soldiers immediately surrounded her and asked her how dare she speak like that. It is not right to attack the safety of a saint, but with a simple force of thought, she broke instantly all of their weapons, which were already definitely not combat ready, just as Iriel had done to her friend. They were shocked, for they did not understand how such a thing was possible, though they had already seen so much today. Ira continued to look at them with contempt and hatred, she was ready to destroy each and every one of them. The soldiers were ordered to fight even without weapons, so they were frightened, but they still began to obey the order. 
All of this lasted until one of them fell to his knees and started begging Ira for mercy and asking for forgiveness. Ira laughed, for was this really the power Iriel was talking about? It looked like she couldn't get anywhere with these guys. Iriel also became saddened by this, it means their faith in God is weak and needs to be corrected. It also made Ira laugh even more, because did she really think that God was really able to give her power? In fact, they are all just limited by their faith. Iriel wouldn't stand for it, so she immediately activated her magical powers and was ready to fight, as such statements hurt her self-esteem a lot. She wasn't happy about Ira talking too much, so she threw herself into the fight, even though tears were already starting to come to her eyes. Ira smiled and used a grab that should help her in this battle. And it did work, Iriel was terrified, for for the first time in her life she had been captured and disarmed by magical chains, something she clearly could not have expected. Ira laughed and asked, what was it like to call yourself the power of the Holy Kingdom and be stopped by some Elphus? Iriel was startled, but still asked, did she really think the Holy Kingdom's powers ended there? Panic began to take its toll and she announced that she would take Ray back to her lands at any cost, even if she had to pick him up piece by piece. At this point, the birds began to fly away from the scene of the battle as they realized that the situation right now was starting to heat up. Ira slapped her and ordered her to shut up and not to speak in a tone like that, something she clearly wasn't used to hearing towards herself before. If it's enough for her to take his body, then the guy's life is really precious to her. So she can at least use her powers now and show what she can do. Iriel was terrified, for Ira had said he had no problem wiping out her disgusting country, and her along with him. But Ray asked her to stop and stop bullying, for he himself had said he was going to go to the Holy Kingdom. This made Iriel very happy, for she realized that right now she would definitely be saved. Only he was going to do all this for a reason, he had certain conditions for it to happen. The guy still continued to stand there looking at Iriella, it was very important for him to get exactly what he wanted. She was also very much shaken and aroused, so she didn't fully understand what the guy in question wanted to get from her this time. Ray showed his finger and said the first thing he wants to do is that he will now call himself a saint for no God's sake. He will become a saint precisely at his own will and can also cease to be one when he wishes it. And Ella was very much surprised, because she was obviously not prepared for this, she had absolutely no idea what to do now and how to react to it, how would it stop being holy? It's really unacceptable. But the guy was determined and immediately made the second point of his conditions. If something like this happens again, he doesn't know what he will do about it. In this way he made it clear that he did not plan to tolerate any more of this kind of behavior towards himself and his friends. The girl was scared, Vitya she didn't even realize how he would react, how would he act in such a dire situation. But the guy just threw up his hands and said he might leave the holy kingdom and become a saint in an enemy country. Iriella looked at him with bewilderment, for she did not understand how a saint could give a god. But still, she calmed down, because if he could betray a god, he would lose his divine power, so she wasn't completely worried and asked perhaps if there was anything else the guy wanted to get. And in the third, but equally important condition, is that he wants to use any library in the kingdom to study and gain new knowledge. The girl rejoiced very much from such a point, for indeed it is very easy to realize. But the conditions didn't end there and the guy immediately put forward a new one, which made everyone around him a bit surprised. From now on, they will all pay him compensation for his work, and also the other important things that they have to give him clothes, food, and housing. And if they are able to give him all of these things, then he agrees in principle. But Commander S.H. was really surprised, after all, she had never heard anyone request compensation before, what did he mean? Ray started yelling at her, because really, did she not know what he was talking about? This is real money we're talking about. Iriella almost fainted from this, for she had never seen such insolence before. Already even the priests had begun to shout in her direction that it was definitely not worth it, for a saint could not make such conditions. They all began to talk, for how could a saint ask people for money? I'm sure he's not a saint at all, and God chose him wrongly. Hearing this, the girl was very much surprised, for perhaps it really was all about a mistake. She opened her eyes and looked once more at the saint, saying that they were willing to accept absolutely every condition except the first. But Ray started laughing and waving his hands, for the first condition was really the most important. The commander from this outcome of events once again fainted and did not even know how to properly negotiate and react to such a situation, so she asked the Lord's help to cope with all this. And finally it's time to announce the fifth condition. Ray pointed at FIA, the same village keeper that Iriella had beaten very badly with her soldiers, then ordered her to apologize for her actions. He was very aggressive, so he ordered not just to apologize, but to do it really sincerely. After saying that, he looked at Ira and asked her to untie Iriella to let her dialogue freely. She lost her balance immediately after this and began to fall as the chains no longer held her. Iriella fell to the ground and sadly began to say that she couldn't do that, 
meaning she wasn't willing to apologize for her actions. She looked at the guy again and asked him to consider her position as a saint who was doing God's will. Ray looked at her with disrespect and decided to ask her what position she meant. She was the first to attack, and she hadn't even considered the position of the guardian who was guarding the village. Iriella could barely stay on her feet and then informed that she had no other choice, she had to get the saint and bring him to the kingdom. It was all FIA's fault for ignoring all her requests. With a sad face, Ray looked at her once more before asking if she really wasn't going to apologize. But the girl was determined, so she closed her eyes and lowered her head before answering, saying that no apology she wasn't going to make. She began to analyze the situation, saying that she could have apologized if it were her misdeed, but the responsibility that lies upon her is very great indeed. One word could bring the wrath of God. Meanwhile, the sun had already begun to set over the horizon and night was coming, albeit slowly. Ray began to turn around and said that in that case he was ready to end the conversation. Now let God give them another saint if they were not ready to accept his terms. The girl was shocked by this behavior, because she did not imagine that everything could be really so complicated, she was used to that everything always obeyed her, but it seems not this time. Ray looked at his friend and said that they needed to get back right away as the keeper needed to be treated and helped. They started to walk over to FIA and tried to lift her up, which Iriella really didn't like very much, you could see she was clearly against it. She asked for her attention for a moment, trying to distract them from the activity. She said she may not be able to apologize, but she would do everything they asked, so she would ask him again to accept the offer. But Ray wants absolutely nothing more, he said that just an apology would be enough for him. The girl was very much frightened, for she realized that this could be very bad for her, but a decision had to be made right now. The boy had already taken the keeper in his arms and was about to leave with her, the moment the entire army of opponents stared them in the back. Well in the meantime the night was already approaching, his girlfriend also became curious that everything would be alright. When they had already moved a fair distance away, Ira still informed him that it was not too late to go back, for they would welcome him with open arms if he so desired. And the guy thought about it, but all already reported that he is not a bit sorry for this act, if she cannot apologize for her act, then all the more should not go there. Ira didn't understand why the guy was doing all this for them. They're not even from the same race. And he was amused and very pleased, he's just doing what he wants to do. If we have already touched on this topic, it would be foolish not to find out what he really wants. The answer is very simple, a happy life. His friend became nervous, for in that case he should definitely have become a saint. The guy kept walking along with his wounded friend, and developing a dialogue. Yes, of course it would be nice but being nervous about nothing and helping the sick was not exactly what he wanted to do for the rest of his life. The life he has now isn't really bad either, is it? He looked up at the sky and realized that finding happiness in the little things was his calling, and that was what would be enough for him. The girl looked at him with understanding and a smile, for there was indeed a great deal of wisdom in his words. They continued onward, and with every step, every minute, Ira was more and more amazed at the genius of this guy. A truly nocturnal atmosphere has already formed outside, as the sun will be fully behind the horizon in a few minutes, and the moon will replace it. Iriella continued to stand there with incomprehension and guilt, for through her they had just lost a saint. She began to remember the dialogue with him, also the moment when he started to leave, saying there was no point in continuing the conversation if she wasn't ready to apologize. She continued to stand there pondering all these phrases in her head, for had she really made a mistake? One of the priests ran up to her in a panic and tried to explain that perhaps there was some mistake here, as there was no way a saint could introduce himself in such a way. Iriella looked at her equipment and began to run that phrase over and over in her head. She then picked it up and threw it on the ground, which really really shocked all the nearby team members. She ordered them all to go forward, exactly in the direction all these guys had gone, along with the saint. She was getting very curious, she seemed to have some sort of plan, after all 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 she has to do is go to her elf village. The time was already quite late and, as you can already understand it, so immediately at the entrance to the village the guys were met by two strong elves who were very much worried about the guardian's condition and hoped very much that her injuries would really not be critical. Immediately afterward, they also saw Iriella walking alone towards that very village, but clearly no one here ever wanted to see her. So the elves immediately drew their weapons and pounced on the girl, they ordered her to stop and under no circumstances dare to come close to the place. But she spread her arms and informed that she came to this land in peace, so she wants to meet the saint who is in their village. The elves were shocked by such a statement, for just as well they had never known before that they had some kind of saint in the settlement. But nevertheless, they still didn't fall for this provocation and request, because even if the girl is telling the truth, they have no right to let a person into the village, so she needs to leave now, if she comes even one more step, they will consider it as an attack. 
The girl realized everything, so she stopped and asked them to relay the information to Ray that she was here and waiting for him. The elves were emphatic, they made it clear and clear that doing so would be impossible, so the girl needed to leave right now. But Iriella was persistent, so she asked for their help and to let her just wait for him here. She looked at the elves once more and promised that he would not harm them in any way, but they didn't want to listen to her, so they said it would be much better if the girl kept her distance and and stood in the same place, or better yet moved farther away. Iriella lowered her head in acknowledgement, then indicated that she would not be moving from that spot. The elves just looked at her with misunderstanding, but everyone was already further away from reacting to it in any way. They began to wonder who this girl was talking about, did it really come down to Ray? Meanwhile, the girl dropped to her knees and covered herself with her jacket, seemingly preparing for some kind of ritual. Some strange sounds began to appear near her cape. She knelt down and removed all her shoes in preparation for prayer, whereupon everything around her began to glow. She did it very long and intensely, it looked like she was trying to apologize and redeem herself. The elves began to worry a little, because they had never encountered such a thing before, so they consulted and decided that they should inform Ray about it. It was already dark in the village and everyone was practically getting ready for bed, but right now our guys didn't care about that at all. They took FIA into a room and began the healing process. After a while, things weren't so critical anymore and finally Ray can take a break too. He felt very good about being able to help his friend who was willing to give his life for him, but suddenly someone knocked on the door. And he opened the doors with a misunderstanding and decided to find out what was going on and why wasn't he interested. Lion informed him that there was someone on the outskirts of the village who wanted to see him. Ray immediately realized what was going on and was a little perturbed, since they were still trying to change his mind. The guy got very aggressive and started yelling, asking how much is there, 10 or 20. Well the answer really surprised him, after he found out there was only one person there, he couldn't believe it. It was already very dark outside, it was deep night. The moment he approached the village guards, they greeted him and began to explain the situation. In front of that they traded him hard and started asking where the culprit of the celebration had disappeared to. But it seems the guys had a good time without him. He couldn't help but wonder what kind of person was looking for him after all. The elves and simply pointed a finger in the direction of where the girl was standing, and informed him that she had been waiting for him all day and had not stopped praying. He moved closer to you and was clearly expressing his displeasure. She was shocked that he had come to see her, but he wasn't ready to talk, he just wanted to know why she had come back here. Tears came to her eyes, all she wanted to do was just talk. Ray didn't believe these tears and talk, so he just calmly asked her once more if the girl was going to apologize. But the girl was also still talking about how she couldn't apologize, but instead she was willing to prove her sincerity to him. Ray waved his hands and became very aggressive again, because if the girl is not going to apologize, then everything she did was in vain, doesn't she understand? She began to panic and tried to get up off the ground, trying to change Saint's mind that her feelings were indeed genuine, which of course he began to doubt. She looked at him and informed him that her status did not allow her to apologize, but she could pray for all elves until they realized it. Ray looked at her and said that if she remained absent from her post like that, the Holy Kingdom would go looking for her, and because of that, they would be attacked again and it would cause a lot of damage, hadn't she even thought of that? She felt a little scared, but she understood everything, so she kept praying, she prayed to God that the Holy Kingdom would not take such measures. But Ray was skeptical, did the girl really think he'd believe her so easily? But she convinced him that he should just take her word for it. And she pointed at Aira, for if her words seemed to be a lie, then wouldn't an elven woman be able to recognize such a lie? Besides, they would all be able to overpower her. Ray was a little perturbed, for should one really believe her? Iriella realized that her arguments had become solid, so the guy practically trusted her already. He waved his finger and said that he would only let her do what she wanted once. After that, whatever they did to her was not her problem, and if the elves turned her around and told her to leave, she wouldn't dare disobey them. Iriella was very happy about this decision, for it was exactly what she wanted, a smile immediately appeared on her face and the realization that she was now trusted. Ray immediately started walking towards the village, not even turning around or looking at the girl, but still she had some points she would like to discuss with him. Ray turned around and asked what else she wanted. She was very embarrassed and didn't even know how to ask it properly. But still looking at him with her sweet eyes, she decided to find out where she could clean herself up. The guy was very angry, because he had no idea that it would be so difficult, so he began to think to himself that he was already fed up with her. The dark night had passed and a bright sunny day had arrived. Iriella was still kneeling as well, only in a different place and continued to thrash about. This was seen by the elves, who were puzzled as to why she was standing there. They just watched her and realized that if things did go on, she could spend the whole day there again, didn't she have a problem sitting in one place for that long? At this point, Ray approached them and was about to head home, but the elves had a few more questions they wanted to know. 
they were a little perturbed, was she really allowed to stay sitting here, after all, would she be all right if she was allowed to sit like this for so long? Ray thought about it and didn't even know how to do the right thing, because the fate of the whole village might depend on his decision. But Iriella looked harmless enough, for she had been praying the whole time. It was safe to assume what kind of god would do such a thing for him. Underneath, underneath the shell of this beautiful girl, there was a very real monster. So she spent the whole day sitting in one place, and without rising at all, it was already getting dark outside again. Ray walked up to the house, and he was very happy about it, as it had been a long time since he had been here and he already missed it. His parents, bringing the boy even a little scared, because they had already considered him missing, but obviously did not expect to see him now, as they were engaged in their marital affairs. He smiled, and told you to keep going, he wouldn't bother them. After that he immediately closed his door and went to the other room, but his parents started yelling and making excuses, because it wasn't at all what he might have thought. He put his bag on the table and was really quite tired. So after such a hard day, Ray just collapsed on his bed and started to worry because he was really having a hard time. The guy immediately started remembering all of his past accomplishments and how he worked at his previous job as a doctor, which was still in his past life. But after all that, he remembered the Yura that reported that he should have gone to the Holy Realm. He remembered the girl informing him of this several times, even when they were healing the Keeper. He asked Ira why she kept telling him this, to which she replied very simply, she thought he wanted it himself. She was very pleased that he cares about them, but he should not miss such a chance, because he got to the Holy Kingdom he will be able to learn medicine. So he started to get out of bed and remembered that he had made a promise to himself to learn how to cure any disease in this world. Immediately, he began to pack his briefcase and put various notes and books in there so that the training would go as fast as possible. He was very determined indeed, for he realized that he could not miss such a chance. The lamp on the table was still on and it was already quite dark outside, but he needed to consult his parents about this decision. His parents began to throw dishes and get very angry, for they refused to understand and accept what he was now saying. They couldn't believe that he was really a saint, and his father was drooling after this flood of information, but they still didn't understand what he meant when he said he had to go to the Holy Kingdom. Ray was also thinking about all of this and trying to get the words right, but his look said it all for himself. His parents were shocked, especially his mom, who couldn't believe that he was being completely serious now, but they also wanted to know when he should go there. And there was also an equally important question, would the boy be able to come home? Ray exhaled and really started to get a little worried, after all the departure was already planned for tomorrow, but the thing was that it might take a few years, but he would definitely come home. His mom started crying, his dad was also equally upset, because they didn't want to accept this reality, because the guy would have to spend his whole life there as a saint. But Ray didn't worry about it, because he knew he would come back, so he promised his parents again that everything would be fine and he would definitely come home. His mom ran to hug the guy, asking where could it be that a saint could come back again, but the father had already stopped worrying and just accepted this reality, asking his wife why she was crying. After all, she just needs to let him go and everything will be fine. He also started to get tears, he tried to calm her down, after all they could take care of themselves and have a good time until Ray got back, so he gave his consent to the guy and told him to go if that's what he wanted. Dad started to cry, but Ray tried to calm him down and tell him everything would be okay. He smiled and also started to cry a little, though he promised he'd come back in one piece, so it was definitely not something to worry about. In their big house the conversation went on, for even as a small child he had not roared like that, but now becoming a big boy he cried. The next morning, when the sun came out again, action had to be taken. Iriella was still on her knees as well and kept praying that all would be well and trying to atone for all her sins. Suddenly her stomach started to hurt really badly, so she started grabbing at it, trying to reduce the pain. But it wasn't as simple as it seemed at first glance, as the girl hadn't eaten anything for a very long time, she was the one who slowly began to hallucinate. Ray approached her and informed her that everything in this field was edible, so the girl could eat absolutely anything she wanted. After saying that, he turned and walked away, saying that she could do exactly as she saw fit. She looked at these plants and was very much perturbed, should she really be eating these? But there was no other choice, as starving to death was not a good idea, so she took and plucked those leaves, after which juice started running down her arms. It was quite a horrible and not quite pleasant sight, but there was no way to escape. Just imagine that this girl had been eating only in expensive restaurants all her life and had the appropriate attitude. She ate the product and immediately tried to cover her mouth and nose in order to avoid vomiting. But after a second of time, her eyes opened abruptly and it seems the girl finally smelled that beautiful scent. She began to scream in pain, for this plant was very sharp and bitter, she was absolutely not used to eating such things. Her stomach was starting to really hurt and was giving out. 
she didn't have the energy to stand it anymore so she held on to it with her last strength, trying not to vomit in the middle of the main entrance to the village. The elves watched the situation and were also very much surprised, for did the girl just eat the plant raw? But one of them was absolutely sure that people were omnivores, but he could not even imagine such a thing. The girl couldn't stand still anymore and started running around, so she asked the elves to give or at least water. But suddenly a huge lake immediately appeared near her, in which she could quench her thirst, for all the water in it was fresh. Iriella started running there with her last strength to get rid of the pain somehow. The lake itself didn't mind welcoming her anymore, so it started to form big waves. And so very quickly the girl ran up to the right place, and immediately fell into the water to drink and quench the thirst and burning that she had formed after the plant. Still the question continued to plague her, why hadn't the saint informed her that it was going to be so bad? Meanwhile the weather was really beautiful, the sun was shining and the birds were starting to sing, nothing boded ill. After quenching her thirst the girl collapsed exhausted on the grass, in order to at least get some rest after what she had experienced. She was starting to have some not so good thoughts, suggestions had already entered her head more than once about just giving up and leaving all of this. She lay there looking up at the sky, trying to find the answer to her questions there. Closing her eyes, Iriella began to worry very much, was this really what she was capable of? She was convinced that everything was happening to her by God's will, so she had to be patient. After these words a shadow covered her head and a familiar silhouette approached her, who in a pleasant pleasant voice told the saint to rise and go with him. It was Ray, who had returned from his home and suggested that she get ready, in order to travel to the holy realm soon. He still continued to look at her and asked that the girl begin to pack and prepare to go with him to the holy realm. Iriella looked at him and really couldn't even believe her eyes, could it be that she could see him and the guy was now talking to her completely seriously and not joking. But Ray still wasn't ready to forgive Iriella, so he continued to talk rudely to her, he ordered her to get up and go to the holy realm, but she still didn't understand if that meant that the guy had finally forgiven her. He smiled and said that of course it wasn't, but she hadn't even practically counted on it. Ray told her to get ready, while he went to the village to say goodbye to his friends. The Elphus greeted him, it might have looked like it was FIA, but no, it wasn't, so it was important for him to see her and see how she was doing. And he was very surprised, because she already knew about his coming and was expecting him, besides, recently the elves reported that FIA had woken up, so it was necessary to see her as soon as possible. They walked up to her cabin together, in which they gave her first aid, trying to heal FIA as soon as possible. The guy was very excited, as he was getting very close to seeing his girlfriend. FIA was really surprised to see him, even though she knew Ray was coming. It was much better visually, and she looked really pretty, you'd have to agree. Ray was a little embarrassed even, but he still picked up on the fact that it was really nice to see her here, because she was finally waking up. He approached her and wanted to ask her how she was feeling. She talked to him nicely and was very happy about the question and his visit. Ira was also standing behind her and was very happy that the guy had gotten back so quickly, and also noted that she was very happy that FIA had recovered so quickly and was already feeling much better. Ray didn't even notice her right away, so he asked her if she really cared about her friend that much, being here all the time. But she exhaled and said that for a high elf, caring for her people was a common thing. Suddenly the keeper was very frightened and began to grab her blanket, for she had just been struck by her abuser, which she obviously could not have expected, but Iriella asked her not to move, for her wounds had not yet fully recovered. Ray was already standing with his backpack, which was immediately noticed by everyone around him. His girlfriend got really excited, because he's finally got his head around it, and it seems like he's ready to move on. Ray smiled and said that he planned to go to the Holy Kingdom as he had been told, for it was indeed foolish to miss such an opportunity. Ira got a little embarrassed and let him know that she was really happy to hear that, even though she realized that he would be leaving very soon. FIA started screaming at this and tried to get out of bed abruptly, she clearly didn't expect to hear such a thing, but she remembered that Ira was near her, so she quickly calmed down and apologized to her, because she didn't want to behave like that, especially in her presence. But Ira was not embarrassed by this behavior at all. Ray also smiled, then began to parody the girl, saying if there were any questions or points of interest, she could safely ask them. Ira was very much surprised by such a thing and got a little angry, for was he really parodying her? for how dare he drive himself in such a manner. So Ray immediately apologized for such behavior. His girlfriend was looking at him, trying to find out if he was really leaving. So he hadn't planned to stay here, with them. FIA Aira's words really hurt a lot, she really didn't understand how he could do such a thing, would he really go with those people from the Holy Kingdom? Ray also thought about it, not that he had decided to do this because of their arrival here, but he had considered going there much earlier. Did he really plan to leave them for a long time? 
he didn't know the answer to that question himself, so he said that he would probably only be there for a few years. His girlfriend didn't even know what to say, it was obvious that she wasn't ready to accept this reality, just like his parents. Then she smiled, and informed him that it really wasn't that much, so she wished him good luck and told him to have a good trip and rest, and to promise her that he would definitely come back. He started grabbing the back of his head and talking about how elves have a slightly different perception of time. Ira also asked if they had finished their conversation. If so, she would like to have a private conversation with him as well. Ray looked at his friend one more time and said goodbye to her, telling her that they would definitely see each other soon. They went outside and were already approaching the house that Ira already lived in. She came closer to him and told him she wanted to give him something, but asked the guy not to refuse the gift under any circumstances. Ray was very surprised, because he really liked surprises like this, so he wondered what she was offering him. The girl asked holding out her hand, after which she grabbed it. Ira squeezed her very tightly and informed her she was passing a piece of herself to him, it would serve as proof that she was always by his side. Suddenly, his hand began to glow, everything began to transform and the process of transferring magical power began. Ray didn't realize what was happening to his hand, but it felt really good. On it seems to have begun to form the very real seal that belongs to the elves, which has magical properties. His friend began to smile and informed him that he could now turn to her when he needed help. It was obvious that the process of transferring the magic had a very strong effect on the guy's condition, because he was really starting to lose consciousness a bit. But after a minute he came to his senses and he was already feeling much better. He started to panic, because he remembered that elves used to take people as slaves, so maybe Ira had enslaved him right now, so he really started to panic about it, because would he be enslaved until his death? She calmed him down and told him that she didn't know exactly what he was up to, but it wasn't it, it was just a piece of her, her seal, so don't worry about it. It is a seal created by her magic, and she has asked that it be considered a gift in the form of hers, meaning she is now willing to obey it. She smiled and said that she would always be there for him now, so if he needed any help, for him not to be shy and turn to her, let him remember that and be careful. Ray looked at his hand that was enchanted with the seal and was very much pleased, he was tied very pleasant and unaccustomed. The guy deep down was very happy, but was still afraid to convey that emotion yet. But he could not resist for long, and after a while he smiled and was very happy with such a gift. It was already getting dark outside again and deep night was approaching, the villagers were beginning to get ready to go to bed again. Iriella was also watching the whole situation and was very pleased with this outcome. She quietly followed the guy and smiled the whole time, she was tenthly pleased that he was walking along with her. He thought this tide very strange, so he turned to her and asked if she was really that happy, because he had never seen such strong emotions before. Of course, shouldn't she be happy that she would soon return to God? But Ray rolled his eyes and realized that it seemed that these days away from the temple were really hard on Iriella. And she looked at him and said they should go as fast as they could before it was night yet. Ray looked at the village once more and was indeed very upset, for these villagers had really given him a lot. The sun was already setting over the horizon and the land was preparing for midnight. Ray continued to watch the sunset and admire these beautiful surroundings. Iriella walked up to him and asked if he regretted the decision. But Ray was indeed a little upset, for he realized that he would still be able to come back here anyway, but something was nagging him. He looked at the girl, and wanted to check with her again, would all those conditions he had spoken of really be fulfilled. But the girl smiled, and then said that about the first one still need some thought and discussion, but the rest, she will do. This made Ray very angry and she could see that he really didn't trust her and didn't want to accept her, maybe it wasn't too late to go back. But the decision had already been made, whereupon he threw on his bag, and ordered the girl to go as soon as possible, which she was very much pleased to do. They walked together and realized that they had a very long way to go indeed. Their road also passed the large house where Ray was born and spent his entire childhood. While they were walking, the guy decided to look at the map to make sure they were going in the right direction. Besides Iriella had changed the place they would need to visit before going to the Holy Kingdom, so they needed to explore it as soon as possible. But to begin with, they will need to go on a royal journey, that this is still a mystery, but the girl was very much surprised. All the matter is that the accompanying squad is in the royal capital called Cilia, so they need to first meet with them, and only then they will be able to direct the Holy Kingdom. It would be good to continue on the path to begin with, but Ray still didn't understand why Iriella was so agitated. The thing is, it takes about three days to get to the royal capital, but using mana, you can get there much faster, in about one day, right? Need to relax a bit since he'd have to run all day. This procedure really surprised the girl, so she didn't hold back and asked what the saint was doing now. She smiled and was very much surprised at the same time, for was he really going to run all the way? Ray was also a little shocked but still tried to convince the girl that it was faster that way, wasn't it? Iriella was very surprised at this suggestion, because even her divine power had been corrected, 
and Urai didn't have divine power yet, so he wouldn't be able to pull this off in any way. He thought about it for a moment and said that it would probably be much faster to get there with his mana flows than on a horse, but why do it? After all, the girl had even bought a horse to make it much more comfortable for them to get around, but he couldn't ignore that. So Ray exhaled and smiled, for now he wouldn't have to waste his strength. Iriella said she only bought one horse to save money for emergencies, no big deal. She was very worried about whether the guy would mind, but unfortunately he doesn't know how to ride horses anyway. So they sat down together and started driving in the right direction, where Ray kept hugging the girl to fall. Their journey was indeed very long because it passed through various mountains and difficult to access areas of land where I without a horse would have been very difficult indeed. After they had traveled quite a bit for the day, it was late at night, so they needed to make a quick stop and spend the night, in order to start moving with renewed vigor the next morning. It didn't take long for the guy to start using his superpowers, which he had already mastered at a fairly young age, so he heated his hand and made it sparkle. Seconds later, a fire had already formed, which began to water all those branches and provide heat. The girl was very surprised by this, because then it is possible that the guy can just activate magic by saying just one word. He is very good for his age, maybe he is a mage of the second circle but it made her feel really good about it, so he smiled even though he said it was no big deal. Whereupon he decided to make another impression on the girl, and with his index finger he pointed to the pot and filled it with water. After he was done with all that, he started pulling out plants to make something to eat from. Iriella was very much surprised, for she was absolutely convinced that it should not be added there, as she already remembered her bitter experience with this plant. This surprised the guy very much, because why does she refuse this ingredient so much? It is quite tasty, it is only worth a taste, but the girl was very nervous, because she remembers that it is very spicy and bitter. Ray smiled, for did she really eat those leaves, that is, not just the branch itself. He found it very funny, for the girl really did, after which he had to explain to her that people usually only ate the branch, though the leaves contained many more nutrients. The girl was very much surprised at such a thing, for they are indeed too bitter and spicy to eat, but why is all this information he is talking about only now? After the preparation of this dish was over, Ray held it out for her to appreciate how it should ideally be, the flavor would be different many times over. She thanked him and took her portion and already wanted to taste it as soon as possible. After looking at this dish, she concluded that it was indeed very much like a standard soup. She was still scared to eat it, but visually it looked quite appetizing, especially since it had a really nice smell to it. She took a spoon and decided to stir it around a bit. After that she wanted to try it as soon as possible and it surprised her a lot. Iriella was very much shocked at such an ingenious preparation of the dish, laying down accolades that she had made it to the culinary talent shows, for she had never eaten anything tastier before. Ray wondered very much, for why was she eating it so fast, do they not feed them in the holy kingdom? It's certainly a lot scarier than it looks, so the guy recommended eating this dish a little slower, as it can be a major stomach ache afterward. The next morning they set out on the road, where they were already greeted by the palace and the beautiful city that was built near it. The market is incredibly large, this is to be expected as this is the royal road, meaning it is exactly the same terrain as the outskirts. And so the boys had already arrived at the castle, where their escorts were surely already waiting for them. Ray looked at the whole environment and wondered very much, he was really enjoying watching it all, after all it was his first time here, so he was still a little worried and hoped that nothing would happen. And so they had already reached the main entrance to the castle, where two butlers were waiting for them to open the gates. They greeted the girl, and were glad she had come. The butlers were only so friendly to the girl, so they asked her to introduce the young man who sat on the back of the horse. Iriella smiled and reported that he was also indeed a saint. But she felt a little awkward and funny, so she decided to clarify his holiness with the guy himself. He was a little perplexed, but still said himself that he was a saint and his name was Ray. The butlers immediately apologized for such a stupid question and of course let them pass on. The guys walked into this palace and were really quite shocked by such luxury. The priests were already at the entrance and bent their heads in respect, welcoming the saint and the holy men to the castle, for they had come such a long way. The girl reported that she had finished her mission that Celia had given her and they intended to leave this castle tomorrow, so she ordered them to contact her country and notify them of their return. The priests obeyed her and said they would inform the Light Kingdom of their arrival. At this point, the girl smiled and informed the guy that he could now go and get some rest, for this she would guide him to a resting place. And so they opened the doors, which were much cooler than the very elf village. His room was like a very real palace, though yes, you are right, it is indeed a real palace. Ray was very much shocked, because this is really a real luxury, he could not even imagine to be in such a place, because his previous life he did not have the opportunity to even visit such apartments, all because he was constantly busy. Iriella approached him to ask if he liked everything. Well, the answer, 
as you can imagine, was as obvious as possible. You should get some rest, so I will go, Iriella said, and then Ray was a little puzzled, for they were to go to the Holy Kingdom tomorrow morning and would not stay long, would they? But she left the question unanswered and only said that they would see each other tomorrow morning. The guy was very much alarmed by this, for was she really up to something? He stood there puzzled and really trying to figure out what had just happened, maybe she wanted to set him up somehow or do something unpleasant to him. But there wasn't much time for negative thoughts, as he was really already tired, so he decided to sit down on his bed and change into his pajamas. Ray lay down and decided to relax, for tomorrow he would indeed be traveling to the Holy Realm. He closed his eyes and began to daydream a little, for tomorrow he would have to live there, but he still wondered if his living conditions would be much different. The next day morning came and it was time to get ready for a new day. Ray changed his clothes and immediately afterward he heard banging on his door, which should have woken him up, but he was already awake. Iriella went over to him and asked if Ray was really awake already, but he was still having trouble opening his eyes and also wanted to sleep some more, but still self-informed to move on as quickly as possible. The girl smiled, for if the guy was ready too, it was time to move out. She was very happy and dressed very differently, although the new image also suited her very well, perhaps she wanted to make a good impression on the guy and please him with her beauty. But he didn't care, he wasn't even listening to what she was telling him and was constantly thinking about his own, so he didn't even pay attention to it. But it didn't last long, he still had to tense up as he didn't fully understand where they were starting to go, was it really to the king? Her eyes began to shine like diamonds, Iriella couldn't get excited about the future event, for very soon they would see the most important person on the continent. Ray looked at his room and didn't understand why it was necessary to do this, since they usually warned about this kind of thing in advance, at least before going to bed. But Iriella reassured him and informed him that everything would go well, they would just say hello and go, informing him of his departure. Ray grabbed his head and tried to explain to her that it wasn't the main thing right now, if he knew he was going to meet the king he would at least learn some manners. The girl continued to smile and informed him that she purposely didn't want to do it because she was worried that it might disturb his sleep, that wasn't a problem right? He was already uncomfortable watching all this, as such suspicious courtesy on her part was already beginning to arouse a great deal of suspicion indeed and was starting to get tiresome. The doors opened and the butlers greeted the boys once again. Ray was a little embarrassed, for the conversation immediately began with a discussion of his new position, where the king began to wonder if he was really the new newly elected saint. He was still quite young for a king of Cilia, but he was still very strong, though not quite wise, and his name was Theogar. Well, we continue this interesting story, where the team approached the king and lowered their heads as a sign of respect. Iriella was actually a little indignant, since Ray did not want to lower his head and just looked at the king, so she tried to hint to him that he needed to lower it. After which he did this and immediately also bent her over and expressed his respect. The girl became a little embarrassed and asked if he was really trying to disgrace her in this way, but the king was also quite wise and treated all this with understanding. He asked the boys to raise their heads and told them that he had heard that they were returning to the Holy Kingdom. The girl looked at him and said that the fact that they have the opportunity to return to the Holy Kingdom is all thanks to his majesty. Theogard smiled and said that he had done nothing at all for this, all this was the merit of the strong Holy Kingdom. But Iriella insisted on her own, because thanks to the fact that they accepted him in Cilia, they managed to find the saint and their return after that became possible, so she bowed her head and announced that she would definitely repay the debt. He thought about it, because he was really interested in such an offer, which he would not mind gladly taking advantage of. The king looked at Ray and asked if he was now really the newly elected saint that everyone had been talking about for so long. He was a little scared, but still said that it was true and introduced himself again, saying his name. The king began to study him deeply and began to doubt him, because he did not feel at all that he had mana. But if you analyze his body, it would seem that he has mastery of the sword. Even Theogard himself noticed the fact that for the second time in his life he was observing the appearance of a saint, so he was also a little nervous, but now, looking at him, he also realized that Ray now poses absolutely no danger. After he analyzed the whole situation, he continued his story, saying that it was indeed a great honor for him to meet two saints in one place. While the girl was trying to say that the king was exaggerating, Ray turned to her and asked if they could quietly take it and leave here. The king was a little surprised after hearing all this, so he didn't even understand how to react to all this correctly. He extended his hand and turned to the girl, who just a few minutes ago had reported that she would be in his debt, it looked like he had a proposal. Iriella was a little surprised, because perhaps the king was already ready to do a special task for her. The king asked them to look again at the interior of his room and tried to somehow choose the right words, because it was noticeable that he was nervous and did not know how to correctly talk about his request. The thing is that his cousin, the daughter of the Archduke of Silos, is sick and no one can cure her. They had already tried to heal her by any means, they invited many priests, 
but none of them could identify the disease and make an accurate diagnosis, not to mention its treatment. He looked at the guys and asked them to at least look at her and say what it could be, but Ray was very surprised by such a request and began to behave ugly, because he began to aggressively refuse, arguing that they did not have time at all. Ray looked at Iriella and asked her to refuse as soon as possible, because they still have a lot to go towards the kingdom. But she agreed, which greatly surprised the guy and made him nervous, because he definitely didn't expect this now and was determined to move on, and not stop and give help to those in need. He looked at the girl and thanked her very much for this, which made her very embarrassed, because she herself understood that this would not only be her merit, but still, she came to terms with it and they went into the garden in order to look at it and move to help. Ray was clearly not happy, because he didn't understand why he couldn't immediately go to the Holy Kingdom. Iriella smiled and said that he was now also a worker of the Holy Kingdom, so if he learned to handle divine power just by monitoring it, it would be a big breakthrough for the world. But Ray was still not happy, because now they will spend much more time, first going to the Archduke's estate and only then going to the Holy Kingdom. Yes, that was exactly Iriella's plan. Meanwhile, the weather was beautiful outside, but that was not the most important thing. They are going to treat a sick person, aren't they? He looked at the girl and asked, since they are the only ones who can help, doesn't that mean they need to hurry up now? He is ready to go anywhere if there is a patient who needs help, because this is precisely the duty of a doctor. The priests were also already preparing for the campaign and turned to the saint, informing her that it would not be as easy as it might seem. They have already reported to the Holy Kingdom about their return and preparations for the appointment of a new saint are now in full swing, so there can be no question of them going to the Archduke. The girl came closer to him and said that this was a request from the King of Scylla himself and she had no right to refuse him at all, so she asked him not to distract her. The priest asked if the king promised anything in return. No, nothing like that. This is her way of expressing her gratitude for the fact that he allowed them all to stay here. He bowed his head and agreed with the girl, because in this case, they cannot refuse him at all, so in order to maintain a good relationship with Scylla, he will contact the Holy Kingdom and report to them about the delay in order to delay the ceremony a little. Iriella bowed her head and thanked him for his understanding, saying that they were going there right now in order to save at least a little time. Due to the fact that people in this world have not yet learned medicine, the first patient whom Ray helped, instead of gratitude, caused him a commotion. While they were moving forward to help, he became very interested in what kind of person his second patient would turn out to be and what consequences should be expected from him next. They walked all day, so since the sun began to set and night was approaching, it was decided to stop the journey for today and stop in the forest to spend the night and rest. The priest pointed his finger at the tent that he and his colleagues had set up and asked everyone to go there. They looked at the guy, who was upset because everything did not go according to the plan he had imagined, and continued to discuss it, since they themselves could not quite believe that he really was a saint. They also noticed that he was actually much more handsome than the rumors that were circulating about him, so they wanted to get to know him better and come talk to him. Ray was a little surprised after they immediately approached him and started talking to him, trying to find out if he was really a saint. The girls kindly offered to help him, but the guy assured them that everything was fine and there was no need to worry about it. They were very interested in talking to him, so they asked him for permission to stay next to him, since they were very interested in watching the guy. Ray smiled and invited them to sit next to him in a way that would be comfortable for them, perhaps he should invite one of them for coffee when they already arrive at the Holy Kingdom. A second later, the girls were very scared and surprised, because they were definitely not ready to see all this now. And they looked at the guy who began to glow very strongly after he took out his magical plant, which he found in the elven forest. It was already starting to get dark outside as the sun was setting below the horizon. Ray looked and really didn't understand how there could be so much energy in these young girls. He was really a little surprised, because after the girls left, he decided to eavesdrop on them and think about what they were already saying. It turned out that the priest was really not very pleased that the girls were discussing him, because isn't it too much honor for such a guy? He explained to them that this was still a child who had not even known life, but simply dared to set the conditions for the kingdom, besides, he was together with those elves who dared to raise their hands on their saint, had they all forgotten about this. Ray really became very aggressive, because he didn't understand what they were allowing themselves to do, why were they starting to throw mud at him behind his back. The girl threw up her hands and said that in any case, upon arrival in the holy kingdom, it would become clear to everyone that no guy is a saint, but just a dummy. Iriella listened to this statement, after which she became very angry, asking to explain what they just said about her and the saint. She was very angry, although she looked quite safe. She looked again at the guys who had just discussed them and asked them to repeat everything again, giving them the opportunity to apologize and she would pretend that she had misheard. She was really very unpleasant that they were discussing them behind their backs, because she really didn't understand which way they ended up in their dialogue. 
so she simply invited them to continue, because apparently they had something to add. At this time there was complete silence on the street, no one said anything, trying to simply ignore this phrase and avoid further showdowns, but Iriella stood her ground and did not let them do this, asking if they would continue to remain silent. At that moment she became very angry and said that in this case she would simply consider what she heard to be the truth, so could she think that the priests had such an opinion about them. They didn't know how to react correctly to all this and were very scared, trying to find at least some justification for their actions. Children, they just didn't want others to forget about what she had to go through. Iriella was very surprised, because how does what she had to go through have anything to do with them or maybe she ever complained about it? So they were talking about it for her sake, right? Well, did she ask for such help? She turned around and left, but the priest wanted to stop her and apologize. He understood that these guys were still very young and quite stupid, so it was just a big misunderstanding, and that's probably not what they really wanted to say. The senior priest grabbed them by the neck and immediately ordered them to apologize to the saint, did they really think that a simple apology would just be enough? How dare they make fun of Ray just because he is still young and even have the audacity to call him a dummy, do they really think that the girl will let them get away with all this? Obviously, the saint was chosen by God himself, so insulting the saint can be equated to insulting the choice of God himself, this is simply blasphemy. Do they really think that this situation can be resolved just because they apologized, and what if their apology seems unconvincing to Iriella? Ray continued to stand behind the tree and observe the situation, because he was interested in finding out what they were saying about him. The priests had already begun to fall to their knees and asked Lady Iriel for forgiveness, because they had no right to discuss such things. But Iriella was very aggressive, so she made it clear to them that they were apologizing very poorly. Had they really decided to doubt God's chosen one, and besides, they couldn't even properly apologize for their misdeeds. But there are people in the world who would like to apologize, but this is not permissible for them. Ray was very surprised, because he could not understand what kind of whisper it was, was she really talking about herself? That's right, being a saint at such a young age is really a heavy burden, because she knows like no one else without her words. Ray smiled and said that he knew this, because he himself was a man who in a past life was a brilliant surgeon. He was already tired of standing behind a tree and he understood that it was time to show up and talk to all these people. They ended the conversation, right? Having not received an answer to this question, Ray decided to go out and talk to them, saying that it was really unpleasant for him to hear this and it really upset him. Ray looked at all these people, telling them that he could not even imagine that they had such an opinion about him, because do they really consider him a very small child who is not able to think logically? The priests fell to their knees and were very worried, because they understood that their lives were now at stake, so they began to look for excuses in every possible way, saying that this was not what they meant at all. In fact, they are not mistaken, since they thought that he would become a saint, being a dummy. Iriella was very surprised, because why is the saint saying this now, what kind of dummy? The guy calmly replied that now he does not have divine power and he has absolutely no idea how he will manifest himself now in the holy kingdom, but even if God himself chose him, then isn't he an ideal candidate for the role of a dummy? In truth, every one of them thinks so, doesn't it? Iriella was also very surprised, so she answered this question in the negative, because why should he be a dummy? Ray continued to talk to her, but the girl insisted that God has his own plans, but Ray also did not say that God chose him for no reason he is just sure that there will be many people in the holy kingdom who will think the same way. In this case, for all of them he will remain a dummy in any case. That is why he decided to look at them again and it was clear that he was not quite ready to continue the dialogue with them, so he turned to Iriella asking what if he wanted to choose a punishment for them. They were very scared of such a priest, because the guy offered to hand them over to the inquisitors, or, in the worst case, just kill them. They began to fall to their knees and begged for his forgiveness, which also surprised him very much, but they needed to receive forgiveness, at least for once. Ray thought about their proposal and thought about how he could answer all this correctly, so that he would not be humiliated further, and would not be talked about behind his back. He was sure that there were other guys here who looked down on him, wasn't he? Therefore, he addressed them, saying that those who take him for a dummy, as well as for a small child or an insufficiently qualified specialist for this task. All of them are probably right in some way, at least in that their words are that he is still young and has not won their trust, and also that he does not yet have power, ability, connections, or reputation. However, after a couple of years that he spends in the Holy Kingdom, he will prove to them all that they were very deeply mistaken about him. The priests were very surprised, so they asked what he meant, how was it wrong? But I turned around and told them something that would make them regret what they said, everyone who looked down on him and despised him, absolutely everyone who dared to insult him would pray that he would forgive him. Ray looked at these priests, who began to cry, and said that he would leave them as witnesses to this promise, and would not punish him in any way, 
and extended a helping hand to him. The priests just continued to cry, begging for forgiveness, because they themselves began to realize that they had made a terrible mistake, perhaps all this was due to the fact that they were really in danger of death, but still they really looked like repentant people who asked for forgiveness. Ray smiled and said that he really hoped that the day would come when they would regret what they had done even more than they did now. All this will happen as long as he is in the territory of the Holy Kingdom and does not achieve his goal, he is ready to do absolutely everything to raise the honor of the Holy Kingdom even higher. He looked at the moon, which was already lighting up the earth, and said that he himself did not know how many years it would take. However, he is ready to do absolutely everything to make them go crazy about today. He began to glow, it was really clear that the guy was confident in himself, who was afraid of absolutely nothing and was ready to work to take revenge on his offenders. Absolutely all the priests and those who were next to them were very surprised and shocked, because they had never seen it so bright near a person in the middle of the night. That is why they all began to fall to their knees and express their respect, and also many of them began to mentally ask for forgiveness for what they had done. Ray continued to sit by the fire after this conversation, preparing another portion of delicious food, and while calming down, he saw Ariella, whom he immediately called to him. She was very surprised and even embarrassed, because she was very impressed by the speech of this guy, who spoke so confidently, but he also felt a little funny because the girl began to mock him a little, repeating his phrases. She immediately drew attention to the fire and asked if she should cook dinner for herself again. That's right, because the priests also ate his portions, so he needs to cook everything again. Ray looked at the girl and smiled a little, because after everything that had happened, he was really a little hungry, so he invited the girl to eat with him, because food really tastes much better when it is still hot. Iriella smiled and said that she really really wanted to eat and could not refuse such an offer. Together they also looked at the night sky, where a shooting star began to fly. At that moment there really was a very pleasant atmosphere, Everything was calm and there were no signs of trouble, Iriella really hadn't looked at the night sky like that for a long time, and right now she was lucky enough to see a falling star, perhaps this really was some kind of sign. He remembered that in a past life his name meant a shooting star. Unexpectedly for himself, he remembered that he had even forgotten that in his previous life he was called that way, because he was so accustomed to his new name. Therefore, he opened his eyes and, smiling, turned to his girlfriend and said that where he comes from, there is a tradition in which you make a wish when you see falling stars and it really must come true. The girl immediately took these words as truth and began to make a wish, which surprised the guy very much, does she really believe in superstitions? After listening to the guy, Iriella remembered the legend of their kingdom, where they say that everyone who has seen a falling star knows a happy death. The guy continued to eat his food and kept the spoon in his mouth, because what does a girl mean when she talks about a happy death? He couldn't believe that death could be happy just like the girl, so he decided to ask her how she sees a happy death. But we will never know the answer to this question, because the night has already ended outside and the morning has come, with the most beautiful weather. The carriage and crews began to arrive in the Duchy of Silos. Ray continued to read his book, and the girl just looked out the window and said that they were about to come to the patient and they would need to treat him. The priest also looked at them near the carriage and asked where they would go when they arrived in the duchy. But the girl told him that they were really in a hurry, so they would go straight to the patient. She continued to look out the window and realized that they really didn't have much time. They need to figure out the treatment as quickly as possible, after which they need to return to the Bright Kingdom, because if they are delayed, then they could have really big problems. At the entrance they were greeted by Hertz, who said that he was really very glad to see the guys, because when he learned about their arrival he was really very excited. He is really very happy because the team has come such a long way for the sake of his daughter. Iriella also smiled and said that everything is happening according to the will of God, for the sake of the suffering, they came to give her grace, because this is the duty of the saints, so there is no need to worry about this. The duke was a little scared, after which he began to worry, but still he apologized again for the rush, however, he would like to ask them to help his daughter as quickly as possible, because for him, her existence is like a tar, so he cannot watch how his precious children are suffering. The team informed him that they were ready to go there right now, the duke promised them to do absolutely everything they asked if they managed to cure his daughter. Ray was very surprised, because Duke believes so much in this girl, although she has not done anything yet. Of course, being a saint, she has divine power and is a great person. The maid asked everyone present to follow her so that she would lead them to the bedroom where the girl was. She knocked on the door and told Mrs. Layla that the saint had arrived. Ray was very surprised, no less than Iriella, because they had never seen this before, so they didn't even know how to react correctly to this, they were noticeably scared. It looks like the guy began to guess about something, is this really what he was thinking about now? Meanwhile, the patient's hand became covered with red spots, which looked really very terrible. The girl got up and lowered her head, because she was really very scared, since absolutely no one could help her, 
so she was in hopelessness. These were erythematous papules, is this really a case of dermatitis herpetiformis? Ray started yelling that they should have started treating her sooner so that she wouldn't end up in a state that they even thought was possible. Because it looked really disgusting. Iriella walked closer to the girl, who began to cover herself with her blanket and was scared, after which she asked her to extend her hand to examine her. Since there was no other way out, Layla listened to her and kindly agreed to do it. Iriella decided to cheer her up, saying that she knew that it was not easy for her now, but from now on everything would be fine and there was no reason to worry. She continued to hold her hand and used her magical power to heal the girl, after which the entire room began to glow with a bright yellow flash that blinded everyone present. Layla was shocked by what was happening and began to believe that her illness would pass and she would begin to live life like an ordinary person. Everyone in the room watched what was happening and were shocked, because divine power really exists. After several minutes, the girl's hand continued to glow, but there were no longer any traces there that would remind of this terrible illness. Layla was shocked, because her skin began to hurt a lot, like after an operation, but all the spots disappeared and she became a healthy person again. She pulled them out and was very happy, because she again looked like a beautiful girl who should worry about what to wear on a date, and not about her sores. Layla began to cry with happiness, because now her hands were healed and the treatment was completely completed. Iriella looked at the duke, who was clearly perplexed and shocked, saying that everything went fine and there was absolutely no reason to worry. He immediately ran to his daughter and hugged her very tightly, crying with happiness, which she did exactly the same. The duke looked at Iriella and thanked her again for her help, she really is a saint, because his daughter suffered so much for the last eight years, after which he completely lost hope for a recovery, so he promised them that someday he would definitely repay them. Iriella smiled and said that this was not at all necessary, because everything was God's will. Ray watched the situation and was perplexed, because at first it looked like a skin defect that required a very long treatment, but the fact that she can heal people just by touching them really inspires respect. He was very upset, because does medicine really have no meaning in this world? Iriella spent the whole day in their palace with the team, since the duke asked them to stay with them in order to somehow thank the saints for their help. He ordered his workers to prepare a delicious table from the most expensive and luxurious dishes, after which he invited the guys to a meal, worrying that perhaps this would not be enough, but he tried to prepare the best. The saint thanked him for the food and looked at him, saying that it was not at all necessary to do this, because this was already much more than they could ask for. Lord Hopal looked at her and could not take his eyes off, because he understood that according to rumors, he knew that the saint was amazing, but he could not even imagine that she was so merciful and beautiful, so he would also like to thank her from the bottom of his heart for the treatment her younger sister. She was a little embarrassed, even though she loves attention in her direction, but she was still confident that they could do the best for their Lord Gaia. At this moment, Hopal really admired the girl, and also how modest she still was. Ray, meanwhile, continued to sit upset, it was clear that this situation hurt him very much, because would medicine really not be needed? The duke noticed this and asked what happened, because the guy doesn't speak at all, maybe he didn't like the food. Ray smiled back, saying that the food was really great, he was just really thinking about something, so he immediately apologized for making Duke worry. Iriella tried to rectify the situation by saying that the saint had a lot of thoughts that bothered him, so there was absolutely no reason to worry about this. She looked at the guy and tried to find out what was happening, was something wrong? But Ray told her that he was really tired and would like to rest. Iriella had already agreed to stay that night in the castle, so she invited the guy to go to her room and relax. In it, he still continued to think and analyze the current situation, it was clear that all these thoughts did not leave him peace and made him worry. He remembered how he lived his past life and could not understand why he had shed so much blood and tears in order to become a doctor, was it really worth it? Although he still has memories of his previous life, they are all useless in this world, he really needs to forget about his past name as Park Yusung, and start living his new life, in which he is already called Ray. He has been trying to find the answer to this question in his head for several years and only now has it reached its peak. At that moment there was a knock on the room, asking if the saint was already sleeping and if Iriella could come in. Ray just looked at the doors and didn't say anything, because right now he didn't want to talk to anyone, so he just continued to lie on the bed and think about the current situation. Iriella decided not to open the door, so she said that she really didn't know what had gone wrong now, but despite all this, she asked Ray not to stop believing in himself and his strength. She is well aware that there are times when everyone doubts themselves and hopes that what is bothering him will not destroy what he has already created. Her words greatly surprised the guy, so he continued to listen to what she told him. Instead of worrying and exhausting himself, he needs to focus on the present, because the current role suits him much more than what he had before. These words really made him think. So he got up from the bed and continued to replay her phrases in his head, 
where Iriella convinces him not to lose faith in himself. He thought about it and realized that this makes sense, because now his name is Ray, but he is still a former doctor named Park Yusung. Now the guy just needs to find something that only he is good at and develop in this direction. Iriella still continued to stand outside the door and talk, crossing her arms behind her back. And when she repeated once again that she wanted the guy not to give up, he opened his doors and made her a little embarrassed, because she definitely didn't expect this. Ray smiled and thanked the girl, because her words were really very timely and this is what he wanted to hear at that very moment. She smiled, because at least once in her life she managed to help the saint, but he still had one request. He turned to the girl and said that it seemed like she was comforting someone for the first time, could this really be true? But she still didn't quite understand what the guy meant, so she asked him to explain. A situation occurred again that no one could even imagine. The maids continued to cry, because they remembered that yesterday everything was fine with the girl, was she really not completely healed? The duke was scared and very angry, so he ordered them to immediately call the saints into the room. They didn't understand what was happening here, because they were starting to prepare for the trip to their kingdom. The duke fought back his tears as he told them that her symptoms had returned, so did that mean they had failed to heal her? Iriella was shocked, because the treatment was successful and there could be no mistake, she also did not understand why the symptoms returned, so she will try to cure Layla again. The duke looked at her in despair and said that now everything was in her hands. Ray realized that this was his chance, so he asked the girl to wait and take her time. She was very surprised, after which she immediately stepped aside, as she understood that the saint now wanted to try to heal the girl in his own way. He looked at Layla, but the duke ordered her not to even turn towards the guy. Ray looked quite pleasant and asked her politely for her hand to take a look. The duke was very worried, because how could this guy heal something that even a saint could not do? So it seems it would be better if the saint just tried again. But Ray looked at him and said that if this is what he thinks about and the diagnosis is confirmed, then he is the only one in this world who can cure her of this disease. The duke refused to believe it, because how is it even possible that a young guy who doesn't even have superpowers could be the only one who can cope with such a task? Ray looked at him and informed him that the saint would not be able to heal the child in any way, they could ask Iriella to heal her and everything would be fine again, but after they left, what were they all going to do if the symptoms returned? The duke looked at him with concern, because he understood that now there really was no other way out, so he agreed to all these conditions. Besides, Ray was also absolutely sure that all Lady Layla needed now was definitely not the healing of the saint. Ray was completely confident that she needed to accept his treatment and trust. The duke was at a loss, because he understood that the guy had no strength at all, what was he going to do? His treatment does not require healing powers, he just uses all the information he knows to get rid of this disease, which is how he will heal his daughter and get rid of the disease. Layla also agreed with the guy, because she understood that he was really right, because if they didn't trust him, then she didn't think that they would have the opportunity to do anything without his help. She began to persuade her father to agree to this, because they have absolutely no other choice, since they have already practically tried all possible treatment options, but none of them have given results. The duke agreed, because he understood that they really had no other choice, so if his daughter sincerely thinks so, then he will certainly support her. He looked at Ray and began to beg for help for his daughter, falling to his knees and barely holding back tears. Ray smiled and promised that he would definitely be able to cure this young lady and return her to normal life. From the next day, he began to investigate the reason for this condition of the girl's skin. The first was hygiene, since this is the most basic component of health, the first thing he tried to check was this option, but seeing that they maids washed blankets and clothes at least once a day, a logical decision was made that one could safely rule out poor hygiene as the main one. Considering that the castle was protected by a magical barrier, it is also very unlikely that a parasite from the external environment could cause this disease. However, Ray noticed one problem that arose from her diet, because there was one thing in common, all the dishes she ate every day had one characteristic, all of them were prepared using flour. Not only that, Bread is the most commonly consumed food in this world. Also, even all the main meat products were garnished with flour products, which was very surprising. In addition, the girl's condition further worsened after eating food, which at the moment was the only clue that the guy managed to find. Flour contains an insoluble protein called gluten, which Layla eats daily, so her illness is caused by a severe sensitivity to gluten. Dermatitis is also known as an allergy, which is really not that difficult to cure, but unfortunately, the only problem is that there are no useful drugs in this world that can be quite effective. It would be difficult to try to make medicine from plants he is not familiar with, and it might take a long time, the only thing he can do now is change the girl's diet. He looked at the maids and told them to remove everything he wrote below from her diet from now on. In Layla's room there were beautiful candles and mugs near a large window that overlooked the whole city. But she had no time for that now as she continued to lie in her bed and cough. At that moment, Ray knocked on the door and asked if he could come in to talk to her. Layla was very panicked, because she wasn't quite ready to talk to him alone, so she was very worried, 
and Ray once again apologized for invading her personal space and tried to defuse the situation. He smiled and said that he wanted to see her and how she was feeling now. Layla smiled and said that everything had only gotten worse, which was not surprising, because the reason for this was her diet, which the guy guessed almost immediately. He looked at her and said that he had to tell her something very important, which Layla was not entirely aware of. From now on, he wants her to avoid foods that contain flour, that is, she must completely avoid anything that looks like bread, and also when her body itches, under no circumstances should she do this. Layla was very surprised, because she didn't understand how to avoid bread. But Ray smiled and said that for now that was all he could do for her. The girl refused to believe it, because bread was her favorite food, why couldn't she eat it? So she began to suspect that Ray was lying to her and wanted to call security for help. Besides, she looked at him again and asked if he really wasn't going to do something else. Perhaps he's using magic to heal her or something similar. But Ray smiled and said that he had already given her recommendations on what to do. All this is her treatment, which will give results and help cope with this problem. He looked at the girl and assured her that in the coming days they would be able to get rid of all these blisters on her body and he would do everything himself, since he needed to check her condition. This was where all his recommendations and advice ended, so he ordered the girl to have a good rest, saying that this is the most important thing she can do now. Layla could not understand whether her condition would really improve if she gave up eating bread, but how could this be connected? Iriella ran to the door and asked the guy what condition the girl was in now, but he said that everything was only getting worse. Iriella was very upset, but it seemed she began to guess where Ray had come to their world, but still asked if he really thought that she wouldn't get better if she tried to heal her again. Ray looked at her and informed her that her healing method was really useless, so if they use it again, everything will return to the same state as now. But Iriella did not understand his treatment method, because can a girl really get better if she just goes on a diet? If this is the case, then why didn't he do so right away? Iriella looked at him and said that she believed the guy, but the duke thinks otherwise, and as he himself understands it, now they cannot stay in this castle for a long time, since they need to go to the Holy Kingdom. Ray thought about it, because the girl was also really right, so it was necessary to make a decision quickly so as not to delay it. She was a little scared, so she asked not to look at her with that look, since she herself could not do anything about these circumstances that had developed. Ray clenched his hand into a fist and said that now it doesn't matter at all whether he can heal Layla or not, what's important is something completely different, how he will treat all his patients from now on will depend on this. Ray looked at her and said that he only needed one week to see the first results. He showed one with his finger and was absolutely sure that in such a period of time he would be able to completely heal the girl. Iriella looked at him and had no choice but to simply accept the guy's decision. The next day, Layla began screaming in her room, convincing everyone that she was not at all ready for such a treatment method. Ray could no longer hold back and also began to shout at the girl, ordering her to drink the medicine since she did not even drink a small part of what she should. Moreover, this is simple water, which she needs to regularly drink 3 liters a day, but she cried and refused, not understanding how water could heal her, because it is not even holy water. Water helps cure allergies, just believe it and drink it, is it really that difficult? When foreign substances enter our body, a chemical created by the immune system called histamine is created. Although it is produced in response to the body's defense against foreign substances that enter the body, in people with allergies the chemical is produced in excess and can cause dire consequences. Therefore, after Ray explained the whole situation to her, he tried to once again hand her a glass of water and asked her to drink it calmly, because when she starts drinking enough water, the cells of her body will be able to start working properly and everything will return to normal. This will also reduce the effects of the allergic reaction. So it is the best way to cure the girl, so he simply started pouring water from a glass into her mouth while she cried. Layla panicked, because she couldn't understand how he could call himself a saint if he treated her like that. He's just crazy and looks great. For days passed in this manner in this castle, where similar procedures were repeated every day. After Ray put the girl on a diet and also forced her to drink a lot of water, she began to hate him. However, Layla decided to trust him, because she really had no other choice. As a result, everything went well and she herself called the saint to inform him that her skin had indeed healed and Layla began to recover at incredible speed. Ray smiled and said that he was right, because he himself promised her that he could really help. Layla felt much better after she stopped eating flour and started drinking a lot of water, she couldn't believe it. Despite all the successes, Ray still said that the girl was still not completely cured, so she needed to continue treatment so that there would be no problems later. Layla already fell in love with the guy, so she listened to his every advice and no longer perceived him aggressively. Although he was worried that people in this world would react differently from those in his previous world, it seems that he was worrying about it in vain. Now it was only a matter of time before the girl was cured, or so he thought until they ran into trouble again on the sixth day. In the dining room, plates and all other utensils began to break, 
as it was simply unbearable to endure. Layla began to cry and demand that bread be brought to her immediately, as she had withdrawal symptoms. In this world, flour is a staple of the diet, so it was quite expected that she would break out and run for flour products. Therefore, Ray began to shout at her, because he understood that if she ate flour products without completing the treatment, then all his efforts would be in vain. To distract her, he needed to help the girl focus on something else, so he approached her and tried to tell her in a calm voice not to cry, otherwise she might become dehydrated. He took a wooden object in his hand and made a magical blade, starting to carve a figure out of it, which surprised Iriella very much. She asked what he was doing, but he was just trying to come up with a game, but he wasn't sure if he could do it. Iriella also didn't understand what kind of game it could turn out to be and why she should do it at all now, but Ray simply invited her to look at the chess piece he was holding in his hands. He immediately asked what comes to her mind when she sees this. Iriella didn't quite understand what he was talking about, so she asked if he was now talking about the white thing that was in his hand. She said that it reminds her of a castle, it feels like they are in a holy kingdom, and it also looks like a crown. Does it look like a crown? Ray was very happy that it really worked, so he turned around and ran, asking Uriel to follow him. She was shocked, because she didn't understand how he dared to leave her like that. Layla's room was in order and all her things were already in their places, she had already calmed down a little, as she was informed that Ray would like to see her, as well as her brother. The Lord was glad that the saint invited him for the first time, so he immediately asked if he could help with anything. Ray smiled and said that right now he needed his help, because what he was going to show them now would help cope with the withdrawal symptoms of the young lady Layla. She was surprised, because he was really talking about this strange thing that was in his hands. He made a game for them that was very popular in his previous world, but in the new world absolutely no one had ever heard of it, so he proudly introduced it, saying that it was called chess. He sat them all at the table and began to explain the rules, saying that each of them has his own army, and the rules of the game are quite simple, all you need to do is capture the opponent's king by moving your pieces, and the one who controls best will win with their troops. However, there are rules regarding how each of these figures can move, which surprised everyone in the room. What Ray now holds in his hands is a king, he can only move one square like a true ruler, keeping his movements to a minimum, and on the other side is the queen, which is the opposite of the king. As long as it is not captured, he can move as much as he wants, just as each of these figures has its own rules, which he will explain. It's really very interesting, there are a lot of variations of moves, so it's quite a complex system that would be useful in real military training. Layla was also absolutely sure that dad would like it too, therefore, Ray suggested not to delay it and invited the girls to play a game if they didn't mind competing. They immediately agreed, because it was something new for them and seemed quite exciting. Iriella smiled and invited the princess to start her turn first. Layla was also very happy, so she kindly agreed, saying that she would take the game very seriously. Ray was also very pleased, because the game really interested them, which means he was able to achieve his goal, because as long as she is involved in the game, she will be able to take her mind off her addiction. Meanwhile, their game ended, as one of the participants made checkmate. The winner turned out to be Iriella, who was very happy about such a victory and said that all this was thanks to the power of the Holy Kingdom, so they can try to hide from it, but it will still overtake everyone. She began to rejoice very much, so she began to dance and mock the girl, inviting her to simply give up, telling her that she would allow her to become her subordinate. This made Layla cry. She was very upset that she lost, while Iriella couldn't get enough of her victory. The Lord decided to help his sister, so he invited the saint to fight him to avenge his sister's loss. Iriella smiled and said that she was ready to accept absolutely any challenge, so she invited him to start the game first, since in any case, everyone would kneel before the power of the Holy Kingdom. Ray thought, because everything is becoming much better than he imagined, does this really mean that they like the game? Another checkmate, only with black figures. Iriella smiled and said that he at least tried to defeat her, but he just smiled, asking if she really thought they were playing so easy. Therefore, the Lord took his figurine in his hand and said that he was waiting for her next move, after which he would be ready to show the full power of their dukedom. Ray smiled and suggested that they stop a little so as not to get carried away so much, because until that moment he thought that this would be a good way to distract her from thoughts about starchy food, but there was an unexpected change in events. Information about the new entertainment quickly spread throughout the castle. Therefore, the father came into their room and was very surprised, because his children introduced him to a new game called chess, which was invented by the saint. His son smiled, because this is indeed a very complex and interesting game, thanks to which the duke will be able to evaluate his strategic capabilities as a military leader. He was shocked that Ray was able to create such a perfect game, he knew that Ray was sent to him by God himself, but if he could also find a real use for this game, then it would be just great. After the duke plunged into the game, the situation took on truly strange proportions. The week they agreed on is over, but why is no one talking about it yet? Ray was a little surprised, 
because he was not at all prepared for such an outcome of events, since he did not understand who all these people were, and why did even the servants also start playing chess. He looked at the guys who were also standing and starting to make figures in order to play this wonderful game. Now Ray really thought about it, because why does everyone play chess? After all, they were originally intended as a game that would help Layla distract herself and finish her treatment. Therefore, he simply excitedly watched the situation and did not understand what was happening here, since he never even thought that the game would be able to completely capture Silo's castle. After all this, the Duke decided to call them to his meeting room, where the guys kindly came. They looked at him and actually smiled very much, as their mood was very good, announcing that they had appeared, as he had asked. He greeted them and said that in just one week, thanks to Ray, his daughter's condition had really improved very much, and he also managed to create such a wonderful game that everyone liked, so he couldn't believe that he was capable do this at your age. He was very happy, since his daughter's condition had really improved noticeably, so he thanked them for the work they had done. He bowed his head in gratitude, saying that when his father, it was really very painful for him to look at her in such a state, so he asked their permission to thank him for freeing her from such suffering. Iriella smiled very hard and said that this time she did absolutely nothing, you only need to thank the saint and his methods of treatment. The duke smiled and asked her not to belittle herself and her dignity, but indeed, the saint did a really great job. Therefore, as a token of gratitude for their help, he would like to give them something very valuable to him. Ray was very surprised, because he couldn't believe his eyes, would they really give him something now? This ring was given by the ruler of our territory, it was given to this kingdom back when they saved the dwarves. Ray was very surprised, because as a sign of gratitude, are they really ready to give him a family heirloom? Well, the duke insisted on this, since in this way he expresses his gratitude, so he asked to be received as soon as possible. Ray said that he would never be able to accept this kind of gift, but in his head he was already very happy, because he understood how much money it cost, and also realized all its uniqueness and rarity. But the duke insisted that the guy try it on, since it was very important to him. And so he put the ring on his hand and was really grateful for it, but still he said that he probably shouldn't wear it on a regular basis. Ray was very scared and surprised, after the ring really fit perfectly on his finger, he couldn't believe it, so the duke said that since it was made by the palaces, the long johns are already so simple. Ray smiled and thanked him for such a precious gift, but still you are sure that he cannot accept it so easily. If the dwarves find out that the saint got this ring, they will be glad, this is how the duke calmed him down. He also heard that the boys were going to the holy kingdom tomorrow. Therefore, he allowed them to ask permission to sponsor their trip in order to make it as comfortable as possible, since the journey would be really long, so they needed to rest a little before setting off. He once again allowed them to thank them for all the efforts they had made to help his daughter and invited them to his rooms to sleep. The next morning, Ray woke up and began to communicate with Iriella, where she talked about how she was really very glad that everything was over, but doesn't it really seem to her that the Duke is really very generous? but Iriella believes that most likely he just wants to thank them in this way. Ray was very skeptical, since he always looked for a catch in everything, so he really didn't really believe in such an outcome of events. Suddenly, someone knocked on their door, which greatly surprised the guys, so Ray decided to find out if they were really waiting for someone. Iriella also said that this was definitely not for her. I wonder who it could be at a time like this. It was Layla and her brother who apologized for the late visit, because they heard that they were leaving tomorrow. The Lord was very happy, because he could not even think that they would be able to meet the saint and saint, whom they had only read in books before, because they really helped with his sister's illness and created the game of chess, so they also wanted to thank them for everything what they did for them. Ray grimaced a little and said that there was absolutely no need for this, and Ella also replied that she was very glad to meet them, but she was very sorry that they could not stay here for a long time, because great things were ahead of them. Therefore, the guys suggested that they go on a night picnic, if they don't mind, of course, since there is a castle in the backyard, which offers an incredibly beautiful view of the night sky. This will be truly unforgettable, what do you say Ray? Sure sounds interesting enough, why not? The children were very happy, because it was also a great honor for them to walk together with the saints, so they asked them to wait a little so that they had time to prepare. After that, they turned around and ran to catch everything. The girl smiled and laughed very hard, which surprised the guy very much. He didn't understand what was funny but she beat him to it and said that this would indeed be a farewell party for them, so she thought it was very nice of them. But Ray believed that all he does is work for the good of the Holy Kingdom and scare away all the people around him, so he never had the opportunity to experience something like this, even in the previous world, maybe this one has changed for the better, but he still didn't notice. Iriella also noticed that she had never experienced such feelings before. Ray also closed his eyes and thought about the moment when he first met Iriella. She was very cold and I went towards my goal, no matter what. She was also really incredibly cruel. But now the old Iriella is no longer there, she seems to have dissolved, 
especially after her questions about whether the world has changed, we can safely assume that she has actually changed. Ray asked if she would really look up for a long time, maybe they would already start moving and somehow help the guys organize a picnic. Meanwhile, the guys had already called them and said that they really needed to hurry up and go to them. They were a little worried about the fact that perhaps this was a bit of a modest picnic, but I also needed a big table, the most important thing was to spend time together. Ray was a little surprised and immediately decided to tell them that he had forgotten to say one important nuance, the girl would have to avoid flour even after he left, so if the girl continued to eat flour, the disease would return. Layla was very scared, because had she really not fully recovered? No, because her body reacts to chemicals, and flour products act like poison, so it is very difficult to recover from this disease. But Ray said that not everything is so simple, because if she can hold out for at least five years, then by the time the disease may already have receded, which frightened the girl very much. The Lord smiled and said that he had prepared something for them as a gift, which surprised them very much, while the girl continued to cry because she could not eat bread. The Lord said that he was going to light up the area, so he used his finger and magical power to make fireworks. A few seconds later, Beautiful explosions began to form in the sky, lighting up everything around. Ray was very happy about what was happening, like a little child. It was really very beautiful, especially in such a friendly atmosphere, and I remembered that he had never paid attention to such things before. So he turned to the Lord and asked him for friendly advice, did it really take a lot of mana to do such a thing? He was a little embarrassed and said that this might be the last time he would not see each other, he wanted to do everything in his power. This made Ray very happy as he seemed to have found some really good friends for himself. If this is really the case and they see each other for the last time, which is of course unlikely, then he would also not mind giving them a gift. Therefore, he also decided to do a standard trick, which he had already shown to Uriel in the forest. Ray took his finger and ordered it to light up and make an explosion. A second later, a beautiful glow formed in the sky, which very much resembled lightning. It perfectly complemented the fireworks the Lord had made, making them much more colorful and vibrant. The maids watched the fireworks in the sky and were very happy, as it was a real miracle. The duke also drank wine and watched the situation unfold through the window, rejoicing that they were lucky enough to meet such guys. Layla held her cheeks and was very happy, because she understood that it all looked really incredible, especially since she had never seen such beautiful fireworks before. The lord was also surprised, because not everyone can achieve such a high understanding of magic, so he once again praised the saint and said that he would never forget this night. Ray smiled and said that he was really very glad that he was lucky enough to spend such a wonderful time with them, it would also fill him for a long time. Magic is too convenient a tool, so he considers giving up his personal aspirations, but in the end, he still managed to understand that his methods of medicine work. Thanks to this, he was able to develop new relationships and create wonderful memories, so he will travel only as long as it takes to cure the maximum number of people, but still they need to now start going to the Holy Kingdom. Finally, Ray and the saint decided to head to the Holy Kingdom of Taya, the path to which was quite long, which is why it began in the morning. Although they had a long journey ahead of them, thanks to the support of the duke, they were able to continue their journey calmly, without any problems. The saint's squad knew that all this support was thanks to Ray, they thanked him for this, because they would be able to have a very good lunch anywhere and relax, restoring their strength. Time passed, Ray was just gaining a good reputation for himself and began to get a little upset, because in just a couple of days he had become so accustomed to tents. Suddenly they came up to him and said hello, which surprised him a little, because the voice was somehow unfamiliar. It was one priest who said that she was very inspired by the game he created, so she decided to present him with some strategies for it to make it more interesting to play. She was not alone, but with a whole team at once, so she invited him to look at their development, and perhaps even play, if Ray, of course, was not busy. He was surprised because there were too many of them, but still agreed, because why not? There's nothing to do anyway. In return, he promised to spare absolutely none of them, especially newcomers like them. The priests were a little scared, but still agreed, even though they had a bad feeling. Thus began a team chess tournament, completely spontaneously, where Ray defeated his first opponent in just four moves. The guy was also defeated in a similar way, which shocked him very much, because how does Ray manage to win in just four moves? Since they all didn't know that Ray took part in the World Chess Tournament in his previous life, all seven players lost to him in four moves. This is how he set a record without defeat and was very proud of himself, since he had not experienced such feelings for a long time. The priests were shocked, the girls began to say that they knew that he was invincible, and the accompanying squad forever changed their opinion about him. So another day passed on the way to the Holy Kingdom after which the team went for a good rest before the no less long journey that lay ahead of them. The next morning the weather was not entirely good, as large clouds appeared in the sky, but still no rain was expected. Ray began to worry a little, 
as he had the feeling that during all this time they had not actually moved from their place, perhaps it was because they were coming such a long way. Iriella approached him and informed him that as soon as they left these surroundings, the Holy Empire would already be very close, which made the guy very happy. The ground began to shake sharply under his feet and Ray rose from his chair, barely able to stand, not understanding what was happening. The soldiers began to panic, since they had never encountered anything like this before, so they were very scared. The earthquake was caused by a crowd of orcs who were out hunting, so the commander ordered everyone to take positions and prepare for battle. Ray realized that it looked like the soldiers were fighting monsters there and suggested that Iriella go to help, but she smiled, saying that she was completely confident that they could handle it themselves without any problems. But why not help them get on the road faster? There must clearly be more than three orcs there. But the answer was very simple, because if they came out, they would have to change their positions to protect them, this would cause discussion in the ranks and would do much more damage. So she looked at the guy and asked him to leave everything to the Knights of the Kingdom. Ray understood that she was partly right, but the orcs did not stop and continued to attack the army. One of them threw a huge stone towards the knights and was ready to destroy absolutely everyone who stood in their way. The knight on horseback parried one of his blows, complimenting the orc, since he himself did not expect that he could be so powerful. He clenched his teeth, because he understood that they no longer had any other choice. Therefore, he immediately shouted to the middle detachment and ordered them to reform to protect the saint and saint from the attackers. He ordered all the soldiers to try to prevent the orcs from passing towards them, but at that moment an attack was already being prepared on him. His name was Hirio and right now he was shocked by what he was seeing before his eyes. The orc's huge fist flew straight at him at high speed, making it very difficult to dodge. But Ray came to the rescue, who activated his superpower and created a shield that stopped the orc and forced him to stop. After that, he smiled, saying that even if he gets out, it certainly won't get any worse, because it seems like the knights are having a little trouble now, doesn't it? Hirio was shocked by this outcome of events and immediately began to turn to Ray, asking what he was doing here, because it was really very dangerous here. He smiled and said that everything was fine and the situation was under control, everything looked like the orcs were superior to the knights in strength, so they could use some help. Ray stopped and used his magical powers to stop them. It was like lightning that swept across the entire earth and completely captured all the orcs in its path. It was triple magic, which even the guy himself was a little surprised by, because he had never used it in practice before. The binding, earth spear, and fire obeyed him this time, so he began to attack the orcs with all his might, practically burning them alive. Hirio was very surprised by this, because he had never seen anything like this before, so he asked the guy if he was injured and how he was feeling. In addition, he thanked the guy for blessing him with his protection, but he asked not to worry about this, since they should help each other. If the commander is not mistaken, then the saint is quite young. How can he use such strong magic like this? Ray closed his eyes and said that he smelled like roasted meat, so he wondered what orcs tasted like. The guy was able to use a fourth circle spell, an earthen spear, and all this only with the help of words. But how else could he use binding and fire along with that? Perhaps he is a magician of the fifth circle or even reached the status of even the sixth circle of magic, but he did not care, as he continued to smile and enjoy his victory, calling out to Iriel. She looked at him and asked if he was really trying to exploit the rumors about how brilliant he was throughout the continent. What does he mean by this? Nothing, he just has a very strange feeling, for some reason the orcs have become so strong, maybe someone is training them. She had a bad feeling, so she said that they need to move on before the monsters unite, but Ray said that it was already quite late. As armies of other goblins began to appear from behind the bushes and were ready to fight, Hirio couldn't believe it because the goblins would also have to have a lot of courage to stand in their way to the Holy Kingdom. Therefore, he ordered his knights to take care of them, because they did not have the opportunity to waste so much time. So the knight rushed into battle to clear the way and eliminate the threat, swinging his sword. But at the moment of the blow, the goblin jumped back sharply and began to laugh loudly, thus humiliating the warrior. He was shocked by this outcome of events, because how could this be? Are these specially trained goblins who cannot be gotten rid of so easily? After that, he was dealt a strong blow by the green monster, who apparently did not want to endure humiliation in his direction. He wounded the knight and caused him severe damage, although he still could not understand why the goblin was so strong and how he could just do it. He looked at him and did not understand how he was able to achieve such power. Ray looked at Iriella and asked if she thought this goblin looked quite unusual. It was already difficult for her to disagree with this. She looked towards the fight and said that now they have no other choice, so they must intervene. Without hesitation, she took a step and was also ready to fight, since they simply had no other options. A second later, a large protective field formed near her, which scattered all the goblins who tried to attack her. 
Iriella did not feel sorry for them at all, so she mercilessly destroyed them one by one, trying to avenge her knights. Ray began to think that perhaps Uriel would actually be stronger than him in martial arts, but at that moment she shouted to the guy and warned him that a nasty goblin was attacking him right now. With no time to think, Ray swung his arm and used the force of the wind to push the goblin back. No matter how many they kill, goblins will still keep appearing out of nowhere, so if they just stall for time, they simply won't be able to deal with them. It would be great if they could destroy everyone at once, so Ray got excited about this idea and began to think about how to make it a reality. So he looked at the goblins and called them to him, getting their attention. He began to make faces in order to provoke as many goblins as possible to attack him and gather them all in one place. They were a little surprised, because people had never done this to them before, so they didn't even quite understand how to react to it and stood in bewilderment. Ray continued to tease them and run away, gathering a large crowd of green monsters around him who tried to catch him. Uriel was scared, because she didn't know what he was planning. The only sounds that could be heard were running, scattering leaves, and dust throughout the forest. Iriel didn't understand what was happening, maybe this was some kind of spell. Ray stopped near a tree, because it seemed to him that he had already run enough. He exhaled and wanted to rest a little, because he understood that there were a lot of goblins gathered in front of him, much more than he could have expected. Ray began to worry whether he had taken them far enough from the others, but there wasn't much time to think, so he extended his hand and created a huge fireball. The goblins, seeing this, could not contain their laughter, they found it funny, because is this really all that the guy is capable of? Ray smiled too, asking if they were really having so much fun right now. Therefore, he suggested that they talk about this a little later, when he showed them what he was capable of. A second later, he activated his abilities to maximum and a large flame flew towards the goblins, which looked like a meteorite and noticeably instilled fear. Ray continued to laugh at them, because now they themselves understood what situation they were in, because he had prepared a separate ball for each of them. The two goblins were perplexed and pointed their fingers towards the guy. Right at that moment, they were all torn apart as a large explosion was created that could be compared to the power of an atomic bomb. The knights who were at a very far distance were also blinded by such flames, southwest they tried to close their eyes so that so much light would not fall on them. The commander was very happy, because now he understood where and why the saint ran. He began to worry about him, so he shouted in his direction and started running to help, asking if everything was okay with him. A huge hole appeared at the site of the explosion, several meters deep, and as happens in films, Ray emerged from the smoke and immediately began addressing the soldiers and asking how long they were going to stand idle because it seems they still have a very long way to go, doesn't it? He smiled and suggested that they all hurry up to get out of this forest, and also hoped that they would not meet any more monsters on the way. The soldiers asked for a little time and said that very soon they would be ready to leave. Near the fire, Ray decided to ask Iriel, as he was very interested, are usually monsters as strong as the ones they encountered today? She replied that no, because their squad often copes with them on its own, but today it was very difficult. She was a little upset and emphasized his mana, which really surprised the guy. He also thought that if he undergoes the baptism ceremony, his mana will disappear forever, but Ray still did not understand whether this means that it will completely disappear from his body. If he is baptized in the Holy Kingdom, God himself will bestow upon him divine power, but as we know, the human body can only store one type of power, and divine power has the same properties as mana. If divine power enters his body and mana is present there, most likely it will not withstand it and the guy may die. Therefore, before bestowing divine power on him, the mana in Ray's body will gradually be replaced by divine power. He asked what happens to those people who have no mana. In this case, divine power will fill the body without any problems. But what about the mages and their circles of power, they can't save them, right? This is a really good question. So Ray continued, is it possible that magicians who do not have magic circles can gain divine power? But things work completely differently. God will create vessels for mana in the body so that they can use their divine power. Once this happens, the mana vessels created by God, which they used to call golden chains, will control all the mana that circulates in his body. But what are golden chains? This is just a term that the saints came up with. They cannot go against the word of God as they are not allowed to say or do anything that goes against their faith, so they call it the golden chains. They can't even say what they really think, so Ray also thought about it. After all, their actions contradict their own taboos, so he asked a logical question, what will happen if you break the rules? Iriella took the sticks in her hand and decided to remind them that she said that golden chains control the mana in the human body, so if you break the rules, then all the mana in the body will disappear, and he will disappear with her. So in order to better demonstrate this, she threw these branches into the fire. After which she began to laugh an evil laugh, saying that the disappearance would happen forever. Ray wondered, could one extra word really destroy him? 
This is pretty much a threat to anyone who dares to say what they want. But Iriel tried to calm him down, because in fact there are not many people who disappeared in this way, so Ray needs to be careful to avoid this. In any case, this is nothing for the saint, even though he will lose the mana that is now flowing in him. Ray was a little scared because he still had so many questions that he wanted answered, so he decided to try to get it, if the mana disappeared from his body, would he be able to get it back later? But Iriel upset him, because if the mana disappears, it will be forever, and it will be impossible to return it. She asked Ray not to be upset, because divine power also has its advantages, he may not be able to use magic, but he will be able to cast divine spells on others. He closed his eyes, as he did not want to say goodbye to his achievements, but Iriel calmed him down, telling him that he could be very useful during the battle. But this did not help him, since all he was thinking about now was how not to lose his mana and gain divine power, so he promised himself that he would try to find a way. The knights informed the saint that they were almost there and were arriving in the Holy Kingdom. Ray smiled because they were finally arriving, as it had taken quite a long time. The priest looked out the window and Iriel asked him as soon as they crossed the border to go straight to Salonia. Ray was unhappy, because why are they going to the capital again? Does she really mean that they are going to perform the ritual without even resting beforehand? But she reassured him, because they did not plan to hold a baptism immediately upon arrival. The baptism ceremony is an event that is celebrated by absolutely everyone, however, Ray already knows nothing about the Holy Kingdom, so he will have to gain as much knowledge as possible before performing the ritual. Yes, this is important, but who will teach him then? Iriella proudly said that she would personally look into the matter. Etiquette, discipline, and everything related to baptism will be her responsibility. She smiled and said that she would tell and teach the guy everything she knew. At the entrance they were greeted by a huge and very beautiful castle, which delighted all visitors with its beauty. No matter how much Ray looked at it, he always couldn't take his eyes off it, since it was truly a magnificent mansion on a completely different level, compared even to Silo's castle. He couldn't believe his eyes, was it all his now? All the saints live in this estate, so it is a sacred place that even priests need permission to enter. Even the people working inside have been specially selected and have status, so there is nothing to worry about. Within two days, Ray will need to undergo training, which Iriella spoke about even earlier, which of course he was already tired of, although it had not even begun. Ray still couldn't understand why the head of the mansion, who was supposed to be training him, suddenly became so busy. At the same moment, someone came up to him and said hello. It was the maid who said that she was ready to show Ray to his room, because he was probably very tired after the trip. He smiled, because such a beautiful maid suited him very well, so he began to think that he could talk to her properly later. Just like Uriel said, of course she must have some kind of status, because she also does not look like an ordinary person. She led him into a room, near the entrance to which there was a vase, telling him that the guy needed to come here. The maid showed him his room and said that now he could arrange himself here the way he wanted, and the room looked simply incredible, you must admit. She lowered her head and asked him to get some rest since she would be forced to leave him right now, so Ray smiled and thanked her for her work. He was very surprised, because such wonderful communication really amazed him, he could not believe his eyes. Ray really becomes a saint, who would have even thought about it before? The next morning, a small discussion began in the castle, where the speaker asked for a moment of attention. She said that they really don't have much time, so there is a lot to do and study, so they need to focus as much as possible. Uriel waved her pointer, asking why not take a look at the materials she had prepared. But Ray could not perceive her normally, since he was very annoyed that she was so joyful. She continued the story, saying what would happen if you looked at the first page, but Ray interrupted her, saying that he had already learned everything. No one could believe it but he smiled and said that the three-day baptism ceremony is divided into three main categories, the welcoming ceremony, then declaring him a saint, and finally receiving divine power from God, so of these three steps, the last one takes place in a holy place with saints in absolute isolation. And also during baptism, the saint should not lower his head and he is allowed to greet others only with his left hand, placing it on the upper abdomen, at an angle of 70 degrees. Uriel was shocked and continued to listen, because there are three more basic rules of behavior at the table, do not make sounds while eating, never lower your head, and always keep your back straight so that your elbows do not go behind your body. She couldn't believe that the guy remembered everything so perfectly, so she began to wonder if he was even human. But he was interested in the third part of the ceremony, because he did not understand what exactly he needed to do after it, because nothing was said about it. He looked at his hand and said that the only thing he knew was that he would need to show his sincerity to God, so he asked the girl to tell her what she did before her ceremony, but she said that absolutely nothing, she just ate and slept all week, which really surprised the guy, because he thought she was joking all the time. But this was the truth, because after a week, mana vessels appeared in her body and she felt divine power begin to flow through her body. Did the vessels of divine power appear without her knowledge? 
How is this possible, maybe that's why she is called divine. In any case, Ray remembered all the information, but Iriella reported that his manners really left much to be desired. Even if his memory is beyond human understanding, he cannot in any way learn the custom, because memorizing everything and showing himself in action are two completely different things. She smiled and said it was time for a good snack. It was she who would personally test all his skills in action, to which Ray kindly agreed. Like a real aristocrat, he put a napkin on his clothes and straightened his back, preparing to eat the prepared dish with a knife and fork. The girl was shocked that he knew everything, so she decided to ask if he was doing well. The answer to this question was obvious, of course yes, but she didn't calm down, so she started waving her hand, saying that there were still a lot of things that needed to be worked on, so the guy should put him down, but what exactly? He didn't understand what she needed from him, did she really want to fight with him? Ray didn't understand why she was so strict and what she wanted from him, but now she continued to shout at him, ordering him not to talk with his mouth full, but he still couldn't understand why, what was going on. She smiled and said that the annoying nobles would find fault with everything he did, so she planned to keep an eye on him throughout his training so that no one could shame him later. Ray was surprised and said that he did not need this help, so let the girl go and rest, but she insisted that this was very important, because how could she go to rest if Ray was in such a predicament? At that moment, the dialogue was interrupted by the maid, who approached the saint and asked her permission to express her thoughts. She believes that Ray should not yet live in the mansion allocated to the newly minted saint, as this may attract too much attention and lead to rumors about them. She understands that this is rude, but still insisted on considering this point of view, since she was simply sharing her thoughts to avoid trouble. The saint thought about this and looked in her direction. She sat back in her chair and asked the maid's name. Her name is Bellacroy C. Euclawood. Did she really tell Bellacroy? This is one of the three noble families. The thing is that within the Holy Kingdom there are three families that are served by saints, in addition, there are also six families who have received the title she, which are known for their achievements. So why is such an important person like her chosen as a servant in the saint's estate? Although she tries to smooth things over, Iriella understands that the maid needs to be very careful here. Therefore, she herself understood everything and said that it was better for her to return to herself, which was really the right decision in the current situation, because Iriel was already starting to get angry. Iriella looked at her and there was a really suspicious look in her eyes, it looked like she was trying to analyze her completely. So she said that she would remember the girl and thanked her for the advice, so as not to look quite uncultured. Ray also looked at her and was surprised by the name Bellacroix. If she has a title, that means she's a noble, but do nobles even work as servants? The status of a saint was indeed much more significant than he thought, and this pleased him since he had loved power since childhood. Night fell and everyone went to their rooms to sleep. Suddenly the doors opened sharply and made a rather unpleasant creak, which was not very audible. Ray, meanwhile, was already fast asleep, as he was very tired and heard absolutely nothing near him. The same maid approached him, whose eyes glowed with a red light, it seemed she was ready to do something very bad now, but her motives were not yet entirely clear. She held her palm near the guy's head, seemingly trying to cast a spell. Then she clenched her hand into a fist and hit him on the shoulder, but not too hard, so as not to wake him up. Her look spoke for itself, it looked like she wanted to take revenge on him for something, perhaps because he took her place and became a saint. After this ritual, she turned around and left the room, also with glowing red eyes. The next morning, Ray decided to drink a cup of coffee to cheer himself up and get ready for a long day of work. He looked at the maid and praised her for being able to make a truly delicious tea, after which she thanked him and informed him that it was brewed using flower petals from salon herbs. Last night she entered the room so quietly that even the attentive Ray, who is skeptical about all this, could not notice her. However, she did nothing, and the next day was as peaceful as possible, as if she had never planned anything. Uriel looked at her and reported that she was quite suspicious. She approached the saint again and said that everything was ready for the ritual, so he needed to follow her, but he was very surprised, because the beginning should be in the afternoon. But the maid insisted on this, because the guy still had a lot to prepare for the ritual, which really surprised him. Uriel also smiled and said that Ray must impress a lot of people. The ceremonial outfit suits him very well, isn't it surprising? Now no one will be able to take their eyes off him. The maid apologized for being late, since she understood that everyone should have already gotten ready, but Ray reassured her, because weren't they still there? They were exactly where they were supposed to be, and inside the room that these doors separated, the Pope and the highest nobles were already waiting for the guy, so he himself began to worry. He had no other choice, so he opened the doors and decided that he would at least go in first. He began to walk along the red carpet and caught the gaze of all the people who came to watch the ceremony, so he was a little nervous, as he was not ready for such popularity at that moment. People looked at him and were also shocked, 
because they could not understand how this child could become a saint. One of them was very nervous, but still understood that now was his chance and he needed to act immediately. He and his companion walked closer to Ray and bowed his head as a sign of respect, after which they began the process of getting to know him. Ray was already excited, so the girl's hand separated him from the nobles. Uriel said that she was very glad that they wanted to meet the saint, but this went against the rules of etiquette of the previous ceremony, so after the ritual they would have a chance to congratulate him. One of them was very upset, but still both understood that the girl was indeed right now. The maid also asked them to be more polite to the saint before the ritual and rude behavior should also be avoided. They apologized for this and did not understand why the young lady from the Bellacroy family was wearing a maid's outfit. She walked right behind the guy and said that she would take him out somewhere, but he didn't understand why he should do this, because they were already on her. He needs to remember to say a few words about how he is preparing to officially become a saint, but this really surprised him, because why didn't the girl warn him about this earlier? Now he understood what she meant when she said that he would have to impress many people. They asked him to calm down and not worry, but just tell him how he feels right now and be polite, and people will understand it all the way they want, because they always do. Ray began to get very worried, because he didn't know what he needed to say now. Uriel decided to cheer him up, so she clenched her hand into a fist and smiled, wishing the guy good luck. He was also very happy to hear this, so he smiled back at her, even though he was panicking wildly. Meanwhile, in front of him stood a huge number of people, one might say an entire army, who were right now waiting for what the saint was going to say. He began to worry and didn't know what to say, because it was much easier to discuss this, but when there are so many people here, everything becomes completely different, did they all really come here for him? The maid invited the guy to take something in his hand. Ray panicked and didn't understand what it was, but she assured him that it was just a magical instrument, if he took it, his voice would sound much louder. But he said that he didn't need it at all, so he decided to make something like that from his hand, until the maid said that without it, people wouldn't hear him. A second later, a bright explosion occurred in the sky that illuminated the entire kingdom. The maid didn't understand what it was, because could it really be magic? Ray, meanwhile, began checking his own microphone and asking the nobles how they could hear it. They were shocked by this behavior, because they didn't understand where his respect was. To think that God would choose someone as young and inexperienced as him to grant him divine power. He really doesn't know what to say, so he says what he feels. He said that his name was Ray and he grew up as an ordinary little boy in a village near the city, but then he was chosen as a saint. And he made a promise that before coming here, this promise was important to him. He wants to make sure that the Holy Kingdom leads this continent. So he asked the nobles for permission to make this statement and make a promise to the people of this land. His name is Ray and he swears that the Holy Kingdom will be the strongest on this continent. He was sure that hearing something so bold from such a young boy might seem a little funny to some of them. However, it is true, so he spread his arms to show people his superiority, surprising the maid. All the people were also shocked, because they couldn't believe it. Ray extended his hand to his heart and said that for now they believe in him and support him. He will do his best to help all of them, after which he sent a huge magic ball into the sky to shock the audience. People could not understand what it was, was it really a meteorite and how could this be, because this is the magic of the ninth circle, which only high magicians are capable of. After this, they realized that Ray was the high magician and began to welcome the new saint. When the show ended, he commanded the meteorite to disappear with a simple snap of his finger. All the people rejoiced and continued to praise the new saint, and the guy himself was already very pleased, although he did not understand where he now needed to go. Therefore, the maid decided to help him and asked him to follow her. She also asked for the future not to make such loud speeches next time, since it was quite promising. But Ray was surprised by this, because why was she telling him about this only now? The holy arch welcomed the new saint and shone, letting in the heavenly rays. The guy asked if they had finally arrived at the new place. Yes, that's why he needs to lie down in a circle. The maid said that as soon as he felt that he was spiritually ready, he should ask God for a gift, which greatly frightened and surprised the guy, making him nervous. He lay on this stone and did not understand that he even needed to speak. So he closed his eyes and thought that maybe he should just greet him first. Therefore, with his eyes closed, he began to greet him, but there was still no answer. After a while, he opened his eyes and was very surprised, because it looked like something had just happened. He began to become hysterical, because it looked like he had simply fallen asleep without knowing it. The so-called God didn't even show up and his back was starting to hurt from lying on a hard surface after spending the last couple of days in a good bed. Ray looked around and didn't understand where Yuklawood was now and why she wasn't next to him. But she stood on the other side with her eyes closed, which really surprised the guy, 
because had she really been next to him all this time, so he thought that maybe he should get up for the sake of Euclawood and not at all because his back hurts, but she came closer to him and asked if God had answered all his questions. Ray smiled and said that it was definitely God and his voice would never leave his mind. She said that this was quite impressive, because even Iriel took the whole day, which surprised the guy. The maid said that he really was a saint, so he began to laugh, saying that there was nothing special about it, but still after that he wondered, should he tell her the truth? At night, conversations began, during which it was discussed that the appearance of the saint would greatly change all their plans. Their main enemy is the holy kingdom, so they should act more carefully and just wait for the right moment. However, when the time comes, they must ensure that the holy kingdom falls, no matter the cost. None of them understood whether Ray had already completed his ritual or not yet, but isn't that impressive? After all, the ceremony can begin right now, since Marquis Hellard himself personally insisted on this. His son came closer to him and asked if his father really wanted to see him. He was visibly upset because he needed to have a pretty serious conversation with his son, so he asked him if he had heard about the new saint who could summon meteorites. He simply has to win him over to his side. He patted him on the shoulder and said that now this is definitely their chance that cannot be missed. After that, he leaned closer to him and said that they had already lost a saint, so if they could gain the favor of a new saint, that would be just wonderful. In this way they will be able to strengthen the influence of their family on the Holy Kingdom, which could not but please the eldest son of the Marquis Hellard, whose name is Barrett. Therefore, his father ordered him to make sure that they could get along well during the banquet, and he should also remember to treat him with the utmost respect, regardless of his true age. He once again emphasized this, ordering that special attention be paid to these factors so as not to become his personal enemy. After they parted, the guy smiled and told his father that there was no need to worry so much, he had already heard that he was a simple guy from the village who was nothing of himself. It was night outside, so he sat and began to think about how he needed to beat everything. Everyone in the castle was already walking around and discussing the new saint, many people conveyed information about his strength and majesty to the masses, but is he really a simple person and not a saint at all? He's really lucky to have been chosen and to climb this high, it's an amazing life-changing opportunity. The nobles kept laughing at this and asked if they should teach him some basic manners. Count Train seemed to have seen something and closed his eyes to take a better look and analyze the situation. He saw that same man and was very scared, besides, his partner was no longer laughing at all. Barrett really began to worry, because he had never appeared at banquets before, why did he decide to do it now? It was the Duke of Train named Zeke, who came here with a not very happy look. He looked quite pumped up and seemed to be looking for something as he looked around vigilantly while the rest of the people in the room greeted him. Barrett smiled, although he was very worried, but still began a dialogue, saying that he could not even imagine that people from Treya would be here. But he looked at him with the coldest possible gaze, making it clear that he had absolutely no time for this, because he did not come here to admire Barrett. Hearing this phrase, the girl began to laugh and asked who he was considering then. Her name is Marquise Krellin. He came to see Ray, so he asked if he had already come here or if he was not there yet. The Marquise understood that most likely he had not yet met the saint. Barrett laughed and said that he would arrive soon, so it would be nice to wait for him together. Zeke began to suspect that he might have something urgent to do, because he left them in a great hurry, and Barrett simply continued to try to extract as much information as possible from the lips of his interlocutor. And Zeke continued to scream and scold the guy, because he was completely shameless, even though he wasn't here. Flowers still continued to stand near his room and Ray wondered if all this was really made especially for him. This is very convenient, because it seems that everything was sewn based on his tastes and preferences, but how did they guess about it? The new uniform suits him very well. Ray didn't understand how she was able to determine his measurements so accurately and the maid said that she took measurements on the day of his arrival and sent them to the tailor, so she should have fit him perfectly. He smiled, because with enough practice, absolutely anyone can accurately determine the size, so when they first met, he realized that she was amazing, but she turned out to be even much cooler than he expected. She showed absolutely no emotion and just stood there without much interest or desire. But still, after that, out of politeness, she thanked the guy and said that she would take him to the banquet hall. Ray laughed and said that he would not refuse such a thing, but he still could not believe that the girl had absolutely no reaction to his statements and jokes. A lot of people had already gathered in the living room and everyone was waiting for the start of the event, or rather, for its most important guest. The nobles saw Ray and began to discuss that he came much later than he promised, so the girl began to calm him down, because perhaps he needed time to get ready. Therefore, she decided to defuse the situation a little and asked if they had heard what happened during the ritual. Yes, but not in detail, so Barrett told him that Ray inspired everyone with his speech, but still he laughed, because he is nothing more than a simple person. After this phrase, he was a little scared, because the butler asked everyone present for a moment of attention, since a new saint had just arrived here. Ray looked like a real emperor and fully corresponded to his image of a saint, 
a smile reigned on his face, and he was accompanied by an equally beautiful girl, who seemed to be plotting something further. All the people began to be surprised, because many of those present had not yet seen him, so they began to discuss among themselves that they had imagined him completely differently, but such a small boy emanated great confidence and calm. Barrett immediately ran up to him and said that he was the eldest son of Marquis Hellard, so Ray smiled and said that he was very pleased to meet the members of the Hellard family and it was also a great honor for him. The son was starting to get nervous, because he didn't see Ray make even one mistake. At that moment, Ray continued to stand confidently and introduce himself to all the guests present, continuing to say that he was honored by all of this. He began to panic, because at this rate all his plans could collapse greatly and he would have to suffer punishment from his father. So he began to try to take control of the situation, because he had heard before that Ray was a common man, so he needed to strike back to prove himself. Ray replied that he was from a small village, which is located near the kingdom of Cilia, so Barrett straightened his arms and assumed that in this case, Ray was attending such a banquet for the first time, but still he thought to himself that it was unacceptable for a simple person to start come to such events. He couldn't come to terms with this, but Ray smiled and seemed to read his thoughts, because he immediately replied that it was really his first time at such a celebration, as Barrett said, truly ordinary people are not allowed to such banquets. Saints are not commoners, so this does not apply to you, at such banquets there is nothing for any mediocrity to do. Yes, there are people like him everywhere, they cannot come to terms with the fact that others have something that they do not have, so they cannot just quietly and calmly watch from the sidelines and behave tactlessly, trying to interfere in the affairs of others. Indeed, some people are simply worse than trash. Ray smiled again and said that Barrett seemed to really believe that status determined a person's worth, but that was just common sense. What these people have in common is that they end up digging their own graves. Ray looked at him and said that he was not at all used to such a life, so it was difficult for him to understand them, but Barrett understood that it was better not to be rude and also said that he had already forgotten what they were talking about. Suddenly, unexpectedly, the guy began to continue to be bombarded with questions that he was not quite ready to listen to, let alone answer. But Barrett continued to stand his ground and said that Ray was a commoner in the past. Therefore, he took a sword from his holster and decided to swing it sharply, it seems he decided to attack the guy. Ray was shocked, because this was his first banquet and he was already receiving similar behavior in his direction. The ground near the arches began to shake and an unpleasant sound of a sword whistling was heard throughout the area. Behind Barrett stood Zeke, who came to this event for a reason, holding his sword to the guy. Seeing this situation, Barrett was very frightened and started screaming, he really started to have a strong panic. Ray wasn't ready to see it either, so he started yelling and reprimanding Zeke, asking him why he was doing this, isn't it dangerous? It's good that he stopped the sword with his mana, so Zeke decided to apologize for such an act. He apologizes for making such a bad first impression on him, so he immediately fell to his knees and bowed his head, causing the guy to feel misunderstood. But Zeke just wanted to let him know that he couldn't let that idiot humiliate the guy, even though he knew it was rude, he couldn't hold back any longer. He looked at Ray and simply continued to ask for forgiveness, but he was shocked, because he did not understand what he was doing. His servant also asked Ray for the opportunity to compliment, since everything that Barrett from the family of Marquis Hellard said was blasphemy, so she also did not understand how he could allow himself to make Ray look like a fool. Zeke jumped at the opportunity, saying that they must destroy him and ensure that the family was punished accordingly. Hearing this, he was very scared, but they continued to discuss it, saying that this would serve as an excellent example for others. Ray agreed and asked Yuklawu to call Marquis Hellard, so she ran quickly to carry out this instruction. But Iriella interrupted her, saying that there was no need to run anywhere, since he was here and saw everything himself from the second floor. The father began to insult his son, and he was shocked and did not know how to properly apologize. Therefore, he himself could not stand it and was the first to hit his son with his hand, calling him a complete idiot. He continued to beat him for several minutes, and also did not stop his insults at all, because he seemed to have forgotten what order his father had given him. What right does he have to treat a saint like that? Everyone was shocked when they saw this picture, where a father beat his son for several minutes for such behavior, so no one even intervened, but simply watched, thinking about whether it was worth stopping him or not. The father began to ostentatiously fall to his knees, offering his deepest apologies, ordering his son to do the same, because all this happened because he raised him poorly. He looked at Berries and continued to shout at him, ordering him to immediately apologize for his behavior, so he even began to stutter a little from fear. The maid and Zeke in the background were discussing this whole situation and sincerely did not understand how he dared to say such a thing in the presence of a saint, so Zeke also offered his help, saying that he could punish him properly. Ray was already annoyed by this so he asked everyone to stop swearing and calm down and began to think about how he could stop it. He looked at his father, who was no less frightened, 
and then asked what he thought would be the best punishment for his son. The Marquis clenched his teeth and became noticeably nervous, and cold sweat began to pour down his body. He said that Beres lost his mother at a fairly early age, and he should have raised him as a good father. He was upset because he didn't want him to have the same life as him, so he had to give him a good life without flaws, making it his personal promise. Therefore, he looked at the guy and said that if there was such an opportunity for him to forgive him the first time for such unreasonable actions, in exchange for this, as expected, he would renounce his title and donate his fortune to the temple. But shouldn't the punishment only affect his son? How can a parent not correct his child's mistake? Ray was very surprised, because the father is really going to give up his title right now because of his son. He quietly called Beres, who stood up in panic and waited for what Ray would tell him. He continued to kneel in front of all the guests of this palace, so Ray asked if he realized his mistake. Therefore, Beres agreed that he really spoke blasphemous words to him, but Ray was very kind today, because if the father was the same as his son, he would also punish Marquis Hallard for such behavior, but apparently he is a completely different person. S not all, Beres's biggest mistake is that because of him, his father has to kneel in the presence of all the guests. Ray smiled and said that he was thinking about his punishment, but because of the sincerity of his father, who seems to really love him very much, he will turn a blind eye to it for the first time and have mercy on him. Therefore, he made it clear that he no longer held a grudge against them and forgave them both, which greatly surprised the maid and Zeke, who seemed clearly shocked by this behavior. The Marquis began to have tears in his eyes, so he began to ask if he was really ready to forgive them, would he really just not take any action? Ray began to laugh, saying that this is all on the condition that they actually donate money, as they themselves mentioned earlier. The Marquis began to apologize and say that he would donate any necessary amount, and Iriel watched the situation and laughed, because this is really a very light punishment for such sins. But still she hoped that he had thought it over and realized his mistakes. At night they approached Ray and asked if he really thought it was worth forgiving him. Zeke said that if the saint gave an order, he would immediately take care of them, but he was already tired of these questions, because why did this blue-haired guy pick on him? Ray stopped and really became a little aggressive, because he realized that the guy was following him practically all the way, it's even strange that he himself didn't pay attention to it. He looked at Zeke and said that even in all this time he had not asked his name. Without hesitation, he also fell to his knees and said that he had committed a really terrible sin and began to apologize, but Ray just wanted to know his name, so he introduced himself again, saying that his name was Trey C. Zeke and he was from the Trey family. Ray looked at him and said that the maid also had C after her last name, but what does that mean? C is a title, people who have C in their name serve the saints and this shows their devotion to them. But why is this so important to so many people? The guy smiled, because he does not at all think that all three families should serve him, and in general it sounds quite funny. She was serious and reprimanded him, since this is a tradition that they have followed since ancient times. Please don't feel burdened by this, it is just the will of God, so Zeke said that if Ray thinks three families is too many, then let him just choose him alone and he will do everything in his power. The maid was surprised and noticeably angry with him, so Ray calmed her down, saying that he would not force anyone to leave and there was no need to fight about this. He looked at them and asked what about the third family, because there are only two of them now, but the third ensures the safety of the saint from the shadows. Their real identity is not even known to the holy kingdom. Therefore, they themselves don't even know who they are, which really surprised the guy, besides, they know anyway that they are always there to protect him. Ray was very surprised at one moment, as something very strange flashed before his eyes. He looked at the tree and didn't understand how this was possible. She was right, they were indeed there, so now that he knew of their existence, he could sense their mana and use it for his own purposes. He began to count them all in order, as an X-ray was formed in his eyes, which captured these ultraviolet indicators. Ray began to scream, because he counted seven at once, but the maid simply continued to stand with a stone face, absolutely not surprised by anything. She asked Zeke if he felt anything, but he also didn't feel anything. At that moment, strange voices began to be heard from the tree, which were barely audible. A girl was sitting on him, who, despite his young age, realized that Ray was really a magician, which was very impressive. The next morning the saint had a lot of tasks, especially after such a difficult night, where he learned so many discoveries for himself. At the castle, the first work processes began with Miss Yuklawood, who greeted the staff, after which she came closer to the picture with swords and thought about her past. She remembered how they shouted at her and ordered her to get up immediately, because she is from the Bellacroix family, so if she can't even do this, then she definitely doesn't deserve to bear the name Bellacroix. The girl was still very young, so she asked her father for forgiveness for this, but he said that the one who would serve the saint could not be weak in any way. So he ordered her to take the sword, because there had never been such a case that two saints existed at the same time, given that they already have a saint, then there definitely should not have been saints in this generation. However, in order to serve a saint who does not even exist, does she have to suffer like this now? But years later, 
God answered her question by choosing another saint, but this process was interrupted by Ray, who forced the girl to open her eyes and come out of this state, calling her name. He asked if Uriel would actually lead the next ritual, but what does that mean? She was pleased because she had said more than once that the ceremony would be performed by a divinely beautiful woman. Yuklawood was serious, so she said that if Ray allowed, she would explain everything to him, because except for special cases, only saints can enter the ceremony hall, so it has nothing to do with appearance. He was surprised, so he asked Iriel if this was really so and did she really think it was funny. They went out to walk through the forest and he felt very pleased to be outside for such a long period of time, because he didn't even know that there was a forest here, it reminded him of the time when he sat and studied magic as a child. But the memories did not last long, as Iriel reported that they had already arrived at the right place. Wait, there are knights here but is there a need for such protection? So this really is the place. Ray was really excited because he didn't understand where they had come from and why there were so many guards. Uriel showed him the steps that rose very high into the sky, saying that this is where the entrance is. She looked at the guy and said that they just need to go up all the way. Uriel smiled because this part of the ceremony is meant to show his respect for God, so he won't be allowed to use magic. What? This is really too cruel. It really started to get dark outside very quickly. Ray was beginning to suspect something, so he asked Iriel to stop and wait, especially since he wanted to rest a little, what would he do without it? She smiled, because they had just begun their journey, was he really tired so quickly? Looks like someone here is having trouble with stamina, but he denied it, because all this was due to the fact that all yesterday evening the guy walked around the kingdom, talking with people, which the girl herself knows. Therefore, it is logical to guess that he no longer has the strength to continue to walk so much, especially since he is not allowed to use magic, thanks to which there would be no problems at all to get to the highest point of these steps. But she raised her hand and reminded him once again that she had already informed him that from now on they should not use magic, and at the ceremony site it would also be unacceptable. She showed him the road and told him that he had to go all this way on his own, so let him follow the stars and thus get to the desired point, but she once again emphasized that magic should not be used under any circumstances. Ray looked at these steps and wanted to turn back, but the girl encouraged him and believed that he could handle it, and he also understood that he had already gone far enough and could not give up so easily. After some time, he stopped and looked at the sky, and his whole face was sweating, since the guy was able to overcome all this path. He was exhausted, so he fell to the ground to at least somehow rest, and also did not understand what he was thinking about, agreeing to this. After all, it took much longer than he expected. But his melancholy did not last long, because in front of him he saw a beautiful house, because initially he assumed that there would be a completely empty area. Without further hesitation, he went into it and opened the entrance doors, asking if anyone was here and saying that it looked like he would need to spend seven days in this place. Iriel also said that he will need to show respect for God, but he doesn't even know what he needs to do, because the girl told him that she hasn't done anything all week. Ray smiled, because he began to perceive this mission as a kind of vacation. Therefore, he went outside to take a closer look at the house and realized that he would have a good rest there, especially since the week would pass very quickly indeed. Only then did he not know about all the trials that were prepared for him and the harsh reality that he would have to face during his stay in this place. He took the apple out of the tree, glad that they were fresh enough. Immediately after this, he decided to eat them, since for such a long period of stress on the body, Ray became quite hungry. He was very happy, because thanks to these apples he was able to eat, but after a second his mood changed greatly. He began to throw them on the ground, because because of them he was poisoned, and this is very cruel. Ray began to panic and get angry, because even in order to make fire he had to take a stick, because he promised that he would not use mana, so he had to do everything with his own hands. But how can he survive here? Why didn't anyone tell him anything about this, since even cooking fish is already very difficult, isn't his suffering enough for them? In the evening he still managed to light a fire, but he still continued to analyze their words, where they promised only one week and that it would all last no more than seven days. But why has he been here for more than a month? Ray was simply furious, it became very unpleasant for him to realize this, all he wanted was to at least find out what was happening here. He started waving his fish and asking if they really decided to make a savage out of him. So he started waving his arms and realized that he no longer had the desire to be a saint. But something stopped him, he was shocked because he did not understand what kind of feeling it was. All this magic happening because he just got angry. Ray waved his hands and was furious, magical mana, which is given to all saints, began to run through his body thanks to which it lifted him several meters above the ground. Finally, the process of his transformation began and divine power came to him. He began to fly like a real superhero, but such happiness did not last long. Ray stopped and began to panic, because where did his power go? She simply disappeared, but what should he do then? Luckily she appeared a few seconds later, making a little joke with the guy, 
from now on everything will be for real. His mana disappeared again and his strength disappeared, so he began to get angry, not understanding what was happening right now. A second later, a huge flurry of mana fell on him, which completely pierced his body, and he finally began to feel it. But then he was lowered to the ground again and all the power disappeared, forcing the guy to stand in bewilderment. He did not understand what was happening, so he wanted to know the answer to this question, because his god himself now playing with him. A very bright glare of the sun appeared in the sky, which seemed to be the answer to his question. A moment later, a huge charge of magic formed from it again, which again flew towards the guy. He was already very angry, because he did not understand what these senseless actions were, since he had been here for a whole month, and the power had not come to him. Therefore, he began to run away, asking God to leave all this, since he no longer had the strength and there was no point in this, because mana appears and disappears. He was already panicking, because this is even more annoying, because he feels how the air around is filled with divine power, and it immediately disappears. He has never been so upset, what kind of mockery is this? As soon as he thought about someone comforting him, Iriel appeared next to him, who seemed to have appeared here for a reason. Ray was happy, because even though the first person he met a month later was Uriel, he was still very happy, because perhaps this only meant that he could leave here today. But that's what Iriel saw, she didn't understand what was happening with the guy and how she could help him. After all this, they had a dialogue where the girl asked whether Ray really claims that he can use both magic and holy power. But he replied that he had not tried magic yet. He was also very surprised, because what happened to her clothes? She replied that she felt a strong divine power and ran to him in a hurry, and also said that the ritual was now over. Ray looked at the girl and said that he needed to cleanse her, which he actually did by using magic. He smiled, because it seemed he could still use it, which made both him and the girl very happy. He can use mana that floats in the air, so why can't he use divine power? Uriel said that it was really a shame, but he remains the one whom God chose, and also an incredible magician, so if someone dares to say something to him, he can simply use magical power against him. Iriela seemed to have fallen in love, because she continued to follow him and maybe it was because of the divine power, but the air around became very pleasant and even Ray began to smell delicious. This surprised him very much, because he did not understand what she was talking about now. It's a warm scent that makes you want to be close to him, so Ray rolled his eyes and realized that he needed to stay away from her for now until he learned to control his power. The servants also came to him in the forest to inform him that they wanted to congratulate him on acquiring strength. The guy was happy, because he was pleased to see Yuklawood and Zeke together, so he also thanked them for the visit. They said it was a great job and as soon as they heard about the news, they came right away. Zeke insisted that Ray give him his backpack to carry, and Yuklawood insisted that she wanted to carry it and would not mind if Ray gave her more tasks, so he was shocked, because he did not understand what was wrong they are not like that. He looked at the sky and ordered them to stop as soon as possible, because he wanted to return to his mansion and not waste time on these meaningless things. He looked at Zeke and asked why he was constantly following him. But he said that as a member of three families, it was his duty to serve the guy anywhere and anytime, so he would never change his principles, and he would never have bad intentions. All this was really suspicious, so in the mansion, Ray continued to sit in his room at night and wondered when it would end. He looked at the stack of books and wanted to look at them all, because when he became a saint, he promised himself to make the great kingdom the greatest. So he began to read and since he was now officially a saint, he needed to fulfill his promise. And first of all, he needs to learn more about the kingdom and its history, so in order to understand all these nuances, he had to turn to books for help. He was very happy because he figured out what could be done, because in order to lead the holy kingdom, he would create a completely new system. As soon as the sun rose, Ray called all the nobles of the holy kingdom to the mansion, to criticize them for not working efficiently enough. Therefore, due to this, he proposed adjustments for agriculture, commerce and trade. Among them was Mill's solar system, which was intended for the agricultural industry. Ray spoke so confidently that he received enormous support from the nobles, so the first technology was approved very quickly. But Count Train was a little worried, so he turned to Ray, informing him that among the things that are written here there are still incomprehensible points, because what does it mean to use priests as mercenaries? But he smiled and said that this is indeed true, the whole point is to send priests as mercenaries. Was Ray really suggesting that he send his priests into battle? Yes, everything is absolutely true. At this moment, the others also began to realize the whole situation, because the fall of the priests will lead to the fall of the nation. In addition, the number of people striving to become priests will decrease. Ray reassured them, because of course the priests would not stand on the front line, they would all be in the rear of the battle. While the wounded at the fronts are brought to the priests, in this way they have the opportunity to avoid casualties among them. But the nobles did not fully understand this, because in any case it is always very dangerous on the battlefield, 
especially if enemies attack from all flanks. Ray understood this and completely agreed with them, because the battlefield is indeed not a safe place, but with a good strategy, all the priests will return to their families alive. Naturally, he will not send them into battle without a plan, so there will always be paladins near them. With this alignment, their priests will be completely safe, but there is one caveat. Using them as mercenaries is a completely different strategy, if they win without their intervention, that's good, but if they lose, then you'll have to use them as backup. Seeing those who were wounded on the battlefield, as well as witnessing the action up close, must be a truly good experience for the priests. However, the nobleman was not entirely sure of this. Of course, they are indeed a necessary force in battle, but are there really no other options? All for the sake of victory and getting money and glory, but Ray interrupted him and said that using priests as mercenaries is not just money in their honor, but just a nice bonus. He smiled and said that they would send priests to the battlefield, and in return they would receive power, although the interlocutors did not understand what exactly he meant when he said the word power. From the point of view of the peoples who need the help of the Holy Empire, they cannot do anything that could endanger them and as long as they occupy their troops, they will be able to ask for compensation for the sacrifices made on our part. The interlocutor also thought about this, because it is indeed true, they will have more opportunities to gain control as soon as they begin to allocate their forces, but still, isn't it too dangerous? Yuriel also chimed in, saying that despite the risk, she also thought it was a good idea. So she raised her hand and said that she agreed with the saints' ideas, because they are always great. However, she is also sure that the idea of hired priests will cause some backlash. Ray was a little worried, so he asked if this was true, then could they somehow win the favor of the nobility? But Iriel calmed him down, telling him that there was no need to worry, since she would be happy to help him with this. She put her hand on the table and said that there was no point in winning favor. And all they need is the words, Oh, the most beautiful girl in the Holy Empire. Please help me, Lady Uriel. Ray smiled and had a good laugh, and also noted that the influence that Uriel has is very unusual, so it would not be an exaggeration to say that all the high-ranking nobles are supporters of Uriel. He looked at her again and thought that if she really helped him in this situation, then it would be difficult for everyone to object. This was the best way out, so he had no other ideas at all. In the meeting room, Ray said that they were done for today, so if anyone has other ideas regarding the promotion of the Holy Kingdom, then feel free to tell them. Most agreed with him because they thought his ideas were very good. The Holy Empire slowly improved all of its activities, but it was difficult to completely change the farming method, so they started with a small plot of land for the sake of experimentation. And the public turned out to be not at all against the use of priests as mercenaries, after they received consent from the priests themselves. A lot of letters of help appeared, where people asked them for help from hired priests, so thanks to this function, the Holy Kingdom was able to collect a lot of funds. Ray was happy because his ideas really helped the Holy Kingdom improve their quality of life, but even though everything was more or less in order now, they would still need specialists in various fields, and this would be a very difficult task to think about. Ray spent all his free time in the library, looking for answers to his questions. The librarian also seemed very tired, so the new visitor decided to cheer her up a little. She immediately rose from her chair and was delighted, because Lady Eclid had really returned so quickly. Yes, she said that she was gone for a while. Three whole months have already passed since their last meeting, how quickly time flies. It was very strange for her to see so many people in the library, since it was usually empty, so she asked why there were so many of them here. The librarian smiled and said that the saint had been visiting her for several days. Yes, it was he. Even at that moment Ray continued to sit and read the book, it seems that everyone fell in love with him, doesn't it? Therefore, the girl came closer to him and moved a chair near his desk, which surprised him quite a lot, because Ray did not plan to see anyone now. She smiled and greeted him, asking if he was really the new saint. He agreed and asked what she wanted, and he was also haunted by questions, who is she and why does she communicate with him as with a friend? She took one of these books and asked if they were all devoted to medicine now and had he really read all of them. She began to openly laugh at him, asking if he really managed to remember anything from this. He agreed, of course it was successful, to some extent. Eklat continued to laugh, so she asked the guy how to treat a cut from a rusty knife. Ray thought about it and said that she could prevent the symptoms of poisoning if she used holy medicine, after which the wound would heal. She said it was right, but does he himself agree with it? Ray replied no, so she looked at him and asked what he was going to do then to cure the patient. Ray said he would make an incision around the infected flesh, but why? The answer is simple, because everyone thinks that getting cut by a rusty knife is tantamount to poisoning, but this cannot be said. No one will be poisoned by a rusty sword, but around the cut site, an infection can enter the cells. So, it is impossible to cure this perfectly using holy healing, so it would be much better to remove the infected area around the cut, and heal the area itself. Eklat looked at him and asked what kind of cells he mentioned earlier. 
but Ray forgot that in this world people don't yet know about the cells in the body. So the girl looked at him and said that maybe these cells he was talking about could not be healed with holy medicine, but wouldn't it be too barbaric to cut out the affected area? Ray agreed with her, but said that this was the only correct way out of such a situation. Eklat leaned back in her chair, because she realized that as long as they could cure the patient, the method itself would not be so important, but Ray did not quite mean that. She put another hand on the table and stood up, saying that she liked the guy, which shocked him very much, because no one had ever allowed him to behave like that in the presence of Ray. After which she smiled and invited the guy to go to her laboratory, where they could discuss even more interesting points together. She also looked at the fallen book and apologized for not introducing herself. Her name is Ikla and she had already begun to announce her position, but Ray interrupted her. He couldn't believe his eyes, could this really be Ikla? She's the manager of the priests, so is she really the high priest? And despite the fact that they met for the first time, the girl heard about the guy even before she got to this castle. So if he needed any medical help, he could call at any time, though to be honest, she didn't really understand why a saint was studying useless medicine. Before him stood a huge number of different books and all this was in the girl's laboratory. Apparently she is also studying medicine, although she says it is useless. Eklat still hoped that this would help her cure one long-standing illness. Ray looked at her and said that this is something innate, is ain't it? She felt very funny, it was a defensive reaction, because how was he not surprised after seeing this? That's why he said that she had this sore since birth. Ray asked if she was blind in one eye and could she feel pain. Eklat replied that she was not in pain, but she still could not see. Ray noticed a huge number of books on medicine, which were even more numerous than in the library. If she would mind if he looked at all this more closely, after which she gave him a look. These were symptoms noticeably similar to cataracts. He said that it was she, but in this world people did not know what it was, so Eklat was very scared and began to ask Ray what it was. But he was not yet completely sure, so he began to ask whether the girl could see in the dark. She replied that she really could see a little better at night, so Ray was convinced that it was a cataract and was ready to explain everything to her, so he asked her to look at what he was now drawing, this is the pupil, and next to it the lens. When she looks somewhere, the lens focuses on the light, thereby allowing us to see better, but in her case, the lens is very clouded and this disease is called cataract. She looked at him and asked that if he was telling the truth, then what should she do? If it's a disease, can't it be cured by healing? Maybe it's because the girl was originally born with cataracts, but what if the healing doesn't work? Ray looked at her and said that divine power eliminates disorders in the body and heals them. But what if the divine power does not accept this as a violation? Perhaps for this reason she is unable to heal. But this is a violation, because Eklat has only one sighted eye, this is from the point of view of other people. Maybe from the moment of her birth, the body does not understand that something is wrong. In any case, the girl should clean her lens to cure the cataract, but she did not understand how this could be done. Ray looked at her and said that she needed to cut out the problem area, but still panicked a little, because she did not understand how in this world this could be done without precision tools. Ikla started screaming at him, because does he really want to say that she needs to cut out her eye? But Ray said that, s just part of the operating process. First of all, you need to get rid of the clouded lens and replace it with something else. Although he thought about it and decided that it could be simply removed, because there is no artificial lens in this world. He continued to say, because even if they get rid of the cataract, there is no point in this, since she will not be able to restore her vision. Eklat smiled and bowed her head, saying that there was no need to worry about her incurable illness, she was sure that in a couple of years he would be able to find a way. These words hurt her very much, because did she really say right now that Ray would not be able to cope with this task? Even if this is another world, won't it really be able to cure cataracts? He looked at Eklat and ordered her not to worry, as he would definitely help her. She liked this approach much better, so she smiled and looked at the new saint with pride. A second later she burst out laughing very hard, because she couldn't believe it, so she started laughing at the guy and saying that he was really very funny. But still, she told him that she agreed to treatment and invited him to follow her to show him something. This was her laboratory where she spent most of her time. She was founded by the Holy Kingdom so that she could study medicine, so she told Ray to feel at home and take whatever he wanted. His happiness knew no bounds, he could not believe it, but the girl said that she was lonely here anyway, so this is the least she can do for someone who is really interested in medicine. Ray thanked her and every day began to study the girl's illness, almost without getting out of the laboratory. A month later, he already had several prepared test tubes on his shelves, which he tested. He took one of them and began to examine the troll's blood. After contact with air after a short period of time, the blood changes its consistency. And while he was saying all this, she had already become hard, like a piece of jelly. But the blood of different monsters has its own characteristics, does he really think that from a medical point of view it will be useful to them? 
Ray thought about it, because it looks like she will most likely really suit them. He was a little scared, so he wanted to ask the girl if it was really impossible to mix the blood of different monsters with each other. She said that this is true, because each monster has its own different blood composition. But there is one exception, unlike other species, in the case of orcs, due to their great adaptability, they can be mixed with other blood. These words made the guy think, so he began to think what good adaptability means and is it possible to somehow test it. It was already getting dark outside and the whole kingdom was getting ready for bed. But the guy still continued to walk through the forest in search of medicine. He was really very tired, so he began to wipe his forehead, deciding that that was enough for today and that he should also go to bed. Something unique near him, but what was it? Was there really an orc and a troll next to him now and both of them were dead and what if they had just fought? It's like a gift from fate, he glanced at the troll, who was still alive. He noticed a large wound on his body and realized that he was now in a state of shock because he was bleeding. However, it was surprising that he survived after fighting an orc that was twice his size. Now it was the turn to look at the orc, who was lying exhausted. Ray immediately remembered the girl's words, Unlike other species, in the case of orcs, due to their high adaptability, they can be mixed with other blood. He immediately stuck out his tongue and smiled, because this is really a great chance to test all these hypotheses, so if he seizes the moment, he can save him. The troll continued to lie and moan from impotence, but he was a little surprised when Ray connected a blood transfusion machine to his veins. All this time the guy was near him and noticed how the troll woke up and was very scared, so Ray tried to calm him down, but he immediately rushed to the attack, frightening the guy, who asked him only to stay in place and not move at all. Therefore, in order to protect himself and save the blood transfusion machine, Ray used a numb spell and stopped the monster in place. He waved his hands and asked him to calm down, because he did not want to harm him, but on the contrary, he was trying to help him, since he had lost too much blood, so he transfused him with some of it from the orc. He woke up too quickly, so he never had time to finish, but Ray was even more surprised by the fact that the wound on his body began to shrink very quickly. He looked at the blood and didn't understand why it was like that, had it really just cleared up. Ray waved his hands and was very happy, because it was just perfect, if it worked here, then now he will definitely succeed in public. Ray looked at this place and understood that it was exactly this place that Eklid had told him about. When he transferred the blood of an orc into a troll, it became very pure and pliable for use, so he was very surprised, because he could not even imagine that such a wonderful result could be achieved. It dawned on him that thanks to this method he would finally be able to create his own artificial lens and cure Eklat. He was serious, so he understood that now he first of all needed to get as much blood as possible from trolls and orcs. He wondered where he could find so much blood for his research. Eklat decided that she could solve this issue, so she said that not far from the laboratory there was an abandoned village and next to it in the surrounding forests there was a place where orcs and trolls were quite common. She looked quite scary, like in horror films. Therefore, Ray immediately went there in search and was worried, because this village used to belong to the village of Hegel, but the girl definitely did not lie when she said that the village was really abandoned. Suddenly something fell very hard, making a rather unpleasant sound, which really scared the guy. He turned his head and saw children there, but what were they doing in this abandoned city? Were they also abandoned and left here to die? Ray came closer to them and said hello, but the guy put his hand on the girl, making it clear that he would be ready to fight if he dared to attack. But Ray just offered them something to eat, giving them some meat. The guy was scared and worried, so Ray calmed him down, saying that the food is quite normal and not poisoned, so it can be safely consumed. He smiled because he was pleased that at least they trusted him. That's why he reached into his bag, because he understood that the only thing he could do now was to help them at least giving them a little more food. He looked at the children and offered them something else. After they opened the bag, they were very shocked when they saw a huge amount of gold coins. Ray smiled and ordered them to spend this money on the road to Salonia, because there they would already be able to provide for themselves and find food. But the children did not understand why he was so kind to them. He laughed and said that no reason was needed for this, even if he was seeing them for the first time. The children didn't believe him at all, so he continued to reassure them, saying that he really didn't need any reasons. Just to think, this happened as soon as he left the capital. He understood that the current laws did not provide for this at all, so he would need to deal with this issue as soon as he came to the Holy Kingdom. He looked at these ruins, saying that one day he would restore the glory of this place in order to make the Holy Kingdom a much better place. The next morning we had to continue our journey. Therefore, Ray was already on his feet in the morning and went to a large cave. He was a little scared, because he understood that it was quite huge, so perhaps the orcs lived in it. Therefore, 
you need to be as careful as possible and try not to wake them up. Ray got as close to him as possible from behind, but was still a little nervous. He took out a syringe and apologized to the troll in advance, because he would need to steal something from him. He laughed and said that he would just take some blood from him. After which he came to a village where there seemed to be a huge number of trolls and tents. They were very surprised by his appearance, so they began to grunt, not understanding what was happening. Ray came closer to them and asked them to do a small favor. This made them very angry and surprised, since they were not used to seeing strangers on their land. Therefore, the strongest of them immediately rushed into battle, which made Ray laugh very much, since they did not want to listen to him at all. When he received no response, he waved his hand and immediately used a grappling technique to stop them. He pointed his finger at his opponent and said that it was definitely him, didn't he really remember how Ray saved his life in the forest? So he stopped and waved his hand, telling him to just stop and listen to him. All Ray needs is to do a favor for him, for which he will repay him well. After meeting them, it was time to go back. Ray walked and was happy holding the test tube in his hands, because thanks to the orcs he was able to test some things today, but first, when he returns, he will need to use everything that he collected. Suddenly, someone in front of him took a step towards him with his boot. This surprised Ray very much, so he also stopped and asked, is it really you again? The girl ran up to him and was in tears, so she grabbed the guy by the clothes and pointed in that direction. At that moment, her brother began to be beaten and thrown against the wall. It was the villain with the bat who took all the money from him and laughed and asked if he now understood why he had to politely give it back when he asked. But the guy didn't give up and started shouting back at him, ordering him to return the money back. Another villain's partner approached him and asked what this boy allows himself, is it really not enough for him? Therefore, he swung his bat and decided to hit him several more times for daring to object to him. Luckily, Ray arrived in time to help, so he grabbed the bat and ordered an immediate stop, which surprised the robber. Therefore, the robber jumped away from him and turned his head towards him, after which he decided to ask who he was. They began to analyze the guy and what he looked like. Ray noticed his wallet with the money that they stole from the guy, but he couldn't believe it a little. But everything fell into place when the robbers pulled out weapons and surrounded Ray, because he had a large bag that they wanted to take for themselves, but they also asked if he didn't think that walking here alone was not a good decision at all. The main one began to laugh, saying that now he would teach him a lesson. At this moment they also began to attack him from behind. Ray was absolutely calm, so he didn't even look in his direction and put out his hand, hitting the enemy with it and inviting the main one to attack. He was shocked by the guy's skill, because he didn't even understand how this was possible. But what exactly? Ray asked if he was really interested in how he knocked him out with one blow. Therefore, he smiled and said that he would not mind continuing. The robbers took out weapons and rushed into battle, asking if he really thinks that everything in life is so simple. A few seconds later, all the attackers were disposed of and lay unconscious on the ground. The children united at this moment and hugged each other tightly. Ray smiled and looked at them, asking if everything was okay with them. He also apologized to them for what happened. Ray took the children with him and invited them to the Holy Kingdom. But the maid was clearly against this, as she said that the mansion is a holy place in which only saints, as well as their servants, can live, since they don't know who these children are, so they cannot let them in. Is it really impossible to do this, even if the saint living here allows them? Can't only two children fit in such a big place? But Yuklawood said those are the rules. Ray was shocked, because he couldn't even think that there were such strict rules here, he didn't even know. But he looked at the guys and smiled, asking them not to worry, because if they couldn't live here, he could find them another place to live. The children were shocked by such an act. Ray just came and bought them a house, but he was very surprised, because he didn't even ask them what their names were. So he looked at them and decided to ask, but the children shocked him, because they still didn't have names. This shocked him, so he looked at the guy first and began to come up with some interesting name for him. Ray remembered Christmas and laughed because he had just made a decision, so he said that the girl would be called Mary and the guy would be called Chris, since they had a very good meaning from the place he came from. The children stood in bewilderment and did not say anything, so Ray smiled and asked if they didn't like the names. No problem, he can come up with something else. But the guy put his hands on his sister's shoulders and said that this was not at all true. He just didn't know what to say, because he was very grateful to him. Ray was very pleased to realize that he was also able to help children. They ran up to him and wanted to hug him tightly for what he did for them, thanking him for all this. But there wasn't much time, so it was necessary to continue working in the mansion. Ray still continues to sit and study all the necessary materials, because he needed to come up with a cure for cataracts. Eklid approached him and asked if he was still working on it. She didn't understand what he was going to do, since he sits at work for days on end. But Ray asked her to just wait, because he just wants to help her. Finally, he managed to create an artificial lens, which began to glow magically blue. Eklat decided to find out exactly how Ray wants to help her, because he talked about curing her eye, 
has he really abandoned this idea? He raised his glasses and said that of course he knew how to help her. So he showed her the test tube and said that thanks to this he could cure her eye, but she was shocked by this, because did he really think that it would help? She looked at the guy and asked what it was and where he could find it. But the guy confidently told her that it was troll blood. But after studying hundreds of books, she couldn't understand how the blood could become so pure. So Ray explained to her that he simply mixed it with orc blood. As Eklat said, orcs are able to adapt to anything, unlike other species, although Ray learned this by pure chance, while the orc's body can accept blood, during the purification process it becomes pure. That is why he mixed the blood of an orc with the blood of a troll. This is amazing, because they can produce clear blood that is still malleable to manipulation. She asked Ray again if it would really help her heal her eye. But he simply asked her to trust and said that everything would be fine. Ray showed her the lens and told her that he would only have to put it on his eye in order to heal it. Ikla was shocked and started screaming, because at first he said that he was going to cut out this cataract, but now he says that he wants to pour this blood on her eye. So Ray looked at her and tried to reassure her, because technically speaking, they cut out the parts of the lens that were affected, and then they will put it in as a replacement for what was cut out. He looked at Eklat and understood that most likely she needed time to think about it, because after all, she could not even imagine that something like that could be possible. So Ray looked at her and tried to convince her with his eyes of this decision. Then he bent down, making it clear that he respects her and is ready to help if she allows. She was shocked and started screaming, because doesn't he understand what it means for a saint to bow his head? Ray tried to convince her and said that he understood that it was difficult for him to believe, because it sounded between something unreal and impossible, so he asked her to trust, because he would do everything possible to cure her eye. Eklat was shocked because he spoke quite convincingly. She continued to look at the guy and felt the sincerity in every word of this child, who was really trying to help her and it sounded very convincing. She felt sincerity in his every word, although she herself understood that this was madness. Therefore, she smiled and kindly agreed to this, because this is already the last hope for her cure, so if there is even the slightest chance of success, then she will grab it. A little later, she was already lying on the operating table, where Ray was preparing everything necessary for the operation. He decided to use mana to keep the girl's eyelids open all the time, and by making an incision in the lens, he is going to remove all the affected areas, and then after removing the entire affected area, he will replace it with a new artificial lens, but although the procedure is not at all complicated, there are still some nuances. At least there is no professional equipment here, but it is also not difficult for him to do everything manually. After all, don't forget who he is, because in a past life he was Park Yusung, a brilliant doctor in the world, who was called the hands of God. After some time, the girl began to open her eyes and come out of anesthesia. Ray looked at her and asked how she was feeling, because her new eye looked really good. She began to be very surprised, because her eye was beginning to make itself felt. Eklat looked to the side, trying to examine the entire room in which she was. She looked out the window and noticed how much better she saw. She even had tears flowing, which means that the eye is functioning normally. Ray noticed this and smiled, asking how the girl was feeling, was everything okay? He wondered how she was all this healing process. She cried with happiness and smiled, saying that she was completely fine and saw really very well. She couldn't believe it, so she asked him if this was really not a dream. But the guy just smiled. They looked out the window together and rejoiced at the pleasant view and the fact that they had succeeded after so much work. But everything could not be so good for a long time, because someone was already rushing for help. A nobleman ran up to the saint in a panic and said that they now had an emergency situation. A huge army gathered at the borders and was about to march towards the Holy Kingdom. Iriel did not understand what he was talking about, so she wanted to find out more information. What kind of army? how many are there and how far are they located. But he leaned over from fatigue and said that for now this is all the information that was reported to him, but it seems that they are not from any particular nation. Iriel was shocked, because it seemed that this army had been assembled by a necromancer and it was heading straight towards them. Not far from the kingdom there were terrible magical clouds that were moving towards the kingdom. Even a simple flower that grew in the forest could no longer do this. Since it was already destroyed by the monster with its metal leg, around which there was magic. A few seconds later, Everything in the forest was covered with a purple curtain that inspired fear. A terrifying army of a necromancer was approaching the Holy Kingdom, who gathered all his strongest fighters in order to enslave all the inhabitants of the kingdom. There was no time to hesitate, so a state of emergency was immediately declared. Tomorrow will finally be a day of holy war. Are all preparations ready, with the paladins at the front, all guardsmen and knights will protect rear. Many lives are at stake, so make sure you prepare yourself mentally before battle. The knights began to discuss all this, because they still can't believe they re about face the undead. It s times like this when I have thoughts about my family. Rather than praying to God, I thought that my family first as well. I should have ve made the trip to see them before I came here. Same, 
praying to God was the last thing I thought of. I happened to hear this from the officers, but it seems that the new saint is joining us in combat. Really? Are you talking about the one who can use meteor? How are it ll take four days straight to walk all the way from Salonia to here? That, s right, seems like it, s a matter of if we can hold the line until the saint arrives. The knights looked up and were frightened, for they were obviously very worried about what was to come next. Iriella was also going through a bad time, for they were going to have some very difficult times ahead of them. While she was thinking, someone came into her room to tell her that the Pope had ordered for the saint to be sent to the border and the order had been issued by the Pope himself. To think we'd be faced with such a force that the Pope would even order the saint to join the battle. She was also told that they had already asked for them and however it seems that they will take at least four or five days for them to arrive. But she can't believe in that, because if that's the case, who is traveling alongside the saint. The boy informed her that the 3D Paladin Order and the Holy Altar, along with the Royal Guardsmen and they are currently en route to the border. Iriel was just extremely surprised by this, since no one had told her about it, so are these all the troops they have? The guy only remained silent, so the girl started to shout and get angry, once again asking, has the Pope gone mad? Their opponent is a necromancer from the Age of Sorcery and she is sure he's well aware that is not enough to fend them off. Meanwhile, in the Age of Sorcery in the far past, Magic was the topic of research and the entire continent was blooming with innovations in magic. However, forces that used dark magic brought an end to that age and the one that was considered to be the key cause of their downfall, the king of the dead is necromancer, so he managed to be revived. Meanwhile, the servant continued to tell the horrifying news that they have to deal not only with external conflicts, but also with the coming rebellion, for they can see the mood of the people and therefore are unable to send a larger army. Iriel summarizes with quiet gloom that the border is not that important to the Pope right now, and inside her, Rage and resentment burns brightly for the saint the Pope is using as an expendable commodity to maintain his power. All of a sudden, the door swings open with a wild shriek from a temple servant and it turns out that while Iriel was reported one piece of information, another has already appeared, and now the enemy army is approaching much faster than expected. Iriel shrank with anger and despair. Suddenly, she abruptly leaves her place, and under the surprised shouts of two servants, runs out of the room, unable to waste any more time on all this uselessly. In the meantime, a bugle trumpets in defense of the empire, calling the soldiers to full battle readiness, and one of the army commanders announces the approach of the enemy army and demands to raise their weapons. On command, arrows immediately flew into the air, cutting through the blue sky with a deadly cloud, and the enemy army, including skeletons, immediately felt the weapons of humans. The confrontation between the living and the undead heated up, neither wanted to retreat. The holy woman called on God for help, asking him to support the soldiers, so that their bodies would become stronger and be able to withstand this battle. With glittering hands holding the book, she spread God's grace to the soldiers around her, boldly looking into the eyes of the enemies. The soldiers immediately felt their bodies fill with divine power and rushed into battle with renewed vigor, hoping to finish everything before the reinforcement forces arrived. The commander of the squad immediately shouted at the soldiers not to relax because of this help, because the enemies are acting in a variety of insidious methods, and most importantly, the strongest is still ahead. And his words were confirmed, when the first appeared white spirits with terrible smiles, banshees, and black impenetrable lats, dead knights. The commander shouted in horror to the soldiers to retreat and regroup before it was too late for them. But it was too late for him. One of the banshees was right in front of his face, extending its sharp claws towards him. Both the temple servants and the soldiers began to flee, unable to bear what was happening, but none of them could escape. And in the midst of these cries of pain and suffering, in a dark cloak hiding him from head to toe, stood the necromancer, savoring every drop of spilled blood. He ordered his dead not to let go of a single living soul, and immediately the soldiers felt how the enemy army became stronger. And as much as the surviving commander tried to help the soldiers by recalling them, he had a terrible thought, were they really alone with the dead? The commander did not have time to dodge the mace of the huge dead men, and prepared to say goodbye to his life. But in a split second the situation changed, and a white glow saved him from horrible destruction. Ray appeared on the battlefield in his developing white robes, with such martial energy on his face that even the commander exhaled with delight and relief. Remembering how he rushed to the army defending the empire, Ray also recalled how the Pope had ordered him to go to the border because of the difficult situation in the empire. So now that all the soldiers were surprised to see the saint, Ray only activated his powers while gloomily looking ahead. Turning around, he ordered those who remained in formation to divide the wounded among the priests to heal them as soon as possible. But the soldiers and temple servants were unsure, for if they helped the wounded, fewer people would be able to defend against the undead's attack. Until they saw that the bones of the dead around Ray had already managed to melt like ice cream in the heat, 
and they praised the saint's strength with admiration. Ray only hummed as he faced the army of dead running at him, led by the necromancer. Although his saint's powers helped a lot, due to the fact that skeletons and other foul things were numerous, he decided to use his magic as well, sending a fireball forward. Explosions and bright flames filled the battlefield, burning everything in its path, and once the fire had calmed down and the smoke had cleared, only one figure with raised arms stood proudly alone, covered by a translucent purple shield. Without fear, Ray assumed it must be the necromancer. The old man in the cloak stared at the guy in shock, not understanding how he was able to use magic being a saint. The necromancer, with the anger inherent in working with the dead, began to cast another black curse, unwilling to give up so easily. With his command to cast off the calls of the underworld and bring death to its knees, he summoned another endless army of the undead and sent it into battle. The knights of the army once again stirred behind Ray, looking at the new number of those they would have to fight, losing their lives. But the saint was with them for a reason. With one spell and the power of the saint he managed to get rid of all the summoned dead, causing the necromancer to retreat a step in horror. The old man in the cloak shouted that he would never give up and that no one would stop him, sending another deadly spell specifically at Ray. Once again he was defeated with a gesture of one hand. The holy chains bound the necromancer before he could cast any more terrible spells. Ray's incredible strength, his skills, and the combination of divine power and magic led the necromancer to a surprising thought, he couldn't just be a saint, he must have already approached the level of a god. The weeping knight, no longer afraid to approach the necromancer, knocked the thought out of his head with his fist. Looking sadly at the blazing field, Ray realized the reason for his tears, those people who had fallen in this battle were also becoming dead and unfortunately falling under the power of the necromancer. And all those they saw now in this horrible state used to be someone's slain family. Ray berated himself for not coming sooner, so he did the only thing he could in this situation, summoning the Scylla of the Saint, he laid the dead to rest, giving them a relieving oblivion. A cleansing rain covered the battlefield, covering the soldiers and priests mourning for their lost loved ones. Ray, chiding himself for his slowness, looked sternly at the kneeling necromancer, not forgetting the real culprit, but when he asked if he felt guilty for what he had done, and if he was afraid of joining the dead he had ruled before, the necromancer laughed madly. Paying no further attention to the insane old man, Ray ordered him to be taken to the Holy Empire. Having done his business at this place, he hurried to help at the next point, for the war didn't end here. Meanwhile, the dead were terrorizing another city where the saint was already waiting. And in that place, using her holy power, the locals were protected by Iriel, supporting the soldiers. Divine power shone in her eyes as she looked at the next approaching wave of the dead. Alas, besides the undead, there was also an unknown army among them, so it was doubly difficult for them. A sudden sword thrust caused an explosion that scattered a crowd of skeletons around her. Iriel stared at it in surprise, trying to figure out what it was. Until, in answer to her unspoken question, the pink-haired and purple-haired knights appeared before her, apologizing to the saint for being late and saying that there was nothing to worry about now that they were here. Iriel, on the other hand, was even more worried, for Lord Zeke was supposed to be with Ray and now he was without his support. When she heard that Lord Zeke had been ordered here by Ray himself, she couldn't believe her ears. The knight recalled the past, in which Ray had ordered him to stay in Salonia, because if he went after the saint, he would only cause him inconvenience instead of support. And when Lord Zeke had resented it, and still asked to go with him, worried about Ray, he had offered to fight Ray one-on-one -on -one to prove that he would not be in the way. The man apologized for pulling his sword from its sheath and swung at Ray, not doubting his strength. Well, he should have doubted, because the huge sword was able to hold back a tiny aura sword no bigger than a dagger. And now, Zeke's sense of self-importance was hurt, because he couldn't imagine Ray's strength if he was able to deflect a blow with a small dagger. After explaining all of this to Iriel, he justified his coming to her aid, making her stand in wonder. Iriel, however, forgetting her image as a saint, looked anxiously at the sky, worrying about Ray, and even daring to call him an idiot, not understanding the real danger, in front of the other knights. Ray, thankfully, could not hear such disbelief in his powers, at that moment running into another city full of already broken dead. There he was met by the crying child he had saved earlier, holding her little sister in her arms. Ray snapped out of his shoes, immediately running up to them and checking on the unconscious little girl's condition. However, contrary to his hopes, he was unable to trace any pulse, breathing, or consciousness in poor Chris' body. The child cuddled closer to her sister, unable to let her go while Ray regretted that she was too weak even before what had happened. With tears in his eyes, the child admitted that he had to protect his sister no matter what, not reacting when Ray instead blamed himself, after all he shouldn't have brought them here, and apologizing for the pain he had caused her with that decision. Mary disagreed, continuing to sob and blaming only herself and her weakness. And as Ray towered over the broken child, his eyes came across a knight behind the children, clearly not gone from the Holy Empire soldiers, it must have been Mary defending herself and protecting her sister. Ray, looking collected and serious, 
ordered everyone who was hiding to come out into the light, though not the first time, but only when he named who was standing where, the mysterious pursuers showed themselves, and their distinguishing feature was a bone mask on the lower half of their faces. Bending in greeting, all the members of the Dane family, the seven messengers, manifested in the darkness of the night. One of the seven messengers introduced herself first, respectfully placing her hand on her chest. She also introduced the other six messengers in turn, and each of them had a unique appearance and identical bone masks on their faces that concealed their identities from prying eyes. They were given names that differed only in the first name, but the second name was still Young, which made Ray puzzled for a second. With his hands on his chest, he explained that he had summoned them all because he wanted them to take care of Mary. Hong Yong, the first of the seven messengers, squinted slightly to make sure that she had heard him correctly and that he was referring to the living child behind him. After hearing Ray's words about Mary's special abilities and constitution of body and spirit, the messenger confirmed that she was indeed able to survive where everyone else was already lying down. Hong Yong objected to raising her as an assassin. Before he could clarify exactly what he wanted, Ray heard another messenger ask if he wanted them to train the child in special techniques, and Ray happily complimented her on her guesswork. Hong Yong again declined, as they had a primary assignment, and that was to protect Ray, and they couldn't waste time on anything else. Besides, they needed to protect the identities of each of the seven messengers, and taking care of the child implied a high risk that they would be exposed in the future. All in all, the messengers refused until the last, when a desperate Ray mentioned that he could make it an order. Seeing all seven people flinch at that word, the saint's eyes lit up, and he seized the opportunity by simply issuing a full-fledged order. The messengers, reluctantly, but had to obey the order. Ray also ordered them to take care of the little girl's funeral, and Mary herself to listen carefully and train with the messengers, as they were trustworthy people. Having dealt with the problem here, Ray sternly turned around and headed off to where his help was still needed. Meanwhile, things were not going smoothly for Iriel, though the soldiers did not notice this, continuing to receive the saint's blessing. Dressed in knightly armor, the woman commanded the knights and motivated them not to give up and get the victory. As soon as the loud words were spoken, she exhaled heavily, covered in sweat, and the girl knight worried whether she was fine after using so much holy power. To distract her, Iriel asked to take control of the left flank and monitor their progress, which the girl immediately fell for. When she left, Iriel had a moment to realize that she couldn't go on like this, there was no end to the battle, and no matter how strong she was, she wouldn't be able to bless the knights indefinitely. As she thought about it, the woman barely dodged the unexpected blow, miraculously jumping aside. Cradling her injured arm, she stared in disbelief at Duke Zahard who had attacked her. Lord Zeke stepped up to her defense and covered her, clarifying if the saint was all right. Lord Zahard slung his one-handed weapon over his shoulder and greeted both Iriel and Zeke sarcastically, not at all looking upset or offended by the guy's words about his betrayal of God. He mustered up the courage to argue with a mad grin that the Holy Empire had no future because of its small size, unable to withstand the power of the superhumans. Iriel was annoyed at his behavior to the point of gritting her teeth, but there was nothing she could do to counter the master of the sword. She wasn't sure if she could fight him at full strength, and even Lord Zeke's presence wouldn't help. Suddenly, Lord Zahard suggested that each side retreat, and the saint wondered what his plan might be, for despite her recent doubts, the holy power was very motivating to the soldiers, and yet they would not be able to defeat the master of the sword. Gritting her teeth, Iriel agreed in her mind that it was not a bad suggestion to pause and wait for reinforcements. When she voiced her thoughts aloud, Lord Zahard grinned contentedly and called it a wise decision. But as he was about to leave, satisfied that he had achieved his goal, he was stopped by someone's voice, and Iriel flinched, unable to control herself. Surrounded by holy magic, Ray was approaching them from behind, sternly wondering who this lord thought he was, daring to make a mess of things and flee the scene without being punished. Ray looked almost insane, ready to defend what he held dear to him to the last, summoning all his power, both divine and various kinds of magic, against the flaming orb. Considering that the human body can only withstand divine power, or only magic because in saints, magic transforms into divine power, Lord Zahard couldn't take his eyes off the picture in front of him right now. Ray, placing his hands on his hips in a relaxed pose, asked him if he had any last words before total defeat. Looking for ways out of the situation, something occurred to the Lord, and he suggested to Ray a battle between the protégés of each side. Zeke hastens to ask Ray not to get hot and accept the offer from the traitor, as he might be up to something, but when has the saint ever turned down a good battle? He cancelled the fireball spell, and Zahard thought with joyous excitement that Ray was just a round fool who thought he was a fool. Ray, in his usual manner, beckoned his opponent toward him without moving or drawing his weapon. Still thinking it was foolish, the sword master calculated the saint's weak points, sensing that he finally had a chance to deal with the threat. After all, even if Ray is an archimage capable of summoning a meteor, 
it makes no sense for him as long as he can't use magic. Boots creaked under Zahard's sudden jerk as he pushed himself off the ground in seconds and took a wide swing, leaping out of the air at Ray. Still as unflustered, Ray summoned the Aura Sword in his hand, glowing with blue divine power. This was something the Lord was unprepared for, and as he met Ray's sword with all his might, he felt a recoil of terrifying power. He was thrown back a couple of meters, almost dragged across the battlefield, and a small but noticeable crack formed on the powerful two-handed sword. A relaxed Ray stood before Zahard, almost provoking the men to the same thoughts the necromancer had earlier, who the hell was the guy who could summon meteorites, use divine energy and create aura swords, where did he even come from? Zahard made another attempt, thrusting his sword at the saint, gritting his teeth with eagerness. He tried his best until he found Ray acting strangely, and the guy with the crazy grin was finally able to play to his full potential, having learned from Zahard all the time before in practice, and adopting his fighting style. So now he was already attacking Zahard, not giving him a moment's respite, for even his thoughts were now racing, he had made a huge mistake. The saint, in a devious move, deceived the lord and when he put his sword up to protect his neck, slashed him in the leg, declaring that he would not give men like the lord a second chance. Zahard, feeling the wound, feeling Ray's speed and strength, and realizing that his fighting style was not only being copied but improved upon as he went along, begged for mercy, taking a knee. The guy pointed his aura sword at Zahard, and began to interrogate him, saying that a swordsman like him would be too ashamed to follow someone else's orders, so surely, he was acting on his own accord. The man who had bowed his head suddenly rose out of the blue and tried to attack from the sneak, shouting that he only wanted to show the nobles in the shadows that even harsh methods like his could change the world. Of course, Ray deflected the blow, and afterward made his sword disappear for a second. To Zahard's surprise a second later, that moment remained the last he had ever seen in his life as his head rested on the ground separate from his body. At about the same time, in a quieter place, the commanders of knights and mages of the various kingdoms listened to the news of what had happened earlier on the battlefield, coming to shock. The sight of a defeated, bound, and powerless necromancer who had managed to be captured alive caused large question marks in their minds. A soldier from the Holy Empire's army smiled and thanked the people from other kingdoms who had come to help, but said with a relieved expression that the necromancer had already been taken care of. The servant who ran up to him drew the attention of everyone present. For he brought good news, the rebel forces had been all but defeated. Iriel was rubbing her tired wrists in the company of the unchanged Zeke and Fia, but as she looked around, she was pleased that they had cleared most of the area. The pink-haired Fia put a finger to her lips, wondering about Ray's origin since he had come here so easily and solved almost all of their problems on the battlefield, when Zeke tiredly asked her to watch her tongue when she spoke of the saint. Everything was coming to an end when a purple glow appeared on the horizon and a terrifying force pressed them to the ground as if coming out of nowhere. Fia, Zeke and Iriel were once again forced to prepare for battle, blown by the icy strong wind. The glow, intensifying with each passing second, made Iriel's eyes widen in horror. In front of them, the bone dragon loomed, embraced in hellish purple flames. A rumble of thunder signaled the arrival of a new demonic force, and Ray, who had sensed it when he arrived at the manor, realized with a sigh that it was time to head back to the battlefield. The maid he had asked to take care of a few things for him agreed and relayed that she would be sure to pay special attention to the girl he had rescued. Hearing that the child was to be taken care of by the seven messengers, the maid squinted at the Dane family and was not happy about it. Things were not going so well for Iriel and company, for the bone dragon had brought with it new problems, and now its huge wings and powerful strength were simply blowing the poor soldiers off their feet. The saintess folded her arms and summoned her divine power, and once again glowed with a warm golden light to help the army and resist the death spawn. But contrary to her hard work, although some skeletons burned in the divine glow, there were still too many crawling and reaching for them from all sides. Fia wanted to lead Saint away, but she didn't have time, looking straight into the jaws of the monster towering above her, Saint froze in a strange frenzy. The bone dragon reflected in her eyes, and only then she realized its hidden essence, it was not just a huge flying skeleton, but a real monster, the dragon of fear. Her whole body stiffened, not allowing her head to move either, Iriel felt her consciousness floating away, and fear made her heart beat so often that it was about to fly out of her chest, piercing her ribcage. Suddenly, Saint felt a small sense of relief, but it was only a matter of time before her sight returned and she saw Fia and Zeke covering her back and taking the full force of the blow. Neither of them could move, but the snapping sound was coming closer to the girl knight, and she froze now not just in induced terror, but actual fear, for she could not move, and behind her the skeleton was already reaching for her. As she braced herself for the worst, a sword blew off half of the skeleton's body. It was the work of Lord Zeke, who managed to overcome the monstrous force, and began to move, returning to the battle. He didn't feel half his strength and doubted he would last long, but he needed to protect his partner and the saint, so he had no choice but to raise his sword and grip it tighter. Zeke fought like a wolf, out of his last strength, 
not falling to the skeletons or under the eye terrifying demons. There were too many of them, however, and at a certain point a snapping sound meant a cloud of bones coming at him. They buried him beneath them, pressing down from above and blocking even the slightest sliver of visibility. Fia asked the saint in a panic what they could do, for she couldn't move, but if they did nothing, Zeke wouldn't last that long. No matter how hard Iriel tried, the divine energy wouldn't leave her body, frozen with her. There was an explosion, and the skeletons scattered in different directions under Zeke's power, but he himself was in very bad shape, covered in wounds and scratches, breathing heavily. A weeping Fia asked him if he was all right, but since she couldn't move to see for herself, Zeke risked deceiving her by claiming she was overreacting. He himself, feeling tired for the first time as a sword master, still unable to steady himself, but walked over to the dragon, leaning on his sword. Unable to stand still, seeing that the dragon only inspires fear, but does not approach on its own, the lord makes a serious decision, it is necessary to attack this monster, not for nothing he has trained so long. He fights back as best he can, but even though he has been called a genius in swordsmanship since he received the title of master swordsman at a very young age, he was unable to deal with the army of the undead on his own. Having been seriously injured, one of his last thoughts was regretting that it was him and not someone stronger who could handle this dragon and not put the saint in danger. That was when Ray's calm voice caught up with him, surrounding him with divine power and reassuring that Zeke had held out well until his arrival. Holding out his hand and muttering a cleansing spell, Ray destroyed the skeletons reaching for the kneeling lord. Now they were one on one, the holy genius Ray against the bone dragon of fear, almost the battle of the century. Standing in front of the dragon, Ray remembered reading articles on dark magic, which spoke of a great weapon that neutralized all magic below the seventh circle, a great unliving one that even an aura sword could not touch. The saint began to use holy magic, thinking with his mind that since such a demon appeared here, it means that somewhere nearby there must be another necromancer, but he will be able to get to him only after he deals with the dragon. When the dragon was completely hidden in the blue glow of divine healing, Fia and Iriel, having been able to move, admired that it took only one spell from Ray to kill the great dragon of fear. However, suddenly, their joy was premature, a violet light sparkling in the empty eye sockets destroyed Ray's magic, and the dragon opened its mouth. Zeke shouted to the saint to be careful because the dragon was gaining breath for a deadly strike. A beam of destructive force pierced space and rushed towards the battlefield faster than the speed of sound. Ray, in his typical manner, was surprised that the creature was so powerful that even its magical shield was cracked. Ignoring the shocked people behind him, Ray cast a healing spell one after another, causing the bone dragon to literally float in his magic. Finally, a huge amount of blue magic collapsed, destroying the dragon, and leaving only a trail in the air behind it, but even after that, Ray could not sense the necromancer, and behind his back, Iriel had already reached Zeke, treating him with her magic. However, even after this, the Lord did not wake up, and his wounds were still covered with demonic energy, so dense that Iriel's divine power could not do anything about it. Behind, already understanding where this was going, Ray approached, creating strong scissors from his magic, and stopping Iriel from futile attempts. Seeing these wounds and knowing a lot about medicine, the guy was amazed that Zeke was still alive. Taking off his shirt, Ray promised that he would do everything possible to save the Lord. Ray cleansed his hands with a spell, and although they were in the worst place to perform such an operation, he ordered Iriel to ensure that no miasma or demonic energy touched them from the outside. Fia, seeing the knife at Zeke's stomach, screamed in fear, but Iriel silenced her. Placing his hands on the man's chest, the saint first decided to cleanse him at least a little of the demonic energy and could hardly resist a cry of pain. Sweating with diligence, focusing all the demonic energy from Zeke's body into his left hand, Ray regained his strength and began to clean the wound before the operation. Having created an amazingly thin thread of divine magic, the guy now needed to connect the arteries to ensure the correct flow of blood in the body. Ray's hand turned black, but now was not the time to hesitate, even though Zeke already looked better. But Iriel, looking at what Ray was doing, had mixed feelings. On the one hand, she was ashamed that she herself did not fully trust Ray and his methods, and by stopping Fia, she stopped herself first, and on the other hand, she could feel with every cell of her body that Zeke was getting better, and this made her ashamed more. In addition, she noticed the saint's blackened hand, and now she was worried about him too. As soon as the last stitch was made, Ray fell unconscious. Iriel immediately rushed towards him and extended her hands, wanting to heal his blackened hand. However, no matter how hard she tried, the saint could not do anything, and helplessly almost cried, realizing that she needed a specialist in this matter who could give Ray special treatment. As if in response to her thoughts, one of the seven messengers in the familiar bone mask came out from around the corner, unnoticed as always. She commanded her colleague to take the saint away with a heavy sigh. While Ray dangled head down on the messenger's back, Hong Yong informed Iriel that they were taking the saint with them to Salonia to give him proper care, 
and expressed hopes that Iriel would also arrive for the same purpose. Iriel agreed to come to the saint's estate, but first she had to deal with the remaining deals, no matter how worried she was about Ray. A man in a surgical gown woke up when he was called several times to go to the operation room by a colleague. He has given his medical history to another doctor and confirmed that he remembers perfectly well that a heart surgery is now scheduled. As he enters the room, he senses some sort of catch, something keeps him uneasy as he looks at the patient in the oxygen mask, reminding him of someone familiar. He urges himself to come to his senses, asks for a scalpel, but in response the other doctors turn on him, their hands beginning to glow with a soft green light, and they themselves are wondering why a scalpel is needed when magic can be used. And at this point, Ray jumps up on the bed in horror, waking up from a strange dream. The bright sun shines down on him from a familiar window, and he realizes he is in his chambers, so the first thought that comes to his mind is the thought of servants. Both maids are already in place, and while the dark-haired Euclid looks stern, little Mary does not hesitate to cry and openly rejoice at the saint's return. After stroking the girl's head, Ray gets a question from the second maid, who doesn't hesitate to tell him that it was a foolish and insane act. Saint quipped to the girl that she must have been worried sick about him, but the maid fiddled, parrying that she just wanted to keep her job. As Ray remembered Zeke, and Euclid grimly listed his horrible misdeeds, like not looking after Saint, and even sleeping deeply right now, Ray ran his gaze over the still dark hand. He looked it over in surprise and disgust, not understanding how he could still move his fingers, though he still remembered the terrible pain during Zeke's treatment. The maid told him that he had been cured by the saint and the chief priest, to which Ray fell out again. Although Ray had just woken up, the first thing he was taken to was not to be fed, he was instead taken to the basement where, on a tall square stand with a white cloth, lay an object that emitted a nightmarish amount of demonic energy. The evil heart of a bone dragon, left on the exact spot where the dragon had been defeated. Ray wondered why the hell he had brought this thing in the first place, and the maid told him that he should go to the lecture hall and explain himself to the nobles who couldn't believe that the dragon had really been destroyed. Ray's thoughts and mood were far from rosy, so ordering the maid to take the heart and follow him, he went with a warlike attitude to where he was invited. The lecture hall was filled with nobles, and the chief priest, upon receiving word that Ray was in attendance, asked everyone in the room to calm down before the meeting. The Veyborn Kingdom representative questioned the fact that the saint had not only defeated the dragon, but had also used magic, something saints normally cannot do. Finally, Ray, dressed in the white robes of a priest, entered the hall, and right from the entrance, he demanded that questions be asked immediately and directly, and he promised to answer. Marquis Philia of the Kingdom of Glamon clarified whether Ray had used magic to defeat the necromancer on his own. Ray answered a simple yes without any further explanation and simply demanded to move on to the next questions as soon as possible. Now the representative of the Regian Empire took umbrage, ordering him to provide them with some sort of confirmation of his words. The men said in a disrespectful manner that they had come to the Holy Empire to prevent the dire threat looming over the entire continent, so they had every right to be outraged and demand any proof. The princess of the Regian Empire also also interjected, claiming that even a captured necromancer was not a valid argument until they saw Ray's powers with their own eyes. The chief priest immediately realized that they were now trying to test the territory and see if Ray was considered a threat to them, and if they should unite against him this time since he had defeated the necromancer single-handedly. With a sly smile, Eclay looked at the boy, waiting for the show. Tired of it all, Ray didn't disappoint him and directly asked his attackers if there was any difference in how exactly he defeated the necromancer. After another disdainful look from the representative of the Regian Empire, Ray took a step forward, slyly repeating his words about proof. And instead of answering, he materialized an aura sword, almost putting it to that man's throat, still wondering if the evidence was enough now. The princess, in the same contemptuous manner as the men, asked if Ray's move was an official statement of the Holy Empire against the Regian Empire. Utterly exasperated at this, Ray called his maid over to him and took the bundle from her hands, pulling out a bone dragon's heart, which immediately began to emit dark energy. He handed it to the princess, and she had no choice but to touch the heart with her finger. The brutal demonic energy bound the girl, and she couldn't even pull her hand away in horror, she couldn't even utter a word. Ray, on the other hand, brought the heart back closer to himself, and stated in a loud voice that the Holy Empire had enough strength that they could defeat even a bone dragon. Now it was Ray's turn to ask questions, and he immediately inquired with a murderous expression on his face whether he should consider the actions of the Regian Empire as an official statement towards the Holy Empire. The startled representatives were forced to apologize in their official names. The saint unhappily clucked his tongue, not hesitating to express what he thought of the intolerance of some of the nobles. As soon as the chief priest nodded in agreement to Ray's request to return to his room, the boy left the lecture hall, 
hearing Eclay ask if anyone else had any doubts. After a while, Ray wondered if he should visit Lord Zeke and check on his wounds. The maid immediately gave him a lecture on how a saint should behave and how he should not break his distance from other people in different circles. Yuklawood also clarified that there was a waiting list to meet the saint, causing Ray to stop in surprise. And the fact was that as soon as he left the lecture hall, the chief priest was bombarded with questions from everywhere, most notably about Ray's current level, to which Yuklawood had to say that even the Holy Empire didn't fully know the answer. However, she assumed their own estimation of the saint at the level of an eighth or even higher circle of magic. The powers that be were as shocked as they could possibly be, since even the imperial mages of every nation stopped at the sixth circle, let alone the ordinary citizens. The princess of the Regian Empire, who had attacked Ray earlier, was the first to orient herself, and immediately requested permission from the Holy Empire to stay here for a while longer. Eclay had agreed to accept representatives from all the other empires as well and could only empathize with how much more work the guy would have to do. When Ray heard about this situation from the maid, he couldn't hold back a disappointed groan. Even though the Regian Empire had been the first to send him an invitation to meet, the saint had ordered to cancel everything he had planned and decided to go to Zeke's place instead. The carriage brought them to the Lord's estate quickly enough. Ray's hand continued to remain dark, having failed to recover from the demonic energy damage, but he didn't care much about it. Stepping out into the fresh air, the saint marveled at how much this large estate reminded him of Zeke's, and Yuklawood confirmed that the lord himself had designed the exterior. A maid from Zeke's palace reported that the master was in his bedroom and offered to follow her while Ray wondered why Zeke hadn't stayed at Salonia Palace to recuperate, to which he received a disgruntled reply from his maid that it was Zeke who had taken care of the saint for the first time, and had not let anyone, not even Yuklawood herself, near his idol and savior. After the woman's words that such behavior, while nice, was not necessary, Ray discerned between the words her hatred for the night, though she denied it. Swinging opens the door to Zeke's bedroom, Ray and the maid following him said hello to the men. Zeke hopped up on the spot, gazing in surprise at the saint he was so worried about. He instantly jumped off the bed and ripped his shirt off as soon as Ray told him that he had come to check on his patient. What happened next was a real show, with Ray marveling at the quick healing of Zeke's wounds, the knight himself thanking the power of the saint for it, and Yuklawood demanding that Zeke stop showing his exposed skin to the saint and cover up at last. Zeke snapped at the woman and suggested that she not come to him anymore since she was so busy, while Yuklawood explained with a furious look that she was following the saint, not choosing where she wanted to go. After Ray's shout, the woman immediately apologized, and the Lord hurriedly recanted her words and assured him of eternal peace and goodness. In fact, besides the main purpose, Ray also had a hidden purpose, so after checking Zeke's wounds, the guy ordered the seven messengers to come out of the shadows. Hong Yong was the first to appear, already stressed enough by this for Zeke who failed to see her presence earlier. But when he was prevented from raising his sword against the assassin by another of the messengers, the man was horrified to realize that he had not only sensed her from afar, but also up close. Yuklawood, despite her dislike of Zeke, recognized his abilities, so jerked forward to defend the saint when she too was overridden. Ray clapped his hands and tried to stop the mess, and the seven messengers lined up behind him in an obedient row as he introduced them. The knight and maid stood in silent shock. One of the seven messengers wondered why they had been summoned to appear now if they were not allowed to show themselves in front of other people and there were strangers in the room. Ray paused for an important pause and first said that it was an order, and they could not disobey it, and then said that from now on they would all have dinner together, shocking not only the messengers but also the knight and the maid, who were still in shock from the first time. Meanwhile, deep in some castle, a conspiracy continued to brew, where two cloaked figures resented the failure of their plan with the bone dragon. While the blue cloak suggested destroying the empire, the red cloak said to start by removing the saint in their way, for example by sending him away from the holy empire to other kingdoms. Using his magic to grill the meat and sticking it on the aura sword like an ordinary skewer, Ray gave everyone here a look of shock and regret. With his usual gesturing smile, Saint, when asked about the reason for having dinner together, replied that he was just hoping to improve understanding and work between the three families since they had to cooperate anyway. Pushing everyone to eat, Ray made sure that the seven messengers took off their bone masks for the first in a long time, even though they looked confused while doing so. Hong Yong, who followed the other's example, bowed her head obediently, taking it as an inevitable order, but the guy immediately explained to her that he didn't want to achieve their cooperation through violence. Lord Zeke was the first to speak up, stating that the Trey family would cooperate. A grim Yuklawood asked if he realized that this meant breaking family tradition, to which Zeke only waved her off as his family's purpose was to protect the saint, so there was no problem with his choice of methods. With glances consulting amongst themselves, the seven of the Dane family raised their hand and swore to cooperate. Seeing that things were going better than she expected, Yuklawood had no choice but to follow their actions and promise the Bellacroix family's cooperation. However, she didn't stop there, and said that although the Bellacroix family's mission was to seek information for the saint, 
there was also a side mission of no less importance, to stay by the saint's side until the last, through marriage. Everyone's faces were inexpressibly stupefied at this point, but Ray took first place as the main subject of conversation. Thoughts of what Yuklawood had said did not leave the poor guy the next day as he sat in the throne room next to Iriel. Everyone had been so surprised yesterday that the woman had hastened to confess that she had not wanted to tell of such a thing, because marriage was only a method of fulfilling her mission with dignity, and that she had not yet thought of such a thing with Ray. However, the fearful look in her eyes and her sly clarification that it was only for now, kept him on his toes even as he got to work. Coming to bow to the saints, the very representative of the Regian Empire, Lord Gregory, had once again apologized for his rudeness in the lecture hall some time ago, and had brought a box of gifts to make amends. As soon as he opened the box, Iriel jumped up from her seat when she saw a piece of jewelry, and explained to the confused Ray that this was a great craftswoman who had lived several thousand years ago and had created masterpieces. Besides, although there was only one earring, legends say that magic could be used to find the second earring, so it was an insanely valuable gift. Lord Gregory assured that this legendary treasure only confirmed their sincere intentions. Placing the earring in his ears, with a smile that sparkled like the jewelry, Ray suggested the Lord get out as soon as possible, for the next nobles awaited in the hallway to bow. The Lord, however, did get another moment of the guy's attention, and invited Ray to pay a diplomatic visit to their Regian Empire. Ray's mind immediately whirled with a hundred thoughts about how majestic the Regian Empire was, what resources it had, and how different the methods of treating people there might be because of that. The aristocrat who noticed his thoughtfulness immediately began pouring honey into his ears, first by complimenting him on the greatness of Ray's deeds on the territory of the Holy Empire, and then by suggesting that they cooperate to organize business with the Regian Empire. His plans were simple, it was not so much business and money that mattered, but the power of the saint, which had never been seen before. But the unimpressed Ray thanked him sunnily for the offer, but refused, saying that he had enough to do in his home holy empire. He even shouted those words louder so that the line of nobles outside the door could hear his intentions as well. Lord Gregory had to accept his defeat, and he bowed out, asking Ray only that he not forget his invitation to visit the Regian Empire. Yuklawood, standing behind the back of Ray's throne, asked if he was really thinking of the interests of the Holy Empire, and Ray confirmed that he was telling the plain truth. The boy also asked to gather all the aristocrats who were still nearby in the hall to announce some very important news. And leaning over to Iriel, he asked for her help as well, but she in her typical manner chose to hear the information first before giving her consent. With a slight smile, standing up from his throne, Ray spoke words that could shock, he wanted to open an entire academy for doctors to teach local healers how to treat people with his techniques. He reminded her of the condition Zeke had been in days ago, and that it wasn't the holy power that had saved him, but Ray's medical skills, and explained that he wanted to make it possible for ordinary people to help the wounded. Iriel breathed out a sigh of relief, agreeing to help since it was such a noble cause. However, she doubted that her help was needed at all, as Ray was a true hero to the entire holy nation. As Ray had planned, there was an uproar in the hall when the aristocrats heard of his plans to found an academy of medicine. But with Iriel's encouragement and her knowledge of political games, it was decided to create an academy not only a place for medicine, but also for magic, which appeased most of the aristocrats. And it was because of this that Ray was finally given the title of professor of the academy. Ray felt great in his role as a teacher, his enthusiasm infecting everyone around him. He was surprised to see more people attending his first lecture on magic than he had expected. It was because not only the students but also the professors had thrown themselves and decided to attend the class of the saint who had such a high level of magic. In addition, rumors of a strong, handsome lord were spreading among the students at a terrific rate and given the eighth circle and the mastery of two powers at once, it should not be said that the hall was full house. The academy was now filled with noble families of various statuses. Tapping the chalk on the blackboard to draw attention to himself, the guy finally started the first lecture with a question to the audience about what an expression of magic was. One of the students answered correctly, converting magic, proper spell casting, and proper spell redirection, for which he received praise. But beyond that, Ray had the idea to convey that there are other ways to create magic, taking fire spells as an example. Having written his scheme on the blackboard, the saint managed to explain in simple words how to make any spell easier and more accessible for any magician and offered to practice it right at the class. One of the professors, who was present as a supervisor, looked with amazement at the way the theoretical lesson was being converted into practice, and was a little suspicious of Ray's abilities in this scheme, although he admitted that it had a point. Suddenly, the same student who had successfully answered the question earlier shouted in delight that the method worked when a drop of water appeared in his hands without too much effort. He was the first, but by no means the last, to understand the pattern and match the spell, and Ray watched their reaction with pride. The saint's thoughts were on his upcoming medicine class, from which he expected no worse, when he was interrupted by the professors attending the lecture as students. Jumping around him with delight, they showered him with compliments and even inquired as to the name of this ingenious theory, 
which would have to be presented to the Association of Magicians. Shrugging awkwardly, Ray calls it the atomic theory. Some time later, in a completely different place, the students couldn't contain their excited shouting, looking at the bright blue glow in one of the classrooms. And the whole point was that the professor, previously surprised by Ray's methods, having spun the scheme that the saint had voiced in his spare time in his head, had not just been able to succeed in spellcasting, he had broken through to the fifth circle of magic, after years of stalling. So, while Ray was still sweetly slumbering into his pillow, he heard loud screams, banging, and noises that shouldn't have been there this early. Barely getting out of bed, he opened the door, begging for the door to stop battering his room, and not realizing what was even going on. And on the other side of the bedroom was a crowd of students, sobbing at the realization of the prospect, begging for another lecture, and even signing a petition to make magical lectures a permanent thing. Infuriated because he'd been torn from his sleep for such a cause, Ray cast a bunch of spells on the room to make sure the door wasn't definitely kicked in with his enthusiasm by the students, and also so he wouldn't be disturbed by this screaming. Alas, he had to compromise with all these people and increase the number of magic lectures to two a week, which made him regret his desire to do it at all, because he had envisioned it differently. Meanwhile, away from all the noise, a blonde girl read out the request of the elven village to move out. The white-haired elphus agreed but asked for the paperwork to be done by the end of next week, putting aside her tea and checking the request. Her companion was surprised by such speed, but Lord Era explained that she had plans to make a trip somewhere soon, so she did not want to delay it. The elphus immediately realized what she was talking about, and asked Era to tell Ray that she was living well too, causing her to blush slightly. The vehement denial didn't help, for Era was indeed going to the Holy Empire, so the pause came out awkward for the Elphus. Staring up at the sky with a warm smile, she remembered the guy she hadn't seen in six months, which wasn't a long time for an elf, but a strange melancholy settled in her chest. At the academy, however, things were much more active, for Ray had brought a professor who had advanced in magic the other day to assist in another class. The students' chuckles at this were quickly cut short by Professor Clarissa's menacing stare. Ray once again adopted a serious expression, which combined with the glasses on his face and his academy uniform gave him the right professorial look and ordered the second lecture to begin. Ray didn't use too complicated examples, preferring to show everything in practice, so he asked Professor Clarice, who was assisting him, to demonstrate the air-cutting spell. Doubt was written on the faces of both professor and students, but Ray remained firm. He offered to use the spell, aiming not at him, but at the board behind him, to calm everyone present down at least a little, and through gritted teeth the professor agreed. Sending the spell forward, the wind was ready to cut everything in its path, but Ray used his favorite word, and cancelled the spell faster than it was created. He explained to the students that due to the scheme of magic, since the two types of magic come from the same place, mana, even if a spell was created, it could still be cancelled, and his words caused a real flurry of disbelief from the students. Briefly summarizing that this was his entire part of the lecture, he told everyone to split into pairs and practice stopping someone else's spell, to which they quite logically said that it was impossible for them since they weren't Ray. With the fervor with which soldiers in war are usually supported, Ray shouted that magic is basically a thing that defies logic, so they should never stop accepting and believing in new ideas. The students were moved beyond belief and motivated to at least try to practice, and that was all Ray needed, so he quickly slipped out of the lecture, wishing them good luck. Pulling himself up, the tired boy was glad he had time to prepare everything he needed for his upcoming medical lectures. He was nervous that these lectures might be unpopular compared to swordsmanship and magic when an incident caught his attention. One girl was being crowded by three guys, and one of them was particularly huge. In the company of his chums, he was clearly trying to declare his love for her or something, however the girl didn't look pleased. Ray felt it was his duty to come closer and intervene in the conversation to defend the student. The big guy immediately started making excuses that he didn't mean to intimidate her. But after the girl admitted that she was just frightened by his size, and that such huge guys were not her type, now Ray had to be rescued, because the big guy had somehow implicated him as the main culprit. He said such nonsense that Ray didn't even realize whether it was a compliment or an attempt to insult. The big men, encouraged by the beauty's words that Ray was actually her type, immediately drew his sword and threw his glove at Ray, challenging him to a duel. He loudly shouted his name and accomplishments, like his exam grades and fighting ability, but it was obvious that he simply didn't recognize the professor who taught the classes for mages. He paid for it when Ray smacked him on the top of the head with a stick, not even using his powers to cool down the angry boy. Ray threw the stick aside and gave an almost contemptuous snort, treating it as a mosquito's squeak over his ear. And what was his surprise when the crowd around him erupted in applause and compliments, calling him almost a hero. After responding to the student's sincere, timid thanks, Ray suddenly smelled the familiar odor of alcohol, and at first complained about the perfume. The girl, however, admitted that she had been making potions recently, as she was planning to take medicine lectures, since even people like her were allowed to enter. Ray, hiding behind a mask of cordial calm, inwardly shouted with delight, 
now believing that his lectures had gotten at least one student. The girl asked to be called Gria, and even paralleled Ray's introduction with the name of the professor who would be lecturing. But it was her friend who cleared up the situation to the end, running up to the student and asking her what she was talking about with the professor. Looking at the flushed and flustered Gria, her friend elbowed her in the side, joking that she must have fallen in love with the new handsome professor. Gria's mysterious smile was her answer. Meanwhile, Ray had finally made it to his room, almost complaining about the lack of calmness throughout the day. As he was contemplating how exactly he should conduct his lectures next while sitting on his bed, suddenly Iriel's voice came from underneath him and she stuck herself out, accusing Ray of messing around while she had to hide in her room. Scared worse than she had been after her encounter with the bone dragon, Ray wailed about what she was even doing in his room like that. Saying that she was just worried about how his day at the academy would go, Saint also admitted that she was doing even too much for him than a normal person. The atmosphere heated up when she changed addresses from Saint to Ray's name, almost breaking into his personal boundaries. And things could have gone too far, but the seal on the guy's hand glowed with a white light. And from the special portal to Ray's bedroom came a superior-looking era. The smiling expression on her face was immediately replaced by displeasure when she saw Ray not alone, but in the company of another girl. If Iriel was surprised to see a high elf standing before them, Ray was surprised to see exactly Era here, only guessing that it was a teleportation spell. Folding her arms across her chest, the beautiful lady pretentiously stated that it was obvious she wanted to see Ray. Sparks literally flew between the two women as Aira made a lunge towards Iriel, and the saint immediately snapped back in her usual manner. He could not stand the tension any longer, so Ray pulled out the cloaks and handed them to the two girls, telling them that they were planning to leave the academy. Even the rough fabric of the robes could not hide the beauty of both of them, and the saint only sighed, realizing that if he was seen with the elf and the saint in the same company, they would attract too much attention. Arriving at the cafe and taking a table, Aira recognized that not much time had passed since her last visit to human lands, but much had managed to change. Ray's thoughts that elves have a very different concept of short time were interrupted by a waiter awkwardly asking for permission to seat a group of other visitors who had been waiting for a seat for a long time. The guy recognized the travelers in them immediately, and they hardly argued at all, except to clarify that they were more like mercenaries. The only woman on their team said they were members of the Bilical Mercenary Guild. Ray thought back to what he had heard earlier about their success in their work, and in the meantime the conversation was intercepted by Iriel, excitedly questioning these mercenaries and their reason for being here. With great pride, the mercenary showed them the contract in which they had been asked to help with monsters and opposition directly from the Holy Empire. Aira only said a word about being interested in their story, with all her emotionless elven beauty, and the mercenaries were already floating and ready to tell her even the code to their safe, with both male and female members falling under that spell. Thanks to this, the members of Bilical's mercenary guild laid out all the information as a matter of course, which gave Ray a solid understanding of what was going on in the Empire. It turned out that although the number of lower-ranked monsters was almost zero, suddenly the higher-ranked monsters began to gather in groups and act so coherently as if they had some special tactics. This worried Ray, as he recalled the Bone Dragon, and summarized that someone must be controlling them, Otherwise the stupid monsters didn't come up with such plans on their own. Suddenly, the ground shook, and screams from outside signaled the appearance of the monsters. Running outside, they saw not an ordinary monster, but an entire dragon-like wyvern. Furthermore, the mercenaries and mages were immediately frozen by an unnatural fear, forbidding them to even move. Aira found this interesting, but hummed with boredom that using fear only worked if your opponent was weak. With two fingers, without much exertion, she threw the wyvern into the nearest counters, and it was the counters that were the most unfortunate in this situation. Pressing her lips together, the alpha snorted contemptuously and finished her sentence about how having a stronger opponent to use fear on was foolish and pointless. Even after recounting the food and wood on the counters with her nose, the wyvern shook herself off and tried to attack again, but Ray restrained her in time with holy chains. Looking at its futile attempts to free itself, the saint assumed it had a mind of its own, for after Aira's use of the fear spell, the wyvern should not have remained so active. Iriel, meanwhile, promised to deal with the newly approaching monsters. Meanwhile, in the dungeons of the Holy Empire, the torture of the captured necromancer continued. He was surrounded by the brilliant minds of every single empire, but the necromancer was a tough nut to crack and even while reciting a spell he managed to mock them. The mages clenched their teeth in fury when the necromancer called their sixth circle skills a mockery of a great man like him. In fact, he had already come to his senses and, with the help of his dark magic, had learned that the saint was not there, so he dared to continue hatching plans to overthrow the holy empire without fear of being beaten again with one right hand. The chief priest, entering the dungeon with a brisk gait, informed the gloating necromancer that the saint had already arrived at their door. Eclay bent over the mad old man, regretfully explaining to him that all his plans would remain mere dreams, to which he laughed wildly in her face with yellow rotten teeth, 
for it was not yet clear who was having the last laugh. It was only at sunset when Ray and company were able to defeat all the monsters in the area, now slightly perplexed as to what they should do with the bodies. A frowning Aira, who was standing behind the guy's back, suddenly summoned him for a private conversation right that instant. Stepping aside, she cast a silent spell for the outside world so that no one could overhear them. She said that, given her absence from human lands, she might not understand much about the local customs, so she would only describe her feelings about their surroundings. Growing darker, Aira admitted that she had sensed large magical circles around her, even on the academy grounds, in different locations. Ray wasn't ready to hear about the magic circle, but the elf confirmed that at first, she only felt slight mana flows that confused her, but the moment the monsters appeared, those flows intensified and accelerated. Unfortunately, Aira couldn't tell what type of circles it was, she could only feel raw power without exact data. Ray froze in horror, knowing full well that it would be very difficult to break these circles without breaking a couple regions. And even though it's only enough to erase 30% of the circle, since they don't know their location, nor the materials used to draw them, it all becomes an impossible task. Realizing that even he might not be able to do it, Ray instantly began preparations to evacuate the people. Looking for escape routes, he and Iriel concluded that the evacuation would have to be in two parts, Northern Geral and Southern Sulian. To inform people to leave the city immediately, Ray climbed Aira's conjured high cliff from where there was better hearing. The guy applied magic so that every resident could hear him from every corner. With an order in the name of the Holy Empire, Ray warned everyone of the danger by throwing off his cloak, perfectly audible thanks to the spell, and visible against the sunset. People recognized his voice and appearance, but continued to run closer to him, asking questions and not wanting to leave so easily, so the guy had no choice but to launch a blast of fire at them. Hoping that such a demonstration to people would be enough, he jumped off the cliff and rushed down, feeling incredibly furious. Iriel, having received her assignment, hurried north, calculating in her mind that it would take about three days to evacuate, and the mountains would only make the road more difficult. Suddenly she looked over her shoulder, sensing pursuit. The girl stopped in a favorable spot where she was ready to meet the five people whose auras she had sensed almost the entire way. Dropping her hood, the saint turned directly to her pursuers, and those no longer thought to hide, looking at the real saint with malicious anticipation. Their masked faces couldn't cover their mouths, so they said unpleasant things without watching their tongues, and most importantly, they thought Iriel was almost not alive anymore, so they weren't shy at all. The girl was quickly surrounded, and if she wasn't too worried about the three, the middle-aged men had energy like Lord Zeke's, which meant they were no less experienced swordmasters, and they were the main danger to her. At Iriel's kind offer to spank them lightly if they confessed about the empire that had sent them after the saint, the young lads only swung their swords at her. Going after the saint with such skills and weapons was foolish, so they were instantly swept away by a golden glow. However, the problem of the two sword masters still remained, as they were almost unaffected by Iriel's blow, and the girl wondered what kind of empire could afford so many mercenaries at once. Throwing off her cloak, the girl prepared herself for a hard unequal battle, in which only one wrong move of hers and an open weak point, and she might not come out of this clearing alive. She tried to approach them slowly, using not just her sword but pure divine power, but suddenly both men jumped from their seats at the same time. Iriel was surprised, for in such a battle they were risking more than just wounds, they were putting their lives on the line. And that was to the girl's advantage, for in such a battle even a simple turn of events, unexpected enough, like the golden divine flash that blinded the mercenaries for precious seconds, could win. It was not Iriel, for whom the battle was unequal, but the hand of one of the masters, cut off by a sword of divine power. The men suddenly decided to chat, threatening the saint with great trouble because of the immense power hanging over the holy empire, which even Iriel could not handle. But the girl dismissed all their words with a slight smile, for contrary to the strongest dark forces, the empire had an incomparable advantage, Ray. The sword master, having nothing more to say, took the final blow from the saint's hand with a smile on his face. While Iriel was dealing with the sword masters, those first three mercenaries managed to get their feet away from her, but there was no way the girl would let them go so easily. The voices of the same three boys who had managed to escape echoed in the dark forest, cursing the saint for her amazing power, and questioning how they could get back to their own. However, a bright flash stopped them from even thinking about it, and the saint herself appeared before them almost in the form of a goddess of war. Iriel sternly suggested that they follow her quietly while she was still good, otherwise they would still return with her, but no longer in such an unscathed state. But the three boys, one by one, staying almost on the hysterical edge, suddenly twitched. Looking at them shocked, Iriel realizes that the mercenaries had bitten into the poison pills hidden in their teeth, and were now choking on the red liquid filling their mouths. Such an attempt to hide the information and prevent it from leaking out would be very effective if they weren't dealing with the saint, she simply healed them, and no one usually provides a second pill like that. Displaying none of the attributes of a servant of a god at all, Iriel looks at them with contempt, 
and offers to simply cut off their legs so they won't try to run away from her again. She refuses to make concessions to the mercenaries with an indifferent look, reminding them that the attempt on the saint's life is a terrible sin, and they will have to pay for it with their own lives, but after the interrogation. The blonde-haired boy still asked one favor, adopting a submissive pose and even the spirit within him had already surrendered to the victor's mercy. When Iriel promised a small favor for the pure truth, the mercenary, despite the threats of his partners, swore an oath on the manna, promising to tell only the truth and nothing but it. The mercenary revealed that he belonged to the Proxia faction, which had already attacked and committed crime in the Holy Empire twenty years ago. According to the official historical version, there was a monster attack then, but now it turns out that it was all organized by just one criminal group with far-reaching plans. Then the monsters did not just attack people and find their food, and selected the strongest representatives of which could be raised good mercenaries. Those who did not fit certain parameters were given to the monsters as a sacrifice and those sword masters that Iriel had seen before were also kidnapped from other kingdoms. With tears in his eyes, the mercenary confessed that Proxia had even kidnapped family and friends, and dared the mercenary to threaten to kill them if they didn't obey. After listening to his story, Iriel turned around suddenly and let them go free. Furthermore, she told them not to worry about the Proxia faction, for she planned to turn it upside down just to protect her empire that they dared to sharpen their teeth on. Hearing such bold words from the saint, that is, not the last person in the empire, the two remaining mercenaries also asked to speak, and Iriel agreed, but ordered them to follow her, for time was running out and people were still in danger. Meanwhile on the outskirts of the academy Ray tried to find at least a trace of magic circles, but unfortunately, he couldn't feel a single magical reaction. The surroundings were deserted, and only frozen in running poses were the people who had failed to escape, and therefore petrified and frozen with a terrifying expression of panic on their faces. Suddenly a startling realization occurred to Ray thanks to this, after all, not a single building had been destroyed, despite the problems with the people. Remembering Aira's words that at least 30% of the circle had to be destroyed for it to stop working Ray sent fire magic into the building and a huge explosion shook the outskirts. And then it was clear to Ray, because it was after the explosion, when some of the buildings were destroyed, that he felt the faint echoes of magic, which meant that the whole village was one big magic circle. Ray was suddenly distracted from his thoughts by voices nearby that were yelling about explosions. Ray was surprised that there were still people here, though they should have evacuated long ago or at least turned to stone, so he immediately called out to them. The two men, recognizing the saint, tried to justify that they were in no way violating the evacuation order and that they had only been caught off guard by one of the demons and the only possible escape for them was to hide in the building. Ray wasn't so easy to fool, however, and he came to the realization pretty quickly that something wasn't right here and found inconsistencies. As soon as he had asked a couple of leading questions, the mercenaries had sprinkled themselves, and after saying that they killed the soldiers who were trying to fight the ghosts, and thus helped the monsters to escape, the mercenaries even bared their weapons. But their weapons weren't swords, they were pills that suddenly melted away as if they weren't even there. Ray would be interested in examining these pills, because the traces left by the people were catastrophic, but he had no time left at all. So after subduing his curiosity, Ray launched a spell that fixed the mana around to track the presence of people around, because it would not be enough for him to wipe out 30% of the city from the face of the earth with just one explosion. In detail, calculating all possible possibilities Ray used his magic and caused a huge earthquake. Meanwhile, Iriel had already listened to the story of all three mercenaries and realized that all this time, even though they had been in proxia training and doing all sorts of horrible things, they had not been deeply immersed in this filth. Now, knowing already much more about this group, Saint could appreciate how extensive their deeds were and how many things they had done under the cover of ordinary coincidences. Relaxing a bit, the mercenary who had first told her about herself asked Saint about her own childhood and assumed that she had grown up in a rich and wealthy family. This caused the girl to sink into memories that echoed in her with both warmth and sadness. Memories of a happy golden-haired girl with enchanting pink eyes. The story of Iriel began in a small church on a small island that was part of the Holy Empire. The girl was very different from other orphans by her bright appearance, besides, she had an angelic character and rather sharp mind, so she was always in the center of attention. One day one of the priests suggested to the then still small girl to try to travel and see the huge world outside the island. Although Iriel was really eager to get out there and see what it was like outside, she strongly doubted her ability to live on her own, but the priest with an affectionate pat on the head reassured the girl and said that he would always be at her side. Having received such a boost of motivation and support from a loved one, it was only natural that the then still little girl was really fired up with a desire to see the world. But instead of planning the journey for a long time, the priest suddenly said that they would leave today and did not even give the girl a chance to say goodbye to her friends. Riding in the carriage, 
Iriel suddenly notes that they had time to pass the village but never entered it, but the priest reassures her that they plan to head towards the port. The little girl didn't see the danger at all and didn't suspect the kind uncle when he said they were going to Garel, a rather large town that was quite different from the island villages. Climbing into the ship the girl happily endured all the time on the road, enjoying the sea and the sensations of the journey ahead. Then the men, as they stepped onto the dock, offered Iriel a drink of the holy water he had prepared especially for her to celebrate their journey. Obediently drinking what he offered her, and not even suspecting his intentions, Iriel, instantly felt something wrong. Her whole mind went blank, and the last thing she saw in front of her was the smiling face of a seemingly kind priest. But the priest was kind only in appearance, because when she came to her senses she saw that the very men who had been supporting her all this time had sold her to some strange people and resented the fact that she had been given only two gold coins instead of three. With the same sweet smile, the priest admitted that it was a slave port for the slave trade, leaving the girl in shock and a sense of betrayal. Iriel couldn't believe her ears, and she felt like something in her soul broke at that moment when she heard the priest call her a slave. Finally, getting her with every word, the men said that she could indeed write letters to her friends and send them whenever she wanted, but not out of kindness, he planned to send other children from the orphanage here as well. So the girl with the colorful looks became a slave. The only thing she wanted was to hide from the world. She sat for four days, staring at the wall, unable to get up and recover from the moral wounds of betrayal, alone in this big world. As the day came when she was to be sold all her observations through apathy came in handy, the girl managed to memorize all the characteristics, habits and weaknesses of the gang that trafficked children. The cross around her neck had been given to her by her mother, and she remembered how painful the loss of her mother had been for her, looking at the only memory left to be treasured. While the men in charge of the slaves happily lost his hands looking at the child's striking appearance, Iriel thought of a plan. And when the men thought that the girl had already taken her breath because she hadn't moved in a long time, she shoved the very cross her mother had given her down his throat so that the girl would always remain strong. Memories of the cross that had once been sprinkled with someone else's blood just so she could live still lived in that little iron on a thin, ragged rope. Of course Iriel didn't go into detail when the mercenary asked her childhood, but quite honestly admitted that they could have called her an assassin, which the mercenary didn't believe. They had already arrived in Garel and the priest of that city came out to meet them, bowing low before the saint. The girl had a right to look at him with hatred for this was the men she had trusted more than life and who had sold her to the slave traders years before. Heavy memories filled Iriel's head again as she remembered how she had escaped from the other slave traders and how she had to survive. So she had gone to the dirtiest of methods to keep herself alive and had no concern for the lives of those who tried to capture her. The cross in her hands, which should have been a symbol of her freedom and faith, became a symbol of her hope for her own future, which she had to forge on her own. And each time she was chased, the girl violated the same terrible doctrine of the church, and with each such encounter was covered with more than just blood over her skin and hair, as if she were marking herself with stains that could not be washed away. She was covered at first with guilt, and afterward with an armor that made her blame not herself, but the world around her that allowed such an outcome. Iriel was about to become another lost child, completely ruining her soul, when a sudden bright golden glow illuminated her path. For some reason, the goddess chose her and endowed her with the gift among all the others. But that was what had saved her, for it was then that she realized the value of human life and the futility of revenge, which gave nothing but more pain. So now, looking at the face of the frightened priest who had sold her out earlier, she didn't feel that pain. All that remained in her eyes and in her soul was pity for the fallen men who continued to live with the weight of guilt and fear of receiving punishment for his deeds. Meanwhile, Ray continued to destroy the city, but with each blow he realized that he could not just take and break absolutely everything. Already seeing the outline of the circle, he noticed the symbolic placement of the buildings, and now realized that the entire layout of the city was built in such a way that the buildings themselves became part of the runes of the magic circle. Suddenly, something warm ran down his face, and he felt his consciousness blurring. Another magic circle unfolded above him and he found himself in the very epicenter of the demonic magic going on. Due to the unfortunate location and his own efforts, now the magic of the circle began to conflict with Ray's power and the guy could not hold back a cry of pain when the purple lightning bolts bound his body. Moreover, the main problem was that the saint had already used a great deal of magic when forming the explosion earlier. And now that the demonic energy of the magic circle was penetrating his body, he couldn't control and resist it at all, much less heal it. As if these problems weren't enough, he found that portals had already begun to form on the sides of him, and monsters were pouring out of them in packs. With brown under his nose from overexertion and with purple mana hovering around him and demons arriving, Ray admitted to himself that he wouldn't be able to fight them in this state. However, the truth was also that if he didn't, they would definitely go after the people who had evacuated. Therefore, he had to bear his aura sword instead of hiding and at least recovering a bit. Unfortunately the spell in the circle he was in was created in such a way that every time he used his magic the blood in his body began to boil. Suddenly, arrows from somewhere pierced his back, and Ray himself fell down, 
Unable to dodge in time, the boy felt some guilt for being too careless while the monsters around him were already coming closer, glaring with red eyes. He was unconscious, alone with these creatures. Meanwhile, Aira watched the people evacuate the city and thought that Iriel was doing her job right since everything was going smoothly. Suddenly, she felt rather than heard Ray calling her and her ears twitched excitedly. The elf immediately activated the portal, sensing that Ray's life was in danger. There she saw that he was already practically inhabited by monsters, the boy himself being unconscious. Full of uncontrollable rage, the girl swept the monsters around with her emotion alone as her eyes glowed with blue power. However, she was horribly shocked at the form in which the men she cherished lay before her. For Ray was completely shrouded in dark mana, unconscious and covered in his own blood. Aira immediately began to treat him and tried to wake him up, but the very sensation and smell of the dark power she had never forgotten for twenty years left her in shock. It reminded her of the curse that had put her in a long sleep for twenty years, and now she could smell it on Ray, and she had no choice but to bow her head in sorrow. The guy was lying on a daisy-lined bed in the center of the hall, looking spirited and carefree. After news had spread of what had happened to Ray, many of those who had followed him had been saddened to tears, and the Holy Empire itself had hailed him as an incredible hero, and even bestowed upon him a title that no one had ever received before, Abel. This was to be expected, but as soon as the Holy Empire lost the support of the saint, who was representing the forces of an entire country, one of the kingdoms began to attack. Now they had to save themselves on their own. Feeling almost on the verge of insanity, Iriel unfortunately recognized that even if the problem with physical exhaustion could be solved, not a single soldier during those three days could rest mentally. Suddenly, a great many people she had never expected such a thing from, such as the representatives of the Regian Empire, had come to their aid. The saint looked with unimaginable sadness at all those she had previously thought were just children, but now they were fighting directly without respite. Iriel admitted that Ray should have rested for the rest of the war and only then awakened, so that for once they would rely on their own strength rather than involve the saint. However, her moment of melancholy was suddenly interrupted when mages and swordsmen of astonishing power appeared on the battlefield, though she had not expected to meet so easily. According to recent spy reports they had been spotted in Selene's empire only a few days ago, so she didn't understand how they could have reached the Holy Empire so quickly. Iriel glanced over to Zeke, and when one of the sword masters tried to attack them, they barely fought off his blow. The men didn't take them seriously at all, and his next blow was already much stronger, he didn't believe they could stop him. Lord Zeke pushed the saint and was hit because of it, but he didn't doubt it for a moment, because she wouldn't be able to withstand such strength. This man was at least an intermediate or even a top-level sword master. Iriel frantically shouted to the soldiers to retreat as soon as possible while there was still a chance. The enemy group sword master who had attacked Zeke earlier strongly disliked this and tried to attack Iriel as well, but at the last moment the divine energy managed to save her and the man nearly lost his sight. Iriel remembered how at the camp they had discussed them in their next moves and one of the newcomers who helped make plans was Gria, the same girl that Ray had once saved. Iriel had to listen to her because she was an amazing volunteer among the academy students and the plan was accepted quickly enough. Then, at the camp near the campfire, when they took a moment to take a breather, Zeke asked Iriel if it was hard to do without the saint. The girl sadly confirmed his words. She said she had no idea how much Ray had endured and how much he had done for them, but she also said that she was a saint herself and she couldn't rely on Ray all the time. The three people who joined them then agreed with her and said that it was about time to bring back the Holy Empire's true strength. Lord Zeke was perplexed that they had so easily left their comfortable chairs and traded them for a military camp, though being aristocrats they didn't have to, but one of them said there was no point in convenience when the empire was on the brink of war. One couldn't help but think of the fact that it was thanks to Ray that they could now gather here together, because his plans to reorganize the empire had helped the aristocrats, mages, and warriors alike a great deal. After all, if before these people were just aristocrats taking care of their estates, now they had come to the rescue in the most difficult time for the empire, regardless of their own benefit. Meanwhile in the castle, Aira continued to cleanse and heal Ray though there was no result alas. The elf ordered the maid to always stay and talk to Ray so that he would always have contact with the real world. Yuklawood couldn't help but recognize that no one could have achieved what Ray had achieved, to receive so much attention and care not only from humans, but from elves as well. The girl took seriously what Aira had said about keeping in touch with the saint, so she spoke aloud about how Ray was missed by far more than one person right now. Depressed and downcast, she didn't notice the little finger on Ray's hand twitch. In fact, Ray slept only outside, but inside he was in some strange subspace. He had no rest because his normal mana had been replaced by the mana of two curses that were of the same type and therefore opposed to each other. Both curses were visualized in the form of a bone dragon and in the form of a snake, 
and at first they stayed away from each other. The guy was calculating how to deal with this problem, since one similar case had already happened when he tried to heal Aira. So now he just had to wait for the two mana to be pushed out of his body. However, Ray unfortunately couldn't help himself on his own. So coming to the tricky part, the guy disturbed the dragon's mana stone and made it think of another curse in the shape of a snake. So now Ray was watching two different mana battle, the bone dragon's magic and the new curse's magic, but so far, no matter how hard the bone dragon tried his opponent was quite strong. Although it was affecting Ray negatively, he just tolerated it and angrily thought that he didn't know who had created such magic, but once he caught him, that person would not be happy. In the conversations of the maids in the castle, meanwhile, stories were spreading that the war was very hard and even Lady Euclawood had gone to the battlefield. And the main thing is that the criminal group is approaching and not just getting rid of, but also taking not only adults but also children who could be raised into walking weapons. Meanwhile, on one of the fronts, everyone warmly welcomed the girl, and even the captain of the 8th Cavalry Unit was insanely happy to see Yuklawood. The girl was gathered on the battlefield and believed that with such successes, and they could well defend not only Selene but also Geralt and Salonia. However, since their enemies were scattered not only on one side but in different places, she decided to split her squad and send some of them to the mountains. Suddenly, Yuklawood felt some strange flow of mana, and tensed up. Meanwhile in the castle, Ray finally opened his eyes after a long time, and the curse that had made his hand blacken, and that had been eating away at him, at least mentally all this time, finally left his hand as well. Ray's method of provoking the two forces and making them attack each other was obviously successful. Ray couldn't move yet, however he could feel the mana and that was very important to him as he was now sure that he was alright after all and now he just needed to heal himself. However, when he started the healing, his own hand, which had previously been cursed, felt very different. It took the guy a few moments to come to a realization. Now, thanks to what had happened, Ray could activate mana much more easily and in larger quantities. So he had literally advanced, and everything that had happened was not for nothing. Having healed himself on his own while applying a special new method, he felt much better than before. He was now ready to fight and save the Holy Empire, and was free from any restrictions in achieving his goal. Meanwhile, Iriel was not doing so well and after commanding the army to group up and move back, she began to accumulate divine power in her body because she absolutely had to apprehend those people from the criminal gang. She was stopped from doing anything reckless by Zeke and company, saying that they would take care of it and do their best. Iriel disagreed with them and tried to talk them out of it, but Zeke said that even knowing that they would die here, it was still the most important thing to make sure that the holy of this empire was in order, otherwise the war would be over in an instant. Sighing, the girl called upon her mana again, but no longer to attack, but to protect all the soldiers from being hit, applied healing, and full protection. As she spoke the words that they should not have died on the field, she already knew that unfortunately not all would be able to escape given the strength of those men. Zeke began to give out orders, but he was so taken aback by the words of his attackers that he abruptly jerked forward to punish those who dared to speak such loud and foul words towards the saints of their empire. However, he was blocked by one of the sword masters who spoke disdainfully of the skills of the Holy Empire's soldiers. Despite all of Zeke's skills, this master was quite difficult for him to fight against, and so far the score was one to one. The men from Proxia's Prospid faction couldn't believe that this small empire had so much talent that he wouldn't mind getting rid of. While they were talking, another one of the villainous team went around Gria and almost defeated her with one punch, but the girl managed to stand her ground. The members of the criminal group proceeded to battle, and the Holy Empire's army was constantly suffering terrible wounds, for the strength of these people was much higher than the ordinary ones. Zeke was shocked that just because of just two people, their army was suffering such defeats. The sword master of the enemy team was tired of waiting for the Lord to turn his attention to him, so he lunged forward, and Zeke barely managed to defend himself. Suddenly something flashed before his eyes, something bright and shiny. It was the snow that appeared along with the arrival of Euclawood, who unemotionally told him to surrender quietly and calmly to those who were attacking the army. Meanwhile, Iriel had managed to get out and almost make it to Salonia, but she was completely unfazed by the fact that she had left the soldiers behind and had to run away so disgracefully. She was given no time for respite, two of the men who had attacked the army earlier had already arrived behind her, never leaving her alone. The girl prepared her swords with the help of divine power and promised that she would not give up and would defeat the two at once, no matter what it cost her. The members of the faction, having activated their power, simultaneously lunged at the girl, and she would hardly be able to survive this blow. Suddenly, however, those mages were split almost in half by a blue light and a wave of relief swept over Iriel's eyes when she saw the back of her favorite Ray, alive, unharmed, and very angry. Ray, in his usual manner, asked if they had planned all this in his absence, and if they were the ones who had cast that spell on him. After the villains of the criminal group admitted that, unfortunately, it had only stopped him for a month and they regretted it, 
Ray angrily exclaimed that one month was not just a period of time for him. Therefore, having already lost a lot of time, he said he would get rid of two of them at once, so as not to waste any more time. Two from the group exchanged glances, and though frightened by his power, they lunged forward and grabbed his arms. This all happened in a second, and Iriel only managed to think that their movement of mana was as if they were trying to transfer their mana to the boy. One of the mages shouted that he was just a human and couldn't withstand the infusion of mana from two sword masters at once. In a moment of confusion, Ray acknowledged that such a forcibly infused amount of mana could disrupt his mana flows and seriously harm him. However, after a massive explosion pierced the sky with blue light, the boy dusted himself off while the two men lay prostrate, and said they just needed to choose their opponent wisely. Iriel, again in shock, looked at the boy, feeling she had missed something in him, something new. Ray, in turn, said he would not wait for her, as there was very little time left, so he ordered her to simply follow him to the best of her ability. Meanwhile, on the battlefield, Zeke looked terrible and was in critical condition. Yuklawu tried to find out how bad he was and whether he could hold on any longer, but she herself saw that everything was not cheerful there. Even her moment of confusion was attempted to be exploited by the enemy, and she had to defend herself urgently. She had originally planned to fight two at once, but one after the other, but now she saw that while she would defeat the first villain, Zeke might not survive this fight. The witch from the criminal group was surprised by Yuklawood's strength, considered her an abnormal person, and even admitted that it was quite difficult for her to dodge the ice spears. Suddenly, a terrible sound distracted Yuklawood. Unfortunately, the sword master of the criminal group found an open spot on Zeke and pierced him in the stomach with his sword. Yuklawood frantically called him, but Zeke fell to the ground in front of the enemy and could not utter another word. And that man, even without receiving significant wounds, was already preparing to attack Yuklawood. The girl was in terrible fury and prepared to defend herself to the end, but she didn't have time to cast her spells, because the enemy army suddenly began a rapid retreat with terrible screams. And one of the soldiers pointed out that he had arrived, the saint. The witch and the sword master of the enemy group were shocked by his appearance, and the whole battlefield practically froze, leaving their battle and watching his walk. Approaching Zeke, Ray, unfortunately, realized that the body of the men he so valued was already cold and that he had died just a few minutes ago. Yuklawood confessed, clasping her hands tightly and almost crying, that she was weak and that her abilities were not high enough to protect Zeke. Ray harshly asked who dared to do this because he planned to cut this person into pieces. The witch from Frosty told her partner to be very careful, as she felt amazing strength from this guy, and that he was not as simple as he looked, but he did not perceive Ray as a serious threat. The girl didn't have time to say anything more, because the very next second she was literally split into uneven parts. And Ray himself, with a grim voice, without turning around, said that judging by her position and power, Zeke's death was clearly not at the hands of that girl. It seemed that only white fury remained from him when he turned to this guy. The sword master tried to say something like a malicious assurance that the saint of the empire was truly a monster, but it was clear that listening to him was the last thing that interested Ray. Lifting Zeke in his arms, the saint entrusted Yuklawood to finish the military actions on this field and prepared to leave. Ray himself teleported to the forest and laid his friend's body on a stone, analyzing his condition. Unfortunately, the sword master had lost a lot of blood, and many parts of his body were already wounded, so Ray simply did not see ways to save him. Finally, Iriel caught up with the saint, and with the same great regret, looked at Zeke's body, not believing that the guy had really lost his life in this battle. She unleashed her divine power and illuminated his body with light, promising that the Empire would never forget his sacrifice and all that he had done for its inhabitants. However, this light awakened some flashes of memory in Ray, and an utterly incredible idea, considering the current medical time, came to his mind. Maybe, just maybe, they could save Zeke. Iriel was terribly upset and understood Ray's condition, but divine magic was not omnipotent, and Ray simply could not bring a dead person back to life. The boy, it seemed, agreed that magic could not do it, but he himself was quite capable, so he materialized a scalpel in his hands, looking serious, once again saving Zeke. As soon as the scalpel touched Zeke's chest, the saint immediately screamed for him to stop, because the previous case could not be compared to the current one, since life and death are only the affairs of God and ordinary mortals can do nothing about it. Ray, with terrible seriousness, said that if life can only be saved by the will of God, then he will either break this will or become a god himself and do it on his own. Expecting the worst, because such expressions were taboo, and such words should be followed by divine punishment, she was greatly surprised because nothing happened to Ray. Ray had no choice but to shrug and just ask her to believe in him. Remembering everything that had happened before, and all those cases when Ray turned out to be capable of what no one had been able to do before, the girl agreed and even offered her help. Ray did not waste any more time and began to analyze Zeke before starting another operation. As a medic, he understood that the sword master's brain was no longer working, but his body, 
after using Iriel's divine power, was in excellent condition. Using his medical knowledge, he realized that the golden hour was starting, those four minutes from the moment the heart stopped beating, and he could save the men. Gaining access to the heart by removing the ribs, Ray thought about what he could use instead of medical instruments, and using his creativity, he launched lightning into Zeke's body as a defibrillator. Moreover, he had to use air magic to circulate air through the man's body, as he could not breathe on his own and there was no lung ventilation system at hand. He had to massage the heart with his own hands, and Ray prayed to all the gods for it to work. Lightning after lightning, air after air, massage after massage, he performed resuscitation actions in this medieval magical world. And suddenly, both Ray and Iriel heard a short thud, but this meant that Zeke's heart was beating without Ray's help. The boy immediately demanded that Iriel quickly heal Zeke, and the girl, absolutely not believing, began to use her power. Zeke breathed evenly and deeply again, although she had previously seen with her own eyes that he could not do this, and there was no spirit in his body. The logical question followed, who the hell was he, having done all this with his own hands? Ray simply and cheerfully answered in his usual manner that he was not the only one involved in Zeke's resurrection, and that it was their joint work that brought such amazing results. To which Iriel immediately tried to excuse herself from this, as such black magic was not something she desired, and this caused Ray to laugh in relief, seeing that everything was slowly getting back to normal. Now that Zeke was all right, he still had other tasks, so leaving Iriel, Ray immediately galloped away. The girl didn't even have time to tell him that coming to the Pope now would not be the best decision. Meanwhile, the entire city was engulfed in flames. Standing on a rock, towering over all this hell, was Lord Gregory, the representative of the Regian Empire, who had initially offered his help. He laughed madly, looking at the horror unfolding under his feet, thinking that soon the people of the Holy Empire would lead him to a safe place, as he had hidden well and played his role to the end. However, apparently, he had not hidden well enough, because a weapon was already pressed to his throat. As the mysterious man ordered Gregory not to move, and he jerked sharply, trying to free himself from the grip, his hand flew to the ground, followed by the Lord himself, but only in pieces. The man was sure that he had surrounded himself with a protective barrier, so he was very surprised that someone found him and even managed to approach him so silently. Stepping on him, one of the Dane family angrily asked who his boss was, and the men suddenly realized that it was not one person, but there were seven of them. Gregory tried to blame the senior priest of their empire, but Hong Yong clarified that she wanted to know who gave him orders in the criminal group of Proxia, not some silly excuse. Realizing that even being without a hand and completely defeated, the man was not going to say anything, Hong Yong ordered one of the seven Danes to get into his brain. The girl was displeased with this, but obediently applied magic, and the outlines of a cross began to appear on her forehead, quickly gaining the brightness of golden glow. The men did not believe that such magic could be available to anyone, as even senior priests or saints cannot do anything like it, but this was the last thought formed in his head. Having received information from the Lord, the girl contemptuously pushed him away with her foot, as he was no longer able to say anything coherent, struck down by this magic to the point of foaming at the mouth. Having received their tasks, the Dane family split up to solve this problem and finally returned to the saint. Meanwhile, Ray arrived at the very heart of the Holy Empire, and ordered the soldier who greeted him in surprise to tell the Pope that he wanted to meet with him. Arriving at the Pope's place, Ray told him that Proxia was not just a lousy organization, and that it was formed not out of nowhere, but from an alliance of their neighbors and even the Holy Empire itself. The Pope immediately declared that he would track down all the traitors in the Empire and deal with them as soon as possible and as harshly as possible, but Ray warned him that there was no need to do so, and that it was better to wait until all the rats came out. Angered by Ray's words, the old man did not understand how one could turn a blind eye, even for a while, to these criminals, and Ray did not understand why he was so furious and reckless. He again asked the Pope to calm down and not give in to emotions if he wanted to achieve a good result and get rid of the criminal group for a long time. Leaving the hall, he did not see how much the Pope's face had changed and how dark his thoughts were, filled not with thoughts of the Empire's prosperity. Walking in the opposite direction from the office, Ray was still thinking about this. This criminal group surely had gathered more masters than they had shown before, but Ray needed precise information to prevent another such group in the future when he could no longer help the Holy Empire. Meanwhile, a bright dawn was breaking as Lord Zeke rode his horse on the road, clenching the reins in powerless anger and shame. It was all because the saint had forbidden him to appear on the battlefield when he finally came to his senses. Although he was very indignant about this, the girl, Using the trump card and saying that Zeke needed to take care of himself because the saint had already helped him once, managed to convince him. She promised that the three families and she herself would solve the issue with this war, and Zeke needed to come and join the path of the saint. During the journey, Zeke remembered his childhood, how strong he was in his teenage years and how he was called the strongest possible. As a member of the Trey family, 
his destiny was to help and protect the representatives of God, the saints. However, when Ray met Zeke and blocked the man's sword with just his bare hands, the sword master thought that there was still much he did not know in this world. Because after that moment, he wanted to give his whole life into Ray's hands and become his loyal servant, assistant, and bodyguard. And the more painful for him was the realization that he had become not a sword, but a real burden for the saint, and because of this, he felt terribly sad. He shouted that he was the worst guard, and Iriel, watching him from the window, was worried about the men. In fact, she had kept Zeke away from the war, as Ray had asked her, but she still did not understand what he was planning to achieve with his actions. At the same time, the saint came to the dungeon to the necromancer, and the old man met him with a cunning smirk, assuming that the empire was now in flames, and Ray simply confirmed that everything was very bad, and he came to ask the necromancer a few questions. When the necromancer laughed and said he wouldn't tell Ray anything under any torture, the boy seemed completely unopposed. On the contrary, he looked very cheerful, having carte blanche to use not just torture, but a more terrible method, pointing out the shortcomings of the necromancer himself. Taking a file out of his bag, he listed other terrible diseases that were in the necromancer, and then suggested that when he gets rid of these diseases in the old man, the latter would be immensely grateful. However, looking like a real devil, he did not plan to act for the necromancer's gratitude, but just wanted to check how compatible the bodies of humans and trolls or orcs were. So, after some time, when the old necromancer looked like a young beauty, albeit hairless, the necromancer begged for mercy, asking to be saved, just so they wouldn't touch him anymore. Ray was terribly disappointed that the old man gave up so soon, because he had many more modifications planned. So, the essence of Proxia was quite simple, five magical towers that maintained balance among themselves. And then when Ray competed and fought with a dragon and an army of the dead, he actually defeated the Black Tower, so all the other towers hate him and want revenge. The necromancer also proudly and eagerly told about the fact that Proxia has fifteen sword masters and seven mages of the sixth circle and that no matter how strong he is, he will not be able to defeat them, which Ray, of course, did not even listen to. But to his question about where the main base of the criminal group is located, the beautified necromancer answered with a cunning smirk that it was in the Grencia Mountains. The Grencia Mountains were the first mountains on the continent where elves and gnomes could coexist, as it was a neutral zone with good lands and resources. Ray had to admit that it was indeed a very good place to maintain an army away from the empire and remain unnoticed for so long, and he would even like to send a meteorite into those mountains, but he did not want to harm the innocent elves and gnomes. It's not to say that Ray was very scared, especially after the recent modification, thanks to which he had no previous limitations, but the fact that, besides the fifteen sword masters and mages, there was also a mage of the seventh circle, made the last battle a bit more difficult. Summoning Hong Yong, the saint ordered her to go to neighboring countries to monitor movements and react to everything that happens. Noticing that something was troubling her, he asked what the problem was, and she replied that, naturally, his orders come first, but she would also like to join the army. Ray was surprised by her initiative, but agreed with her, saying that they need to use their forces more thoughtfully. His first decision didn't change, and he still sent one of the seven messengers on a reconnaissance mission because this mission was much more important than an ordinary battlefield. Hong Yong looked at the boy who sounded like he had gone mad, saying that if the other army has special forces, they need to create something too, with some doubt. Some time later, Zeke stood at the door to the saint's office, hesitating to enter. However, the maid reported his presence, so he had to move and even enter the office, lowering his head. He expected to be scolded or even despised, but instead, Ray simply came up, patted him on the shoulder, and told him to be on the training field the next morning. Shocked, the man asked if Ray really didn't want to send away a soldier who failed his mission, and Ray was annoyed even by the fact that his friend had such thoughts. He tried to convey to the guilty conscience of Zeke that he had put a lot of effort into making the men invincible, so all he needed to think about for the next few days was training as much as possible. He also said that he knew how much Zeke had suffered and tried, so if there was someone he could trust his life with, it was the Lord. With a confident look and a sparkle in his eyes, he affirmed that Zeke was the sword of the saint. The man was inspired and immediately knelt before him, expressing his respect. And the next morning, he was so full of strength and enthusiasm that Ray himself wanted to cry from it. Now Ray set about teaching Zeke to use his powers anew and not just to summon the mana of the sword master into the weapon, but to find a balance. He suggested visually dividing the sword into three parts and distributing these parts equally to feel maximum control over the weapon. After the words that Zeke needed to break old habits, the process went much faster, and the man himself was surprised by his results. The Lord tried again, and with guidance, quickly did what he was told, in the end. Ray just told him not to give up for another three days and to hone the skill in this time, 
to which Zeke agreed without doubts in his master. Although it was said about three days, Ray did not plan to force and expect a perfect result in such a short time, because he knew how difficult it was. However, he had plans to leave the Holy Empire for some time to deal with problems, so he needed to leave it in the hands of someone he trusted very much. Suddenly, he felt a strange but familiar flow of mana and beautiful Aira emerged from the portal again. Ray called her delightedly and even stood up from the chair to greet her. However, Aira, apparently, did not expect him to be in perfect order, so she blushed and got nervous as soon as she saw a live and healthy Ray. Unable to restrain herself, she hugged the boy, and he warmly and gratefully returned her embrace. When emotions settled down and they had enough hugs, Ray told Aira about his suspicions regarding the Garcia Mountains, and the elf said that this place is governed not by her, but by another high elf. Because of this, Ray was a bit concerned because it was not easy to enter these lands, considering how unfriendly this race could be. He understood that especially since he plans to fight on their territory, he would be maximally unwelcome, and not only the village he needed to go to, but also all the other nearby elf villages would be against him. Hearing that he was asking about the strength of the elves, Aira said somewhat indignantly that each high elf is immensely strong, but she is the guardian and keeper of the high elves, so her power is much greater. Ray promised Aira that he would try not to cause any conflicts with the elves, but she did not really believe him. To Aira's great regret, she had to return, and she said that she was immensely glad that Ray had recovered, and was frank in her words. Finally, she said that the head of the Garcia Mountains is a calm and accommodating elf, so as long as Ray does not act too loudly, everything should be fine. Hearing these words during the farewell, Ray felt only more disgust towards the criminal group because they chose the most convenient place for themselves but did not think about the poor residents of those places. Three days later, Ray came to Zeke to check his results. The men demonstrated his new skills, and Ray made such a sour expression that the bruises under Zeke's eyes deepened twice. Then the men confessed that when Ray taught him and showed how to handle the sword, he felt something awakening inside him and wanted to improve it. The saint realized that by explaining to Zeke how to use the Aura Sword, he not only gave him a technique but gave him a deep understanding, which the men, worthy of the title of a junior master of the sword, successfully developed. Now, the Holy Empire in his absence will be in safe hands, and he does not have to worry. Offering to teach the sword master another tactic, Ray stood in a combat stance, ready to attack with a cunning but pleased smile. He swung, but did not immediately deliver the blow to Zeke, as if waiting for something. The man was slightly offended by such disbelief in his strength, but at that time, obediently analyzed the saint's sword, which despite the difference in color, seemed to him the same as his own. Firmly deciding that he would parry this attack, the man was not at all ready for the sword to suddenly melt in the air. His eyes reflected sheer question marks. With the same smile, Ray said that this would be his last lesson, and that in real battle mode, it feels even more exciting. Because the blue aura sword, Passing through the sword Zeke put up for defense, rushed to his head without any obstacles, as if it was made of water. Shocked to the core, the men reverently asked if there was any way to block such a strike, to which Ray evasively avoided answering. It was time to talk about the future, and the saint, returning to a serious demeanor, announced that he plans to head to the Proxia base. Zeke immediately stood up to follow the boy but received a slap and was forced to calm down for at least a minute. Although the men was entrusted with the defense of an entire empire, he felt offended that he could not follow the saint, and was even scolded so ungraciously. Finally noticing Zeke's tired look, Ray asked if he had eaten at all while training. With noticeable bruises under his eyes, Zeke responsibly answered that he would never leave the training field for some food. He only didn't receive another slap because the hungry are not beaten. Meanwhile, the servant Aclay reported to her that her departure had already been recorded as prayer time, and none of the soldiers would follow her. Another news about the Inquisition's advancement made the high priestess slam her fist on the table in emotions. And the news that the Inquisition did this despite the absence of her order, but with the permission of the Pope, shocked her. Eclay immediately jumped up, threw on her top priestly clothes, and ordered the servant to follow her, almost flying out of the office with a sharp step. And Ray was already in the mountains, dressed warmly for the winter weather. A loud sneeze echoed through the mountains, alerting everyone to the arrival of the frozen saint. Realizing that with each step even his specially magically heated clothes are no longer helping, and the blizzard is worsening visibility, Ray decides to set up camp and make a stop. Warming up by the fire, the boy resembles a contentedly ruffled cat. Thinking about whether he can use something in this forest to make the fire bigger, he spots a slender tree growing right in the middle of the field. Grabbing its thick branches, he tries to pull and uproot the stump when an inhuman voice demands he immediately stop these attempts. Ray doesn't react immediately, dumbfounded for a few seconds. But when the tree turns around and looks at him with a toothy and eyeful face, he raises his hands in a soothing gesture and backs away. While Ray wonders what kind of wonder this creature is, it aloud declares that normal people don't wander into these forests. Ray retorts that he didn't expect to see a forest monster tree here either. Feeling offended, the creature states that it is actually a dryad, 
and asks not to confuse it with some demons. Ray already had images of dryads from his own world in his head, so naturally, he didn't believe that a dryad could be anything other than a beautiful semi-clad forest beauty. The creature, angered by the disbelief, extends its roots from the ground to stand more upright. After a lengthy silent eye-to-eye -eye confrontation, the creature turns its back to Ray with a funny tail, and changes the subject to the extraordinary divine powers of the boy. After hearing that Ray is a saint, it asks to share a drop of divine power with it and promises anything in return. Ray ponders his request offer for a long time, not forgetting about his original plans. The dryad, lowering its head, sadly says that without these powers it can't return home to the forest. It turns out that some dark people came one day, weakened the forest and its creatures, and occupied these places on their own, depriving many of their home. Ray is immediately struck by this story, realizing that he has come across a creature from the mountains he is heading to, and these dark people are the proxy a criminal group. With a bright smile and a nod of approval, Ray tells that it's a fantastic coincidence, as he came to this place to punish those people. After these words, the dryad even agrees to help Ray and fetch him branches, so he doesn't have to sustain the fire with magic. So, it simply breaks off one of its arm branches and throws it into the fire, even remarking that it's the best wood Ray will find in the area, sparking Ray's further desire to help this creature as soon as possible. The next day, the blizzard ends, and the boy walks through a normal forest, no longer needing wood and magical clothes. Suddenly, as soon as he enters the elven territory, he is stopped by one of the border guards. With naive childlike simplicity, Ray asks for an audience with the high elf, which naturally results in him being sent away deeply and for a long time. Ray didn't expect a warm welcome, but it still upsets him. Who knows where this conversation would have gone if the supreme elf hadn't descended onto the clearing, supported by the wind. When greeted more amicably, the boy starts sharing his problem, but the elf's attention is not captured by him, but by the earring in his ear. The supreme elf of this village had exactly the same one. In just a moment, from a kind soul, he turns into a fighting machine, emitting a terrible aura around him. The elf doesn't believe Ray's words that it was a gift, as these earrings were the property of the village and the legacy of his mother. Honestly admitting who he is and where he's from, Ray awkwardly scratches the back of his head, not understanding the fuss. But as soon as he hears the name of the Regian Empire, the elf starts attacking directly, declaring that friends of this empire are their enemies. Ray disappointedly admits that things are not going very well when magic hits him and an explosion is heard. Barely avoiding being toasted to a crispy, appetizing crust, but failing to keep his clothes in good condition, Ray ran away in a wild frenzy from the enraged elf. The elf yelled for Ray to immediately return those earrings, not considering that dodging someone else's magic, this would be the last thing on the boy's mind. Countering with a remark that he would suffer anyway, whether he returns the earrings or not, Ray just kept running as fast as he could, not wanting to draw the group's attention by using magic. The elf quickly lost sight of him, no matter how hard he tried, and began to doubt Ray's human nature because of such speed. In a calm environment, the saint deeply regretted what had happened, as he planned to defeat Proxia with the help and consent of the elves, but instead, the legend of the second pair of earrings was triggered. Even in this escape, the eternal optimist managed to find a plus, as he was able to understand the geography of this place and roughly realize where Proxia might be located. All torn up, the boy set up camp to avoid going hunting in the middle of the night and instead get a good night's sleep and set off the next day. Even before the sunrise, Ray had already risen and tracked all the locations he had previously charted on the map. He calculated that they probably use the same circles for defense as in the academy, so he needs to be careful and not repeat that situation. Suddenly, the boy was interrupted by some noise. Going a little further, he surprisingly saw a wounded group of elves and gnomes in the middle of the forest, looking at him suspiciously. Realizing that they needed help, despite the fact that he was very ungraciously expelled from the elf village earlier, Ray couldn't stop himself from helping. He suddenly dashed forward, and before he was grabbed, blinded everyone with a bright flash. When the gnomes blinked, there was no one in front of them, and they thought everything was fine. However, Ray himself jumped out of a portal nearby, not alone, but with a wounded elf, who immediately started cursing him with all his might. He slapped some green goo on the elf's wound, and the elf immediately felt relief, while the boy said that he made these medicines from plants found in these forests. The elf and elf, realizing that they were helped, immediately slowed down and thanked for the rescue, even apologizing for their initial rudeness. The elves told that they had a skirmish with the gnomes, as usual, over territorial issues. Introducing themselves in turn, they noted Ray's respect for nature and looked at him even more favorably. Then came the logical question of what the boy was doing here, to which he briefly told them about the enemy army of humans hidden in their forests. The elf snorted and said that he knew about it and even named the exact number, 
150 people, shocking Ray, because such a number could not simply cross the snowy mountains, which means that Proxia had already established connections with other kingdoms, allowing them to enter from a more convenient and safe route. Now Ray directly said that that army plans to destroy the continent, and he came to make them disappear from the face of the earth. Receiving an offer from the elves to help in return for saving their lives, Ray asked them to take him to the village and arrange a meeting with the supreme elf. However, as much as this couple wanted to help, it was not in their power, as only the seniors can decide whether to let someone into the village. Deciding to at least rid himself of one problem, Ray handed them the earring and asked them to bring it to Chersey, the supreme elf who had chased him around the mountains. And for the next three days, Ray spied on the Proxia criminal group, spending all his time recording all their actions, habits, culture, and generally gathering any information that could help him in battle. And one day, he began to act, starting by catching a small forest animal. The seven from the Dane family, having initially embarked on a special mission for Ray, were now discussing the results of their inspection of other kingdoms, and were dissatisfied with what they saw, as traces of Proxia were everywhere. However, the main culprit still remained in the Holy Empire, and the movements it was making were beginning to cause concern. They had just started talking about how all the threads lead to the Pope, who had taken all the power under his control, when one of them suddenly stood up sharply and made everyone fall silent. She detected a strange source of mana located in the Vatican, moving out of the city very quickly, immediately going into combat readiness, Hong Yong gave the order, they must eliminate this source of mana, and any actions aimed at protecting the saint were allowed. Meanwhile, Ikle was also having a tough time, as she was infuriated by the Pope's actions, which she still perceived as childish behavior. But the next moment, the door of her office was almost ripped off its hinges, and soldiers began to enter, ignoring her words. Moreover, she was ordered to quietly say goodbye to life, as one of the mercenaries pulled out a knife with clear intentions. However, before he could act, he was intercepted by Hong Yong who ended his life with one strike, managing to turn around and ask if Eclay was all right. Not having met them before, the high priestess was now in shock and could only nervously sweat. Meanwhile, Ray was starting a new chapter in the life of the enemy group, hiding in the mountains, as he had released rodents he had been collecting for several days. These rats carried the plague, which had claimed many lives in the Middle Ages. Although it was a magical world, sanitation here was at the same level as medieval Europe, so with his knowledge, it was not difficult for Ray to replicate this virus. From the same observations over these three days, in this settlement, there were almost no priests to whom people would turn in case of illness, and who were unaware of the existence of penicillin. Continuing in torn clothes, Ray was incredibly pleased with himself and the plan he had implemented. The mold quickly spread on the bread he had obtained. He then threw away the brown mold, and separated the bread into different stacks with white and blue mold. He quickly finished his work, preparing to wait until he could produce penicillin. The village was already infected and lost its calm, as the dark spots in the first victims fell to the work of the magic of the Black Tower. Naturally, the spores began to spread throughout the area, as soldiers quickly began to say goodbye to life, and many people caught fever and inflammations. Ray observed all this from the bushes from his favorite comfortable spot, ensuring that everything was going as planned. Proxia was supposed to collapse and disappear from the face of the earth without his further intervention, just with the help of one disease, which even priests could not cure. However, the boy did not rush to leave, as he was still concerned about the story of Mage of the Seventh Circle in the ranks of Proxia, and he wanted to make sure that everything went smoothly and to eliminate this threat if possible. Moreover, Ray was a bit crazy, so he also expected to find more grimoires here, with the information he needed, for example, travel magic, allowing him not to cross these snowy mountains on the way back. After a while, Ray was already running up the tower, eager to reach the Sanctum Sanctorum, mocking the guards who lacked the strength to catch him. Seeing that the tower's top was guarded by sword masters, the boy figured there must be something very important hidden there, something Ray desperately wanted to get. Without wasting even an extra minute, Ray dispatched the guards in such a manner that a saint would have long ago suggested he take a course in rehabilitation from insanity. His eyes shone as he thought about taking what they were guarding as a war trophy for all the days he had to spend there. As he expected, behind the door at the very top of the tower awaited a huge library, infused with magic from floor to high ceiling. However, something lying at his feet prevented him from going further and satisfying his desire for magical folios, it was a young man. They exchanged mutual looks of misunderstanding. Suddenly, the man on the floor realized that Ray was the one who had released the rats and plague, and he stood up, surrounded by an unusual dark energy for these parts. Ray, recalling this power he felt when the demonic magic circle in the academy absorbed him, fearlessly smiled at the creator of the circle. The black mage and leader of Proxia immediately assessed Ray's level and achievements as if reading facts from a sheet. During the conversation, the topic of the necessity of committing inhumane crimes just for revenge came up, but the men Ray found refuted the saint's assumption, saying that revenge held no interest for him. 
However, experiments and research were important to him, for which he would do anything. Ray frowned, as summing up this man's words meant that all the human sacrifices, all the suffering and tears, were just to satisfy his scientific curiosity. Suddenly, the men activated a new circle, deciding that Ray would be an excellent research subject, especially since he was such an interesting representative of humanity endowed with unique powers. The seventh circle mage already considered victory in his pocket and even behaved contemptuously, but suddenly he felt he couldn't move, and chains began to bind his body. Ray concentrated his power, coldly indifferent, stating that he couldn't allow such a threat to society to live. In the last second of his life, the mage realized that Ray was much stronger than him, and at a much higher rank, unfortunately, this knowledge brought him no consolation as there was no one left to console him. Together with a huge flash stretching for miles around the tower, the criminal group Proxia was destroyed. At sunset, Ray was returning home, feeling great about this thought, as he was damn tired, and had already planned to surround himself with medicine upon his return. One of the books he snatched from the tower, which should have contained information about teleportation, was supposed to help him return home faster, the rest were of no interest to him. Alas, contrary to his expectations, the book did not yield to his magic and continued to tease him with its locked clasp. Meanwhile, the people who tried to attack Eclay had already been destroyed, and one of the seven messengers explained that they had been sent from the Vatican. Eclay did not refute this and quickly believed that the Pope was behind it all. She remembered how her conversation with him went a few days ago and tried to prove that they needed to quietly gather all the criminals of Proxia, but he did not calm down for a minute. Moreover, he declared that only the Pope can decide the future of the Holy Empire, and that he was endowed with this gift by God himself. Not falling for the trap of choosing sides, Eclay asked the Pope if he thought that the saint undeservedly held his position as a representative of God and that his words had no basis. The Pope did not respond, but judging by the fact that he subsequently sent mercenaries for the high priestess's life, his answer in his eyes was unequivocal. Eclay, gathering her thoughts, asked one of the seven messengers to deliver a message. 